Bleach has been a part of my life for over 15 years, and for this reason, the series means a great deal to me. Unlike all of you, I was overjoyed with the announcement that the Bleach anime would be returning in October of 2022, in order to adapt the final arc of the manga, the Thousand Year Blood War arc. To prepare for the return of the Bleach anime, I decided to reread the manga and to create a breakdown and analysis of every story arc of Bleach. This video features a complete retrospective of the entire Bleach manga, from chapters 1 to 686. It is perfect for anyone wanting to refresh their memory before watching the new anime, and a reminder for people who have seen the Thousand Year Blood War arc of the events that are about to be adapted. I am aware that the anime will feature additional scenes, and will most likely make changes to the manga, thanks to Kubo supervising the project. So it will be interesting to see how the final arc of the manga differs from its anime counterpart. So without further delay, let's begin my Bleach Complete series retrospective with the first arc of the manga, the Substitute Shinigami arc. Written and illustrated by the author Taite Kubo, Bleach was a series that redefined everything that we know about action supernatural manga. After its premiere in Weekly Shonen Jump in August of 2001, Bleach heavily relies upon and incorporates the idea of the afterlife into its story, as Kubo gives us his interpretation of life after death. The story and setting incorporates real life and fantasy elements, like the environment and hierarchical structure of the Soul Society clearly being based upon feudal Japan, as well as the clothing and weapon utilized by the Shinigami, being inspired by the real-world legendary samurai of the past, as well as the ideology of one such samurai, Miyamoto Musashi, being incorporated into several characters that feature within this story. Kubo was also influenced by works from several authors that he had grown up with, most notably series like Gigigi no Kitaro, Saint Seiya, and even Akira Toriyama's Dragon Ball, with him even citing in a March 2006 interview that it was Toriyama that had taught Kubo that villains need to be strong scary and cool, with Kubo going as far as to say that the fight scene involving Trunks' first appearance being one of the most shocking and surprising story events that he had ever read within a manga. Kubo takes full advantage of the visual medium of manga in order to uniquely convey to us his story with stylistic and cool imagery, which is clearly influenced by the world of cinema. Kubo doesn't bog down his story with walls of text, instead he allows his art to speak for itself. Kubo's unique method of stylistic imagery in order to convey story is also also incorporated into his method of creating characters. Kubo has stated that when he creates characters, he first designs them, and then bases their personalities upon what he has drawn. This method of creating characters ensures that each character is unique from one another. Kubo has brought to life a long list of incredible characters. He usually introduces several characters at once into his story through the group dynamics that those characters fit into. If you need proof that Kubo excels at the craft of creating characters, then look no further than the captains of the Gotei 13 how each of them have their unique and distinctive personalities, and how their character designs, the accessories that they are wearing on their garments, complement their backstories, and even their motives for taking action within the story. The captains and lieutenants of the Soul Society are required to wear a set uniform, but Kubo designs into these uniforms unique modifications and alterations, which perfectly complement the personalities of each of these characters, whether if this is Hisagi's sleeveless attire, or with Renji's equally as rebellious headband that perfectly complements his incredibly cool tattoos. The changes made to Hisagi's clothing convey to us his admiration and respect for his former captain turned Vizard Kensei, while Renji's appearance complements his rebellious hot-headed nature, and is perfectly juxtaposed by the appearance of the man that he wants to surpass, Yakuya Kuchiki, who is far more calm and mellow in his appearance and personality when compared to Renji. Now that we have spoken about the author of Bleach, the influences for the story, and some of my own examples of what makes Bleach a great story, Let's now dive into the analysis of the first story arc of Bleach. In this video, I'll be going over the events that take place between chapters 1 to 70, or in other words, the Substitute Shinigami arc, which is also referred to as the Death Trilogy Overture, Death and the Strawberry. It is important to note that the first 70 chapters of Bleach are adapted into the first 20 episodes of the Bleach anime. I'm going to be placing a heavy emphasis on everybody who watches these videos to check out the manga of Bleach, even from this first point that I have made, that the 20 
episodes of Bleach adapt 70 chapters of the manga, you can already assume where this is going. I want to establish from the get-go that the Bleach anime is not a perfect adaptation of Kubo's work. Not only does it remove a lot of the content within the manga, it also has a fair deal of censorship and changes that were made to the anime adaptation that do not exist within the manga. Throughout this arc analysis series, I'll go over some instances of differences between the manga and the anime, so that hopefully it inspires you to check out the source material that the anime was based upon. So for now, let's quickly go over the story that is told within this arc before we start to break down and analyse the key events that take place. The very beginning of Bleach was unique and impactful enough to leave me with a lasting impression. What made this story stand out from the plethora of shonen manga that had come before it was that it had a unique punkish style which resonated with so many teenagers and young adults across the world. This impactful first impression is all credited to the substitute Shinigami arc, which places a heavy emphasis on character-driven stories. Through this arc, we get a solid introduction to our protagonist, as we get to understand a lot about his friends and family, his past experiences, as well as the key events that had occurred within his past, which result in him adopting the personality that he has within the first chapter of the story. During the first three volumes of the Bleach manga, where Ichigo's character and his past is explained to us, we are also introduced to several of Ichigo's friends, as we get a couple of excellent character-driven stories featuring Orihime and Chad, where we get to learn about their personalities, relationships with Ichigo, their beliefs about protecting others and fighting against Hollows, through well-crafted character-driven stories, which set up an excellent foundation for Kubo to build upon through developing their characters within future story arcs. So in this arc, the key characters that we are introduced to are of course Ichigo, Orihime, Chad, and then the focus shifts to Uryu Ishida. And then lastly, after Ichigo and his friends are introduced to us, we then shift our focus to the individual who had given Ichigo power. The conclusion of this arc sets up events which will lead us into the next story arc as we turn our attention over to Rukia Kuchiki and the consequences that she must face for sharing her powers with our protagonist. As with all great stories, this arc has a solid beginning, middle and end, with the start of the arc introducing our protagonist to Rukia Kuchiki and consequently transforming him into a substitute Shinigami. During this time, we as the audience as well as Ichigo get a crash course and everything that we need to know about Shinigami, Hollows and the Soul Society from Rukia herself. After Ichigo accepts the responsibility that comes along with acquiring power, we see him face off against several hollows through the story of Orihime and her older brother who transforms into the hollow acid wire, and then the story about Chad looking after the parakeet Yuichi Shibata, who is being tormented by the hollow Shrieker. The middle portion of this arc serves to introduce us to the character of Uruhara when Rukia ends up purchasing a mod soul from him. After the introduction of the humble candy store owner and the perverted con, we learn about the tragic death of Ichigo's mother and why he feels responsible for it. When Ichigo faces off against the hollow responsible for killing Masaki Kurosaki, Ichigo confronting and battling against the Grand Fisher was one of a handful of key events that occurred during this story arc. This portion of the story, titled Memories in the Rain, begins in chapter 18 and concludes by chapter 25. After some antics with Don Kononji, we are then introduced to the character of Uryu Ishida, who identifies himself as a Quincy. It is through his character that we learn about the long-standing feud that exists between the Quincy and the Shinigami. The conflict between the two races exists because of the way that they exterminate Hollows. Shinigami purify the Hollows, sending them to the Soul Society, while Quincy exterminate the Hollow, including its soul through utilising their Quincy arrows. Through Uryu's character, we are introduced to Ichigo's first rival within the story. After crushing a piece of hollow bait, he challenges Ichigo to a competition of who can destroy the most hollows. And when far more hollows than either of them had expected appear within Karakura Town, we see Chad and Orihime caught up in Uryu's game, as Chad activates his powers against the hollow Bulbous G, while Orihime gains her abilities battling against the hollow Num Chandelier. The candy store owner Urahara makes a reappearance during during this portion of the story, as he explains the life-changing significance of gaining power to Orihime and Chad. This competition with Uryu ends after the appearance of a Menos Grande. After the two of them work together and wound the oversized opponent, they call a truce to their rivalry. And of course, the impactful end portion of this arc involves Rukia running away from Kurosaki Clinic and the arrival of Byakuya and Renji in Karakura Town in order to apprehend Rukia.
When Uryu fails to protect Rukia, Ichigo arrives and battles against Renji. Ichigo is initially overwhelmed by Renji, but after he gains a power boost, Renji finds it difficult to keep up with Ichigo's speed, and he does end up turning the tables on a lieutenant. As he is about to deal the finishing blow to Renji, their battle is ended by Byakuya, who stabs Ichigo through the chest. After failing to protect her, Rukia leaves with Byakuya and Renji to the Soul Society, where she must face the consequences of giving her powers to Ichigo. This arc then concludes with Ichigo or Hime, Chad and Uryu preparing and training in order to go to the Soul Society to rescue Rukia in the next arc. Ichigo undergoes training with Urahara where he learns to activate his innate Shinigami powers, while Chad and Orihime train with Yoroichi, and lastly Uryu trains on his own. The substitute Shinigami arc ends in chapter 70, with Yoroichi accompanying Ichigo and the others as they travel through the Dangai to begin their journey towards the Soul Society. This summarizes all of the events that occur from the start of the first volume of Bleach to the end of the 8th volume. From chapters 1 to 70, you'll see that gradually Kubo's art has started to change. The way that he draws the faces of characters has become simplified. No longer do they have these oversized foreheads, and these really angular facial proportions. As well as this, the way that Kubo draws hair has also changed. In chapter 1, Ichigo had very short and spiky hair, while in chapter 70, the hair is much longer and flowing. Another example of a character that demonstrates the growth of Kubo as an artist is the character of Orihime. In chapter Chapter 3, you can see that she has a very prominent jaw and a totally different facial structure to what we see in Chapter 70. You can see that Kubo now draws a lot of his characters with more rounded features, and in my honest opinion, I love the change in Kubo's art style throughout the story, and I feel like he peaks during the Forbring arc, where he has drawn some of the best artwork that I have seen from him. In addition to the change in how he draws characters, his panelling structure of the manga pages also changes from Chapter 1 to 70. Within the first chapter, you can tell that his panelling is unrefined, and it's totally different to the work that he has done much later on. There is a lot going on in a single page, with some pages even having 8 panels on them. While in chapter 70, you can see that Kubo is more comfortable with taking up the space of the page with larger panels. He has so much more variety to his panelling, whether if this is drawing double spreads across two pages, or even with a page diagonally cutting through the middle, expressing his artwork through two impactful panels that cover an entire page. While it is true that the early portions of the substitute Shinigami arc do feel somewhat monster of the week. They are all tied together thanks to the characters that are introduced and are intrinsically involved in those plot lines. This is of course in reference to Ichigo's encounter with Fishbone D, then Acid Wire, and lastly the Hollow Shrieker. They are all instances where Ichigo has to protect either his friends or his family. The encounter with Fishbone D was significant because it resulted in Ichigo gaining the power to protect, while the encounter with Acid Wire resulted in Orihime learning the identity of Ichigo as a substitute to Shinigami. Later on during this arc, we learn that she didn't forget her memories of that night, and she remembers Ichigo wearing a Shinigami Shihakusho, and with the battle against the Shrieker, Chad is heavily involved. We learn about his incredible strength as an ordinary human, and how he resolves to protect the parakeet against an enemy that he cannot even see. Through Acid Wire, we learn about Orihime's bond with her brother, and through the Shrieker, we are briefly introduced to the realm of hell, and to Chad's character. All of these stories are interlinked, and come full circle with Orihime and Chad gaining their own power to fight against Hollows later on during this arc. The stories that occur within this arc get longer and longer, with the encounter against Fishbone D lasting for only one chapter, the battle against Acid Wire lasting for four chapters, the fight against the Shrieker being over five chapters, and lastly the battle against the Grand Fisher being over nine chapters. You can see that Kubo was becoming more and more comfortable as he started to tell longer stories involving the characters that he had just introduced. With the competition between Uryu and Ichigo and the battle against the multiple hollows that appear within Karakura Town taking place between chapters 34 to 50, easily taking up a significant portion of this story arc. Another thing that I want to mention about these hollows that Ichigo and his friends were facing off against during this early portion of the story is that each of them felt like they had a variety to their abilities. Fishbone D was the first hollow that we had seen and he demonstrated incredible strength while also possessing incredible Reiatsu, which Rukia comments upon in chapter 1 when she finally is able to sense the hollow. The next hollow, Acid Wire, was able to use its tail as a whip to attack opponents, whilst also having the ability to spit acid at its opponents. Similar to a Chinese dragon, Acid Wire was also able to fly through the air. Kubo gets really creative when it comes to the hollow Shrieker, as this hollow was able to shoot out leeches from the top of its head that can stick to anything. Once these leeches attach onto their target, the Shrieker is able to detonate them through generating vibrations from his tongue. During this arc, Kubo peaks with the introduction of the Grand Fisher, one of the most powerful hollows that Ichigo 
encounters. A hollow that of course possesses incredible spiritual power and enhanced speed and has a plethora of abilities to utilize. The Grand Fisher demonstrates an ability to extend his limbs to attack his opponents. He also has tentacles that he can utilize to capture and restrain an individual. The most prominent feature of the Grand Fisher is the law that he utilizes. This protrudes from his neck and it is used to attract potential humans that he can devour. We see the Grand Fisher utilize his lure by transforming it into Ichigo's mother as he attempts to cause Ichigo emotional distress. In chapter 22, the Grand Fisher demonstrates an ability called Transcribe, where he extends the fingers of his claws and pierces into his opponent's body and searches through their memories trying to find a weak spot. And it is after he does this that he transforms his lure into Ichigo's mother. In addition to all of this, the Grand Fisher also demonstrates high speed regeneration. He is the best example of a villain that Kubo fleshes out during the Substitute Shinigami arc. Not only is the premise of this villain fascinating, his powers and abilities are also equally as fleshed out. And it is for this reason that you feel concerned for Ichigo, who is pretty much a novice here, while he is up against this very experienced Hollow. This arc is supposed to give us a taster of what's to come. So many characters and concepts are introduced to us, and they are done over the course of 70 chapters. Everything from introducing characters like Urahara and Yuriichi, as well as making us aware of the realm of the Soul Society, and introducing us to the concept of Quincy's, Hollows, and lastly Shinigami and the bond that they share with their Zanpakuto through learning their name, as we see Ichigo go into his inner world and confront Zangetsu, as he learns about the Shinigami powers that he has laying dormant within himself, after the powers that Rukia had given to Ichigo were removed by Byakuya. I want to now talk about some key events that occur during this arc, the first of which is the introduction of Uryu's character. Kubo has a very distinctive manner in which he introduces characters. The best way that I can describe it is that he does so in a very cool but yet mysterious manner. Typically, the character is observing what Ichigo is doing, and there is always this air of sinister malice. You see this not only when Uryu is introduced, but even when characters like Shinji Hirako or Ginjo Kugo are introduced into the story. Through introducing Uryu's character, Kubo sets up an opposite of Ichigo. Not only is Uryu an opposite in terms of a Quincy, while Ichigo is a Shinigami, Uryu is also the more experienced fighter, while Ichigo is the novice who is new to this world. In chapter 34, Uryu is even surprised that Ichigo cannot sense the presence of a hollow. In front of both Ichigo and Rukia, Uryu summons his powers and destroys a nearby hollow. The arrow fires through the hollow like a lightning bolt, as the lore of Bleach continues to be expanded through the introduction of a Quincy. At the end of chapter 34, Uryu states to Ichigo that he hates Shinigami, and this is explained to us when we learned about Uryu's grandfather Soken Ishida, who had passed down to him the traditions of the Quincy. Uryu had developed a hatred for Shinigami after his master Soken Ishida was defeated by Hollows. It was evident that the Shinigami could have arrived much sooner to save Soken Ishida, but they had purposefully been delayed in their response to help him, and this was after years of his master trying to mend the bond between Shinigami and Quincy. He had been trying his utmost best for the two groups to get along with each other, and this was despite the fact that the Shinigami had exterminated all of the Quincy in order to protect the stability of the souls between the human world and the Soul Society. After hearing about Uryu's grandfather, in chapter 46, Ichigo declares that he was going to work together with Uryu in order to defeat the Hollows. Uryu initially disagrees to this notion, but he eventually changes his mind after Ichigo reveals to him that he had lost his mother to a Hollow, and he explains to Uryu that he wants to protect others from experiencing such pain, the pain that he had felt when he had lost his mother, and this is what ultimately leads to the two of them working together in order to push back the threat of a Menos Grande. Upon first viewing, seeing Ichigo and Uryu work together may not be that significant, but after reading through the entirety of the story, the two of them working together in this instance is a historical moment. You can see that Urahara even recognizes this when he stops Rukia from assisting the two of them, as he emphasizes that it is an important battle for both Ichigo and Uryu to face off against this Menos Grande. After this incident, Uryu's stance within the story quickly changes, as he goes from being a rival to an ally, even going as far as to protect Rukia from the threat of Renji and Byakuya. His efforts may have been in vain, but this does lead to Ichigo arriving and protecting Uryu from being dealt a finishing blow. Up until this point, the story has been confined within the relatively small area of Karakura Town, but we do know that a world exists outside of this small area, and the link between that world and Karakura Town is Rukia Kuchiki. For Rukia, it was like all of the fun that she was having up until now was too good to be true, and she now has to face the music with the arrival of her childhood friend and her older brother. Through the arrival of these two characters, we get to learn a bit more about the abilities of an experienced Shinigami. Some of these abilities include enhanced speed, and most importantly, the revelation that one Zanpakuto can be released, as we get to see the Shikai release 
of Renji Zanbakdo. In every sense of the word, Ichigo is completely unrefined, even with the control that he has over his spiritual pressure. Renji is as savage as a wild animal as he repeatedly attacks Ichigo, who is struggling to fend off all of his attacks. Eventually, he cuts Ichigo across the shoulder as the difference between the two of them becomes cemented, and this is where Renji explains to him the severity of the situation. Up until now, Ichigo has been fighting against Hollows, but he is now up against a Shinigami who has decades of experience. Renji declares that Ichigo is as good as dead, and after he dies, his powers will be returned to Rukia. And after his defeat, Rukia will be taken back to the Soul Society where she will be executed. Rukia had run away from Kurosaki Clinic in order to protect Ichigo. She was aware of the consequences of what she had done, and she didn't want to drag Ichigo into it. After all, he was the one who had taken all of her powers. This condescending talk doesn't waver Ichigo's resolve, as he manages to swipe his Zanpakuto across Renji's face, scratching his chin. During this battle against Renji, it becomes evident that Ichigo doesn't know the name of his Zanpakuto. As Kubo introduces into his story an element to his Shinigami's power that becomes significant all the way to the end of the story. Names are a pivotal aspect to the lore of Bleach. Whether if this is calling out the name of your Zanpakuto or calling out the name of an ability, each of them have their significance, and this is explained further in detail during the Thousand Year Blood War arc, but I'll get around to that when I review that story arc. What's important to note is that the name of the Zanpakuto is first mentioned within chapter 54, and it leaves Ichigo completely confused as he has no idea what his Zanpakuto is called. And it is immediately after this instance, Renji activates his Shikai, as his Zanpakuto completely transforms in shape. He strikes down Ichigo across his left shoulder, completely cutting him down. Over the course of 50 or so chapters, a meaningful bond is formed between Ichigo and Rukia. Rukia had gifted Ichigo with the power to protect his loved ones, something that he had desired ever since the death of his mother. While Ichigo had inadvertently granted Rukia with the gift of enjoying a normal life, making friends and not worrying about your duties or responsibilities. A carefree life where she would no longer have to worry about being a Shinigami or going back to the Soul Society. A life that she had enjoyed so much to the point that she felt guilty and had to force herself to run away from Kurosaki Clinic in order to protect Ichigo. It is because of the friendship that has developed between these two characters that Rukia holds Renji back from delivering the final blow to Ichigo. It is then in Chapter 55 where Ichigo has a sudden burst of spiritual power. Thanks to this, he is able to turn the tide of the battle, as he sweeps Renji off of his feet, knocking him to the ground. Just as Ichigo is about to declare victory against Renji, his Zanpakuto is severed clean in half by the quiet Byakuya Kuchiki, who has been doing nothing but observing this battle. Byakuya demonstrates the true difference in power between an ordinary Shinigami and a captain level Shinigami, as his incredible speed results in him appearing behind Ichigo without him even noticing, as he just as quickly stabs him through the chest. Ichigo at this moment collapses and is left with no choice but to see Rukia leave with both Byakuya and Renji. No further action will be needed against Ichigo as he will eventually bleed out and die anyway. Just like so many other impactful scenes that occur within this manga, Kubo depicts this moment poetically. As Ichigo slowly bleeds out on the pavement with rain pouring down on him, he ends up being rescued by that humble candy store owner who always appears to be there, who is always aware of whatever is going on, but has never directly gotten involved within the story up until this point. Urahara not only heals Uryu but he rescues Ichigo and brings him back to his store. He tells Ichigo that only he can save Rukia, and he has a method of getting him to the Soul Society. But he will only tell Ichigo this method if he promises to train with him for the next 10 days. And it is over the course of these 10 days where we are introduced to the source of Ichigo's powers. The fact that he has a dual hollow and Shinigami nature. And this is foreshadowed to us after he returns from his inner world and activates his own Shinigami powers while he is donning a mysterious hollow mask on his face. When Ichigo is sent into his inner world, he has introduced to his supposed Zanbakdo spirit, Zangetsu. This mysterious, long-haired, cloak-wearing individual reveals to Ichigo that his own Shinigami powers were awakened when he had borrowed Rukia's powers. It is at this moment that Ichigo is ordered to activate his own Shinigami powers by picking one box out of a thousand falling boxes. He is to find the box that contains his Shinigami powers. After Ichigo is successful and emerges with his own Shinigami powers, he trains one-to-one -one with Urahara. As we learn just how powerful Urahara is, the second Shikai release of any Zanpakuto that we see within Bleach is the Zanpakuto of Urahara. As we learn, the name of his Zanpakuto is Benihime. During his training with Urahara, Ichigo is made to face the fear that he feels while taking part in battle. Ichigo has difficulty calling upon his Zanpakuto because his ears are plugged with fear. When Ichigo stops running away from Urahara and hesitating, he calls upon his Zanpakuto, which results in him unleashing his first Getsuga Tensho in Chapter 67. After the dust settles, we see that Ichigo has actually manifested the Shikai release of his Zanpakuto. Their training ends after Ichigo and the 
unleashes a powerful Getsuka Tensho, which Urahara manages to block but still deals some damage to his hat. After this, Urahara declares that Ichigo is ready now to go to the Soul Society. While Ichigo is being trained, we do get to see some glimpses of the Soul Society, especially during Chapter 65, as we see that Byakuya is confronted by Kimpachi Zaraki, who begins to taunt him. Kimpachi ends up being dragged away by Ginichimaru, as we get our first glimpse of the world that Ichigo and the others are going to be going into. After Ichigo's training is completed, Ichigo has some downtime with his friends, as they get together to watch some fireworks. And of course, not too long after this, Ichigo and the others are led by Yoriichi through the Sankaimon, as they make their way through the Dangai in order to get to the Soul Society. This arc ends with a gripping cliffhanger. There are so many questions that are left unanswered. We are going into an entirely new world, which feels like Ichigo and his friends are not totally equipped to deal with. I remember when I had first read the conclusion of the Substitute Shinigami arc, I had felt doubt and fear, wondering if Ichigo and the others could really succeed in their mission with rescuing Rukia, especially after the feats that Byakuya had demonstrated, how easily he was able to cut down Ichigo. But despite this, Ichigo's resolve had given me hope, and how his resolve was able to see him through several encounters that we have seen within these 70 chapters, including his battle against the Shrieker, the Grand Fisher, even being able to successfully fend off a Menos Grande, and the most significant was his comeback against Renji, when he had turned the tide of the battle. When old hope seemed to be lost and Ichigo was about to be defeated, he was able to muster the strength to fight back. After seeing the potential that Ichigo possesses during his training with Urahara, we can see that he has so much room for growth, and this incredibly fascinating Shikai release that Renji had demonstrated, Ichigo too was quickly able to achieve. I've seen a lot of people state that the theme of the Substitute Shinigami arc is death and how to deal with it. I do agree with this slightly, but I believe that the theme of death is prevalent throughout the entirety of the Bleach story. Ichigo had to learn to deal with the death of his mother, and to come to terms with it and not to blame himself. While this goal isn't achieved within this arc, he does eventually realise this much later on. During this arc, it is also revealed that Ichigo's friends that accompany him to the Soul Society also had to face death through their own unique experiences. Whether if this was Orihime coming to terms with the death of her older brother, and reminding him that she has not forgotten him, or Chad realising that the spirit of the boy that was trapped within the parakeet has actually died, and there is no way for him to be revived back into the real world. In addition to this, Chad was born in Japan and was taken to Mexico by his parents, but at a young age they had died. We do find this out in chapter 107, but it does clarify that Chad's character also had to deal with death in his life. And lastly, the character of Uryu Ishida also had to face the pain of loss after losing his master Soken Ishida. Ichigo and his friends know all too well the pain and suffering one must endure after losing a loved one. At this point in the story, Rukia had become a cherished friend to Ichigo. He cannot stand by and let her be killed after everything that she has done. If it wasn't for her, Ichigo would not have been able to protect his family that night. If it wasn't for her, Ichigo would not have known what it feels like to have the power to protect. In chapter 58, prior to Ichigo training with Urahara, he learns that nobody else remembers Rukia, and all traces of her existence within the human world have been erased. However, it is revealed that Orihime actually remembers Rukia and asks Ichigo what had happened to her. When Ichigo explains the situation to her, he actually comes across as being doubtful as to whether if it would be the right thing to do to bring Rukia back. After all, Rukia never really belonged within the human world because she had come from the Soul Society. But it is Orihime that encourages Ichigo that it is better for Rukia to be alive in the real world rather than dying within the Soul Society. This conversation with Orihime renews Ichigo's resolve, and results in Orihime contacting Chad, where they too begin their training, in order to assist Ichigo. Ichigo's friends may not share in the bond that Ichigo has with Rukia, but they are willing to work hard and to help Ichigo, because they are aware that if anything happens to Rukia, Ichigo would not be able to forgive himself, and it is for that reason that they don't want Ichigo to go through any pain or suffering, and they are willing to help him. In my opinion, the Substitute Shinigami arc is an excellent story arc that introduces us to the world of Bleach. You can see Kubo really get into his comfort zone and find himself as a storyteller and an artist throughout these 70 chapters that we have reviewed here. I've genuinely loved diving back into these first 70 chapters of Bleach, and every time I go through the story without fail, I find something new to appreciate about Kubo's work, and it's made me feel even more excited to go through the Soul Society arc, the story arc that is revered as the best story arc within Bleach. My review of that story arc may be over two videos, because I really want to go over all of the different battles, the interactions that occur the elements that are introduced into the story, and the impact that this arc had on the larger anime community as a whole, and why I believe that the Soul Society arc wasn't the peak of Bleach, rather it was the perfect setup for things to come.
In the first video of my Bleach analysis series, we covered the first 70 chapters of the story. We spoke about how Kubo introduced us to several characters and different concepts, and in this second video we're going to go straight into the following arc, the Soul Society arc, as we pick up from where we left off, following Ichigo and his friends making their way over to the Soul Society in order to rescue their friend Rukia. The Soul Society arc is regarded as one of the best arcs within all of shonen anime and manga, and it is for this reason that I really want to take my time with this story arc and delve into its finer details, trying to understand why it is beloved by so many people. So for this reason, I'm going to be splitting up my Soul Society arc analysis into two videos. In this first part, we'll be covering everything from the start of this arc all the way up until Ichigo is reunited with Rukia after his battle with Kimpachi. So I'm incredibly excited to dive into this material because it features some of Kubo's best work. Let's see how he builds off of the conclusion of the Substitute Shinigami arc and delivers to us a fascinating opening act, which introduces us to a new new cast of characters, an entirely new world, and how the characters he introduced during the last arc react to all of these changes, and lastly how Kubo establishes stakes within this arc, which not only make you empathise and engage with the characters, but make you feel invested into the outcome of this story. So without further delay, let's begin my analysis of the first half of the Soul Society arc. <laughs> In the first half of my Soul Society arc analysis, we are covering material from chapters 71 to 116. These chapters are of course adapted into episodes 21 to 41 of the anime. A lot takes place within the first half of this arc. We have Ichigo and his friends taking part in several battles, including Ichigo's battle with Jidambo, Ikaku Madarame, Renji Abarai, and lastly Kimpachi Zaraki. In addition to this, we get to see the inner workings of the Serete, as we see the Gote 13 respond and mobilise to the threat of intrusion and in addition to all of this chaos that is occurring within the Serete, we have a shocking revelation that one of the captains of the Gote 13 has been brutally murdered and put on display for everybody to see. So I personally believe that each story arc of Bleach has a theme that it centers itself around. While the Substitute Shinigami arc dealt with the themes of death as well as this idea of having the power to protect the weak, the second story arc of Bleach centers itself around this theme of having the resolve to carry out your desire. The individual whose resolve is tested to its limits during this arc is of course our protagonist Ichigo, and in typical style of a shonen battle series, he is made to face off against progressively stronger opponents, which serve to ultimately challenge and test his resolve. During Ichigo's battle against Ikaku, the extent of his abilities are questioned by his opponent. During his rematch with Renji, his determination is put to the test, and lastly, his endurance and the true extent of his power is tested during his battle against Kimpachi Zoraki. Now before I analyse and dive into each of these three encounters, let's quickly familiarise ourselves with the events that take place during this story arc with a brief summary. After arriving in the Soul Society, Ichigo and his friends attempt to enter into the Serete, but their entry is blocked by the gatekeeper Jidombo who guards the western gate of the Serete. He is one of four gatekeepers who are tasked with protecting the Serete from intruders. The gatekeepers of the Serete are considered to be exceptional Shinigami. Despite the threat that Jidombo poses, Ichigo confidently confronts him, as he reveals that he had successfully completed his training with Urahara with five days to spare, and during those five days he had been constantly battling against Urahara, honing and refining his skills, thus explaining why Ichigo is unnerved by the threat of this oversized Shinigami. These five days of training that Ichigo has with Urahara are not explicitly shown to us, but we do have a brief flashback to this period of time where Urahara had taught Ichigo an important lesson about resolve, but I'll cover that in a lot more detail when I go over his rematch against Renji. After Ichigo successfully destroys the axes of Jidambo and wins him over with his kind words, he and his friends are ultimately prevented from entering into the Serete by the arrival of Ginichimaru. As a punishment for Jidambo assisting them, the captain easily cuts off his left arm and pushes Ichigo back out of the Serete. After having managed to survive their encounter with Ginichimaru, they are left with no choice but to seek an alternative unconventional entry method into the Serete. This comes in the form of Yoriichi's friend Kukakushiba. At the home of Kukakushiba, Ichigo and his friends learn to channel their spiritual power. They are required to create a stable barrier 
around themselves so that they can be successfully fired out of Kukakushiba's fireworks cannon. Meanwhile, in chapter 82, the captains of the Gote 13 assemble as they question Ginichimaru as to why he didn't kill Ichigo and the others when he had encountered them, resulting in some of the captains and even us as the audience being suspicious of Gin's true motives. Their meeting ends up being interrupted by the arrival of Ichigo and the others into the Serite. They have a rather chaotic aerial entry into the Serite, and because of this, it results in all of them being split up. Immediately after Ichigo lands into the Serite, he is confronted by Ikaku Madurame in chapter 85. After a bloodied and suspenseful battle, Ichigo ends up defeating Ikaku. However, before the conclusion of their battle, Ikaku warns Ichigo that if indeed Ichigo is the strongest amongst the invaders, then he should be fearful of his captain Kimpachi Zaraki, who will surely be out there hunting him down. After this battle, Ichigo rushes to the tower that Ruki is being held within, but before he can make it any further, he is reacquainted with the red-haired Renji Ibarai. He is determined to kill the individual who had stolen Rukia's powers, but Ichigo is equally as determined to take down anybody who stands in his way of rescuing Rukia. Now that Renji is within the Soul Society, there are no restrictions placed upon his powers, as he explains to Ichigo that during their first encounter, he had been only using one-fifth of his full power. This is an intense back-and-forth battle, with initially Renji having the upper hand, but when Ichigo is made to remember his training with Urahara and what it means to have resolve when facing off against an opponent, the tide of battle quickly turns. Despite Ichigo knowing that there are several lieutenants and captains that stand in his way, it doesn't waver his resolve. Ichigo is going to rescue Rukia whatever the cost. During the Soul Society arc, a memorable aspect of his character is his resolve and determination. Ichigo has every reason to give up. The odds are overwhelmingly stacked against him. His opponents have decades and in some cases centuries worth of experience. From the previous arc, we are aware that Ichigo's desire to rescue Rukia is fueled by his feelings of guilt and responsibility. He feels responsible for everything that is happening to her. Unknowingly, it was him who had taken all of Rukia's powers, forcing her to reside within a Gigai until her powers had returned. It is because of Ichigo that she was away from the Soul Society for several months, and ultimately the reason why they had sent a search party out to look for her. During this battle against Renji, we learned about Renji's past with Rukia, how they had grown up together and studied together, and how after Rukia had been invited into the Kuchiki family, a distance had formed between the two of them. However, despite this distance, Renji still cares a great deal for Rukia, and it is for this reason that he overly exerts himself against Ichigo, and he expresses anger and his desire to kill the one who had taken Rukia's powers away from her, as he believes that it is because of that individual that Rukia is now going to be executed. Renji knows that he isn't strong enough to go against the Soul Society, or to challenge his captain. For him, the execution of Rukia is an inevitability and it cannot be stopped, and the only way for him to let out his emotions and to exert his frustration is if he either kills or defeats Ichigo, while on the other hand, Ichigo opposes the law and order of the Soul Society. He goes up against a system that has been well established for over a thousand years. Even a seasoned Shinigami like Renji Ibarai knows better than to oppose the well established law and order of the Soul Society. Despite Renji's feelings for Rukia, he knows that his efforts to save her would be futile. The difference between the two of them is that Renji is aware of how overwhelmingly impossible of a task it is to rescue Rukia, while Ichigo, who is oblivious to the history and customs of the Soul Society, is pushing through every obstacle with even luck and a naive sense of blind optimism. He is later grounded by characters like Yoriichi, who put this task of rescuing Rukia into perspective for his character, but we'll talk about that during the later portions of this video, like how he is made to understand that he is throwing his life away by recklessly confronting captains of the Gotei 13, without even being aware of what the second release of a Zanpak Do is. But coming back to Ichigo's battle against Renji, it is an excellent test of his resolve. We know that Renji, similar to Uryu Ishida, is another rival turned friend. This change in his character occurs after Ichigo remembers how to battle without fear. After he reaffirms his will and cuts down Renji, we have a unpredictable turn of events. After remembering the history that he has shared with Rukia, he pleads with Ichigo to rescue her. The Soul Society is a world ruled on honour and pride, so for Renji requesting the help from an outsider, the very individual who had just defeated him, is a captivating display of humility on Renji's part. He admits to Ichigo that he is not strong enough to defeat his captain Byakuya Kuchiki, as he is the most prominent figure who stands in the way of stopping Rukia's execution. After learning that Renji had trained day in and day out in the pursuit of surpassing his captain, and his efforts ultimately amounting to nothing, Ichigo reassures Renji that he will rescue Rukia and he promises to defeat Byakuya. After this battle, while Ichigo's wounds are being healed by Hanataro, we have the shocking revelation that the captain of Squad 5, Sosuke Aizen, has been murdered. Obviously, the intruders of the Soul Society are assumed to be behind this. Not too long after this, Ichigo faces off against the inevitable. One of 
of the captains of the Gotei 13 as he encounters Kimpachi Zaraki, the very captain that Ikaku Madurame had warned Ichigo about. We quickly learn that Kimpachi is an individual who is addicted to the thrill of battle, and it is for this reason that he is obsessed with fighting strong opponents. Once again, Ichigo finds himself up against an unmovable obstacle in his path to rescue Rukia. Despite attacking him, he is unable to hurt Kimpachi, as it is made evident that Ichigo is not strong enough to be facing off against him, and this ultimately disappoints the captain. He appears to have defeated Ichigo after he stabs him through the chest with his Zambakdo. He walks away from him as Ichigo once again finds himself in this situation. Similar to the prior arc where he was immobilized by Byakuya, Ichigo lays helplessly on the ground. After Ichigo begs for his blood to stop pouring out of his body, Zangetsu appears before him. After Ichigo speaks to the spirit of his Zambakdo and proves that he is worthy enough to wield Zangetsu by facing off against Hollow Ichigo, he is then allowed to borrow the powers of Zangetsu while in battle. This results in him releasing an incredible amount of Reiatsu. Their battle resumes as Ichigo is able to hold his own against the captain. After proving that Ichigo is evenly matched against Kimpachi, he removes his eye patch as he affirms that he is going to kill Ichigo. This declaration by the captain does not move Ichigo because now he is fighting alongside his Zanpakuto spirit. As long as he has Zangetsu supporting him, then there is no way that Ichigo would lose against an individual who doesn't even know the name of their own Zanpakuto. The battle between Ichigo and Kimpachi concludes in one final clash, which is a result of both of them unleashing all of their Reiatsu and charging towards each other. This final clash brings an end to their battle as it results in an evenly matched draw. During his battle against Kimpachi, Chad also encounters a captain of the Gotei 13. He ends up being easily defeated by Shunsuke Kyoraku. Before he is defeated, in chapter 106 we get to learn about Chad's past and the promise that he had made with Ichigo. After his battle against Kimpachi, Ichigo is helped by Yoriichi. Meanwhile, we learn that Ganju and Hanatro have just arrived at the tower where Rukia is being kept. However, after Ganju finally sees Rukia, we have a shocking revelation that she is the Shinigami who had killed his brother. In chapter 115, Rukia confirms to Ganju that she did indeed kill Kain Chiba. It is ironic that he was helping Ichigo go against the Soul Society in an attempt to rescue the very Shinigami who was responsible for killing his brother. Ganju confronting Rukia is interrupted by the sudden appearance of Byakuya's Ryatsu. He is approaching Rukia's location aware that the intruders have made contact with her. In chapter 116, after Ichigo wakes up from having his wounds healed, he senses Byakuya's Ryatsu and quickly realizes that he is confronting Ganju and Hanataro. After realizing that his friends are in danger, he rushes off to their location, not heeding Yuriichi's warning. At the end of chapter 116, we see that Byakuya inflicts a fatal wound against Ganju, and before he can cut down Hanataro, Captain Ukitake arrives. But he isn't the only one to make a sudden appearance, as the chapter ends with the sudden arrival of Ichigo, as we finally have Ichigo reuniting with Rukia for the first time since the end of the Substitute Shinigami arc. In addition to this, he is once again confronting Byakuya Kuchiki, the very man who had taken Rukia back to the Soul Society, her older brother who is not opposed to her execution, and is in fact the largest and most formidable obstacle that stands in the way of Ichigo. This covers the story events that take place between chapters 71 to 116, forming the first half of the Soul Society arc. What I want to do now is to dive deeper into some key events that occur. The first of which is the introduction of the Gotei 13, which is this brand new cast of characters. These are the main antagonistic forces of this story arc that stand in the way of Ichigo and his friends from rescuing Rukia. The Gotei 13 comprises of 13 divisions, which each have their own specialities. All 13 divisions are led by Head Captain Yamamoto, and each division has its own captain and vice captain, who is referred to as a lieutenant. In chapter 81, the iconic and memorable captains of the Gotei 13 13 are finally introduced to us. We are shown this cast of powerful new characters. An individual who leads a division of the Gotei 13 is usually one of the most respected Shinigami within the Soul Society. They are individuals who have undergone extensive training and have mastered everything that there is to know about their own Zanpakuto, and it is for this reason that they can exert enormous power on the battlefield. Up until chapter 81, we have seen two captains demonstrate their incredible power. The first was of course Byakuya Kuchiki, who had easily subdued Ichigo during the Substitute Shinigami arc, and the second was of course Ginichimaru, who at the start of the Soul Society arc was able to easily take out Jidambo and push back Ichigo and his friends and prevent them from entering into the Serete. The meeting that takes place between the captains of the Gotei 13 is actually because of Ginichimaru, as they question why he did not apprehend or kill the intruders of the Soul Society. Each of the captains of the Gotei 13 have a very distinctive character design, from Kimpachi's bandages
bandages around his waist, his eye patch and his spiky hair, Otozin sunglasses and his distinctive scarf that he wears around his neck, even Komomura who has his entire face covered. Some of them appear more intimidating than others, but there is one thing for certain, none of them should be underestimated. We get an insight into some of the personalities of the captains in chapter 82. We quickly learn that one of the captains appears to be missing from this meeting, and that is indeed Captain Ukitake. His excuse for not attending is that he is sick. We are introduced to his character at the end of the first half of the Soul Society arc in chapter 116. Some of the personalities that are revealed to us in chapter 82 include the personality of Genichi Maru. He appears to have this nonchalant facade, which appears to be covering a more sinister side to his character, as he brushes off everybody's concerns and asks if he is really that important for all of the captains to gather and have a meeting about. Another character we learn about is Kimpachi Zaraki. We learn about his intimidating demeanor when he cuts to the chase and questions Gin as to why he had confronted the intruders without permission. And in addition to this, he doesn't mix his words by directly asking why is it that Gin had let them get away, because it should have been easy for a captain of the Gotei 13 to kill five intruders. When Gin plays off Kimpachi's concerns and acts surprised that his attack did not kill any of the intruders, Mairi intervenes. We already know Mairi has one of the most unique and distinctive appearances out of all of the captains. This brief glimpse into his personality reveals an erratic character. He is just as intimidating as Kimpachi. He blatantly accuses Gin of purposely letting the intruders get away. Kimpachi ends up getting annoyed by Mayuri's interference and threatens to attack him if he doesn't stop asking questions, as he states that he is in charge of questioning Gin. Before the situation can escalate, the head captain intervenes, as we are introduced to the leader of this group of characters, somebody who appears to be more stern and intimidating than all of them combined. He scolds both Mayuri and Kimpachi. We get to the purpose of the meeting as he questions Gin why he had acted without orders, and why is it that he allowed the intruders to get away. The head captain wants an explanation from Gin. Gin responds by smiling and stating that he doesn't have an explanation. He was just careless and he has no excuse for his actions. But as we know, before the head captain has a chance to respond, the meeting is interrupted by an alarm that sounds, alerting everybody that intruders have entered into the Serite. Of course, we continue to see members of the Gotei 13 throughout this story arc, as we learn about Hitsugaya's relationship with Momo, and Momo's relationship with Captain Aizen. We also get to learn more about Shunsui's character through his interaction with Chad, but during the first half of the Soul Society arc, the captain that we are most acquainted with is of course Kimpachi Zaraki. Thanks to his battle against Ichigo, we learn a lot more about his character, including his motive for taking action, his sadistic personality, and his unquenchable desire for taking part in battle which is comparable to the Saiyans from Dragon Ball. So I now want to talk about Ichigo's first real encounter during this arc, which of course is his battle against Ikaku, which takes place between chapters 85 to 89 of the manga. Ichigo starts off this battle by establishing the attitude that he has adopted during the invasion of the Soul Society. When Ikaku questions why he didn't run away from him, Ichigo states that it would be pointless to, because if Ikaku is stronger than Ichigo, then he would easily be able to catch up to him. But on the other hand, if Ikaku is weaker than him, then he will resolve to beat him. The way he responds here reveals that Ichigo has a very do or die attitude here. He knows that there is no going back. Regardless of his opponent, he has to face off against them. There is no running away. The battle between the two of them immediately begins as they unleash a barrage of attacks and counter-attacks. After exchanging names with each other, Ikaku is glad that Ichigo's name begins with the same letter as his. He even goes as far as to suggest that the two of them should be friends, an offer that Ichigo quickly rejects. Ikaku comments on Ichigo's fighting style as he states that he is a novice and he doesn't look like a warrior, but despite all of this, his reaction time is incredible and the way that he swings his zanbakdo is powerful and lastly, even when it comes to his movements, they are on par with Ikaku's. Clearly, looks can be deceiving as he states that Ichigo cannot be dismissed as a novice. When Ikaku questions who had trained Ichigo, he reveals that he was trained for 10 days by none other than Kisuke Urahara. It is at that moment in chapter 87 that we get a glimpse of Urahara in his captain's attire, revealing his identity as a former captain of the Gotei 13. Ikaku behaves with a lot of honor and respect, especially when it comes to battle. And after learning that Ichigo was trained by Urahara, he immediately activates his Shikai, stating that it would be disrespectful to defeat Ichigo in any other way. He is successfully able to cut the entirety of Ichigo's forearm, but this doesn't waver Ichigo's resolve in the slightest. With a cut above his left eye, which is pouring blood, impairing his vision, and now this wound that he has sustained on his arm, Ichigo does not appear to be doing well. After he bandages his arm, he immediately attacks Ikaku once again, as he tells him that their battle is just getting started, as he hasn't even had an opportunity to show Ikaku what his own Zanpakdo can do yet. I 
love this cocky, overconfident side to Ichigo. He never gives in to the overwhelming odds during the story arc, and it always seems like he has something up his sleeve. Some of the battles that occur within the Soul Society arc are very reminiscent of Akira Kurosawa movies. The way that Kubo depicts these encounters with two characters clashing, and it is almost like a pause in time until we wait for the outcome of their clash. And this is exactly what happens during Ichigo's battle against Ikaku. Ichigo's overconfidence pays off, as he tells Ikaku that it is him who will not be able to hold his Zanbakdo anymore. He jumps into the air and cuts down Ikaku as it appears that he releases a small Getsuka Tensho. This not only leaves a gaping wound across Ikaku's chest, it also breaks his Zanbakdo in two. Even after this, Ikaku refuses to give up. Ichigo tries to show some compassion as he tells him to put down his Zanbakdo. He knows that he has lost, but just as I had mentioned earlier, Ikaku has too much respect and honour when it comes to the battlefield. He isn't going to stop fighting until one of them is dead. He states that he is not a coward and he is not going to surrender to Ichigo, and neither will he escape death by running away. He charges towards Ichigo as he remembers his training with Urahara, and in comparison to Urahara, Ikaku is far too slow, which leads to him attacking one final time taking out his opponent. In chapter 89, we see the aftermath of their battle. While Ikaku was passed out, it is revealed that Ichigo had healed him and had prevented him from dying. When Ichigo reveals to Ikaku that he wants to know where Rukia is because he wants to save her, he bursts out laughing at the prospect. It appears that Ikaku has some respect for Ichigo after battling him, and after learning that Ichigo had saved his life. Through this initial taster battle, we get a feel for Ichigo's abilities. Ikaku was clearly no match for him, but he was still strong enough to inflict some serious damage on Ichigo. And I also believe that this fight served to humanise the enemy that Ichigo is up against, as we learn that there are both good and bad Shinigami within the Soul Society. Society, and Ichigo's first encounter just so happened to be against somebody who was understanding and was willing to help Ichigo and to point him in the direction of where Rukia is being held. Now the next key event that I want to talk about is Ichigo's rematch against Renji. I did speak about this rematch earlier and how Renji has a change of heart and asks Ichigo for help after he is defeated by him. But now I want to dive into some of the details that are revealed about Renji's past with Rukia, explaining some key points about his character and how he was impacted after Rukia had joined the Kuchiki family, and it is because of this rematch, because of Ichigo's resolve, he is made to see sense. The fact is that Renji was too afraid to do anything to stop Rukia's execution. He had already given up before even trying, but this is exactly the opposite of Ichigo's attitude during this story arc. He is being driven by his resolve and his determination. With each encounter, he is continuously getting stronger, and it's not like Ichigo doesn't know how difficult this task is. He is constantly being reminded on his way there. Even moments ago, Ikaku Ikaku had laughed in his face when he had suggested that he was going to rescue Rukia. He may have held his own against a third seat like Ikaku, and he may have been able to face off against a lieutenant, but the prospect of Ichigo facing off against a captain at this point in the story feels very daunting even for us as the reader. Renji comes to understand after the end of his rematch with Ichigo that he was bested by the better man. Ichigo's resolve and determination surpassed Renji's. We are aware that Renji isn't entirely cold and heartless towards Rukia. We are shown several scenes where he has visited visiting Rukia while she is imprisoned, and he is even shocked to learn about her execution at the end of the Substitute Shinigami arc. He even reassures her that Byakuya would possibly get this decision overturned, and to request for a lighter sentence. The bond between the two characters is further explained in Chapter 98, after Renji is defeated by Ichigo. He has an opportunity to think back to his past with Rukia. We of course get to learn how he had befriended Rukia when he was just a child. They had grown up within the worst area of Rukongai, a small town which was populated with grown grown-ups were either thieves or murderers, and the children that resided within that town were treated no better than stray dogs. They had dreamt of a better life, one where they are living within the Serite. Rukia and Renji were both spiritually gifted, so they were easily accepted into the Shinigami Academy. While studying there, they quickly rose up through the ranks. But one day, Rukia had been approached by the Kuchiki family. She was made an offer to join this noble clan, and it was at that moment that Rukia had entered into an entirely new world, leaving behind her childhood friend Renji. This distance that formed between the two of them was the result of a class divide that now exists. In addition to this, there is a significant power divide also, as Renji senses the immense spiritual pressure emanating from Byakuya Kuchiki. It is so intense that Renji is unable to even look at him. Rukia was hesitant to accept the proposal, but Renji, who wants the best for her, encourages her. He puts up a facade and tells her to join the Kuchiki family. None of this is explicitly stated 
within this chapter, but you can tell from Rukia's reaction that she is saddened by Renji's response. She feels as though he doesn't care if he's going to lose her. Rukia abruptly ends their conversation and just says thanks and walks away from Renji. After walking away, you can see the sadness in Renji's eyes. This is because he knew that Rukia would finally have a real family. He had to let her go and not get in the way. This is what he had continuously told himself in this moment. The only way to win back Rukia is if Renji rose through the ranks and was able to surpass Byakuya Kuchiki. This is incredible character writing. And if you had seen Renji's first interaction with Rukia during the substitute Shinigami arc, you probably wouldn't have been able to assume any of this. When he had arrived within the world of the living, he was incredibly cold towards her. We are aware that Renji worked incredibly hard to graduate from the Shinigami Academy, and he rose through the ranks within the Serete until he was able to become the lieutenant of the man that he dreams to surpass. At the end of chapter 98, all of this comes to light when Renji pleads with Ichigo as he states that he has never been good enough to defeat Captain Kuchiki, and we get the confirmation that ever since Rukia had left him, he had trained day in and day out, but he isn't strong enough to save her. He pleads with Ichigo. He shamefully requests for him to save Rukia. In this moment, a respect forms between these two characters, and our opinion of Renji transforms from this detestable character to becoming one of the most likable characters drafted by Kubo. And this is all credited to Kubo's excellent character writing. Earlier on, I spoke about how Ichigo was fearful and reluctant during this battle against Renji. At the start of this encounter, when Renji appeared to have the upper hand, Ichigo was being soundly beaten. You can only imagine what must have been going through his mind. He was probably doubting himself whether if he actually has what it takes to save Rukia. It isn't until he remembers the words of Urahara during their training together that he has a shift in his psyche. After remembering his will to fight, he combines it with his intense desire to save Rukia. And it is because of this, Ichigo was able to finally cut down Renji. We know that Ichigo is taught and made to remember several lessons throughout his encounters in this portion of the story. His battle against Kimpachi made him go up against an individual who has no bond or relationship with his Zanbakdo. And it is through this encounter that Ichigo strengthens and even forms a stronger bond with his own Zanbakdo. We come to learn that the only thing that Ichigo knows about his Zanbakdo is its name. He knows nothing about how Zangetsu truly feels. Ichigo is dragged into his inner world when he begs for his body to stand back up. He is pleading for his wounds to stop bleeding. His desire to continue fighting manifests Zangetsu, and when he enters into his inner world, he encounters a inverted version of himself. The second time that Ichigo enters into his inner world, he is handed over a Asuchi, and he is made to go up against Hollow Ichigo who is wielding Zangetsu. The purpose of this battle against Hollow Ichigo is to test him whether if he is worthy to wield Zangetsu or not. This inverted version of Ichigo demonstrates to him how to truly wield Zangetsu, as he utilizes the Zanbakdo like it is second nature to him. Hollow Ichigo scolds him for pursuing this desire to get stronger, while at the same time never making an effort to get to know his Zanbakdo. If you know about the true nature of Ichigo's Zanbakdo, then this is incredible foreshadowing. You have to think about why is it that he is hearing these words from Hollow Ichigo instead of Old Man Zangetsu. There is a lot of significance to this, and we only get further insight into this conversation during the Thousand Year Blood War arc, which is still hundreds of chapters away. Once Ichigo understands that he was no different to Kenpachi, the very man who we had criticized for knowing nothing about his Zanbakdo, it is at that moment that Ichigo humbly requests for Zangetsu to fight alongside with him again. He wants another chance to understand him better, and it is at that moment that the roles are reversed and Ichigo is now hoarding Zangetsu, while Hollow Ichigo is now wielding the nameless Asuji. After Ichigo leaves his inner world, an interesting conversation takes place between Hollow Ichigo and Old Man Zangetsu, as Hollow Ichigo tells him to train him well, because one day the power that Ichigo has will be his. This ominous warning foreshadows the events that will take place during Ichigo's battle against Byakuya, and even the problems that Ichigo has with his inner hollow during the Aranka arc. Another point that I want to mention about the first half of the Soul Society arc is the relationship that Aizen has with his Lieutenant Momo. The anime does expand upon this a bit more during episode 46, as we learn about how Momo had idolized Aizen, and how she had dreamed of joining Aizen's division after her graduation. After becoming Aizen's lieutenant, you can see the close bond that she shared with her captain, and it is for this reason that she has a complete mental breakdown after learning that Aizen has been murdered. Prior to her learning about the death of Aizen, she was warned by Captain Hitsugaya to be careful about Genichimaru. Because of this warning, she immediately attacks Genichimaru when she discovers that Aizen has been killed, and it is at that moment that she is confronted by Gin's lieutenant Izuru Kira. The two lieutenants are about to engage in battle until they are interrupted by Captain Hitsugaya. Not too long after this, we learn that Aizen had even left her a final letter. In this letter that Momo reads after the death of Aizen, it appears that her captain had been suspicious of Captain Hitsugaya, her childhood friend, and it is for this reason that Momo ends up confronting Hitsugaya. Captain Ginichimaru just so happens to
to be there also. Hitsugaya appears to be suspicious of the motives of Gen. While Momo, who is too caught up with what she had read within Aizen's letter, stops Hitsugaya from attacking Gen. This encounter occurs during the second half of the Soul Society arc, but I wanted to mention it here because I think it fits well with Momo's relationship with Aizen, and how her character was used for a big plot twist that occurs at the end of the Soul Society arc, but I'll talk more about that in my next video. The last thing that I want to speak about during this first half of the Soul Society arc is the emotions that Rukia is feeling while she is being detained. We are aware that she questions herself several times as to why people are shedding blood on her behalf, as she reveals that she has a very low sense of self-worth, and it appears that all of this is linked to this individual called Kain Shiba, the brother of Ganju who we learned that Rukia had murdered. In chapter 94, we learn more about how Rukia was feeling during her confinement through the character of Hinataro, who had been working as a janitor in the prison. He had a lot of opportunity to speak to her, and he noted how she was often gloomy and sad. She even goes on to explain that she has a lot of faith in Ichigo, but she also mentions that she feels guilty, that it is because of her that Ichigo's life had changed and he had suffered greatly. We are aware that Rukia does smile when Renji tells her that there is a report that five intruders have invaded in the Soul Society, and one of them matches Ichigo's description. Renji notes that after Rukia had heard this news, she had smiled for the first time in a long while. At the end of chapter 116, we know that Rukia expresses anger towards Ichigo for attempting to rescue her, but Ichigo ignores her. His line of sight is fixated on Byakuya Kuchiki, and this of course brings us to the end of the material that we'll be analysing and discussing for the first half of the Soul Society arc analysis. We are left with a lot of unanswered questions, and a significant cliffhanger. But now that we have talked about the break-in portion of the Soul Society arc, in my next video we'll be talking about the rescue that occurs. So there are several points that I have noted for us to look forward to in the second half of the Soul Society arc. We are going to finally catch up with Orihime and Uryu, and even get to see an intense battle that involves Uryu's character, as he finally faces off against a captain. We are also aware that something sinister is occurring and it involves the character of Ginichimaru, as somehow he is tied into the death of Aizen. Hitsugaya is hot on his heels and he knows that something is up. His driving motivation is that his childhood friend Momo Hinamori has gotten involved with the situation, and it is evident to him that she is being manipulated in some way, shape or form. Even after reading the first half of the Soul Society, you question what the true motives of Ginichimaru are. Who killed Aizen? Why was it that Gin allowed Ichigo and the others to survive? In addition to this, we have this cliffhanger where Ichigo has once again encountered Byakuya Kuchiki. Has he trained enough to reach a level where he can actually challenge Byakuya now? And what about this individual called Kain Shiba, Ganju's brother that Rukia had murdered? We will get the answer to all of these questions in my next video on the Soul Society arc. In the second video of my Bleach review series, we spoke about the first half of the Soul Society arc, and in this video, we're diving straight back into the action with the second half of my Soul Society arc analysis, and in this video, we're going to be covering everything from the various battles that occur in the second half of this arc, including Uryu's battle against Mayuri, Renji's battle against Byakuya, and even Tozen and Komomura facing off against Kimpachi, as well as this, diving deep into the battle between Ichigo and Byakuya, and while all of this is going on, there are hints of a sinister a plot unfolding behind the scenes, and Hitsugaya is hot on the heels of this investigation, as through his character and Momo's character, we learn about the sinister plot of Aizen. So join me as I speak about the second half of one of the most iconic anime and manga story arcs, as we wrap up my analysis on the Soul Society arc. So in this video, we're covering material from chapters 117 to 182, which is adapted into episodes 42 to 63 of the anime. This portion of the Soul Society arc spans over 22 episodes and 66 chapters of the manga. So we pick up with where we left off in the last video, with Ichigo confronting Byakuya for the second time. As we know, this encounter is cut short when he is knocked unconscious by Yoriichi. She escapes with Ichigo as she explains that Ichigo has no chance against Byakuya unless he knows the second release of his zombie. Bakdo, which is referred to as Bankai, and it is an ability that is a prerequisite to become a captain of the Gotei 13. So if Ichigo is to have any chance against Byakuya, then he definitely needs to attain Bankai. And as we know, Renji eventually joins Ichigo in his Bankai training. He also informs him that the date of Rukia's execution has been moved up. From this, we finally catch up with what Orihime and Uryu have been doing during this arc, as the two of them are confronted by the captain Mayuri Kurosuchi. Uryu of course begins his one-on-one -on -one battle against the 
the captain. When Mayuri utilizes his Bankai, Uryu is left with no choice but to remove his Sunray Glove. It is a form that echoes and even in some ways foreshadows Ichigo's final Getsuka Tensho ability. In this new form, he is able to defeat Mayuri, but he is unable to actually kill his opponent, thus resulting in Mayuri fleeing from the scene. This portion of the story features a lot of infighting between the actual members of the Gotei 13. As a division begins to form between Shinigami who are adamant upon the rules and order of the Soul Society and thus support the execution of Rukia, while there is another group of Shinigami who disagree with the execution of Rukia and believe that something more sinister is going on. These individuals are of course risking their honour and the titles that they have attained within the Gotei 13. Slowly we see this division form as captains like Kimpachi, Ukitake and Shunsui end up assisting the invaders. While all of this is going on, Hitsugaya is under the belief that Ginichimaru was behind the murder of Aizen. The confrontation between the two of them is interrupted by Gin's childhood friend Rangiku. As the execution of Rukia draws nearer, the divisions within the Gotei 13 begin to manifest, as Kimpachi ends up rescuing Ichigo's friends. But he is confronted by Tozen and Komomura, who object to the fact that he is breaking the rules of the Soul Society. Meanwhile, Renji having completed his Bankai training attempts to rescue Rukia, but he is confronted by Byakuya. Despite the fact that he has attained Bankai, he is easily defeated by Byakuya, but not before he is able to successfully land an attack against his captain. When Rukia's execution ceremony begins, it ends up being interrupted by the arrival of Ichigo, and he is assisted by two of the most powerful and senior captains of the Gotei 13, Shunsui and Ukitake. After Rukia is successfully rescued, she is taken away by Renji, and thus begins the main conflict of this arc, as the Shinigami begin to battle against each other. After Ichigo defeats three lieutenants and clears the way for Renji, he is intercepted by Byakuya Kuchiki, the man who had swiftly taken down Ichigo in the last arc, the individual who stands in his way and supports the execution of his own sister. During this battle, we learn that Ichigo was successful in his Bankai training as he activates the second release of his Zanbakdo. However, he is still a novice when it comes to this form as he hasn't learned how to properly utilize his Bankai to its fullest potential. When it comes to the point that Ichigo is about to be killed by Byakuya, his hollow takes over his body. After unleashing a savage and far more powerful barrage of attacks against Byakuya, Ichigo is able to regain control over his body. Ichigo desires to defeat Byakuya on his own terms without any external help. They appear to be evenly matched until their battle concludes with Ichigo narrowly winning. Of course, during this battle, several other encounters are taking place, including the battle between head captain Yamamoto and his two senior students, Shunsui and Ukitake. Unfortunately, most of this battle occurs off screen, but we do get to see some glimpses of it, including the Shikai release of head captain Yamamoto. These are three of the most powerful Shinigami in the entire series. And in hindsight, I believe that Kubo did the right thing by not unveiling all of his cards at once here. He showed us enough to tease us for their future appearances within the story. As you know, we get to see head captain Yamamoto's Bankai in the Thousand Year Blood War arc, as well as the Bankai of Shunsui. In this instance, during the Soul Society arc, we get to see the Shikai release of all three of these captains, and it is enough to leave us wanting to see more. Another pivotal and key battle that takes place during this portion of the story is the battle between Captain Soifon against her former mentor Yoriichi. It is a emotional battle as it gives us a lot of insight into the character of Soifon and we dive into her past and see how she had adored Yoriichi and had wanted to be like her. That is until Yoriichi had mysteriously one day vanished from the Soul Society and had denounced all of her prior titles. Their battle concludes when Soifon is defeated by Yoriichi utilizing her Shunko ability and in the end we learn that Soifon's resentment for Yoriichi stems from the fact that she didn't want to be left behind as she asks Yoriichi why she didn't take her with her. Now the final portions of the Soul Society arc set up the story for the Aranka arc and the upcoming story centered around Aizen as Hitsugaya makes his way to the Central 46 chambers and he learns the shocking truth that Aizen is still alive and he had been behind all of the events that are currently taking place within the Soul Society including being responsible for deciding to execute Rukia resulting in the Shinigami either being opposed to Rukia's execution or supporting it because no matter how harsh the sentence is they believe that they are upholding the law and order of the Soul Society by following an order from the Central 46. After Aizen easily takes down Hitsugaya and Momo, he heads to the execution grounds. We learn that the real reason that he had desired for Rukia to be executed was so that the Sokyoku could destroy Rukia's body, leaving the Hokyoku within her intact. It is revealed that Urahara had buried the Hokyoku deep within Rukia's soul, and the real intention behind Urahara giving Rukia a Gigai was so that it would transform her into a human being, thus resulting in the Hokyoku being forever trapped within Rukia's soul. This was the only method that Urahara had in order to get rid 
rid of this very powerful object. After revealing that he had killed the Central 46 and had been behind the execution of Rukia, he ends up removing the Hokyoku from Rukia's body. He orders Gin Ichimaru to kill Rukia, but Byakuya, who is badly wounded from his battle with Ichigo, appears and protects his sister. In one of the most satisfying moments within the entirety of this series, as we see a change occur within Byakuya's character here, as he has finally learned the errors of his ways, and acts like and fulfills the role of an older brother that he has been neglecting for so long. Of course, Aizen successfully flees from the Soul Society, along with his accomplices Tozen and Gin. The Soul Society arc then concludes by Byakuya apologising to Rukia, as we learn information about Rukia's older sister who had been married to Byakuya, and how she had regretted that she had abandoned Rukia. Byakuya was ordered by his late wife to find and protect her. We learned that Byakuya had fallen in love with Rukia's older sister, and he had broken the rules and customs in order to marry her. But after marrying her, he had promised to always abide by the rules. And during this early portion in the story, Byakuya was following through this promise, thus neglecting the promise that he had made to Hisana to protect her younger sister Rukia. After realising the errors of his ways, he humbly apologises to Rukia for his actions, and it's a very satisfactory moment that occurs during the end portion of this arc. Another story beat that we see for now have its resolution is Rukia gaining forgiveness from the Shiba family, as she apologises to both Kukaku and Ganju for the part that she had played in the death of their brother. Kukaku ends up stopping her apology as she states that she is forgiven, revealing that Ukitake had approached the Shiba family and had told them what had happened. They know that Rukia had no choice but to kill Kayan, and it was on his orders that Rukia had acted. His body had been taken over by the parasitic hollow and there was nothing else that they could have done to save him. And lastly, when it comes time for Ichigo and the others to return to the world of the living, Rukia reveals to Ichigo that she wants to stay in the Soul Society. Ichigo is initially surprised by this, but he quickly regains his composure and remembers that that's where Rukia belongs, within the Soul Society. So the next day, Ichigo and the others gather at the Senkaimon and return to the world of the living, thus ending the Soul Society arc. So it is evident through this summary of about 66 chapters worth of manga material that a lot occurs during this second half of the Soul Society arc. So it's best to start by speaking about the elephant in the room, which is the highly anticipated rematch between Ichigo and Byakuya. Going into this battle, we should know that Byakuya had gone against the rules of the Kuchiki family in order to marry Hisana, and he had also gone against the rules in order to adopt Rukia as his younger sister. But now, during this arc, in order to fulfil his duty as the head of the Kuchiki family, he is abiding by the law and order of the Soul Society, even if it means the death of his younger sister. He states that because the Sokyoku has been destroyed, he will kill Rukia himself. Ichigo is in direct opposition to the cold-hearted nature of Byakuya. At this point, we don't really know the context or the reason behind why Byakuya is so adamant on Rukia being executed. Like Ichigo, we wonder how on earth is it that an older brother wouldn't care enough to save his sister. Byakuya's resolve is in direct opposition to the resolve of Ichigo. And as I mentioned in the last video, one of the key themes around this arc is the theme of resolve. Having the conviction to follow through with one's resolve, even if it means you are up against impossible odds. Up until this battle, Byakuya has been portrayed as a very stoic and stern character, but through this encounter we see Ichigo bring out more emotion from Byakuya's character, as we see a different side to him. We know that this battle ends with Byakuya being defeated and him finally acknowledging Ichigo. This is in stark contrast to his behaviour and mannerisms at the start of their battle, where he states that he won't even need to use his Bankai in order to defeat Ichigo. After having decided to kill Ichigo and Rukia himself, he was confident that Ichigo could do nothing to change his mind. You can see that Byakuya's character had discarded his humanity in the pursuit of this belief that law and order is absolute. Ichigo proves to be more of a formidable opponent than Byakuya had anticipated, which results in him contradicting himself as he actually utilises his Bankai against Ichigo. During this battle, Byakuya quickly learns that Ichigo is no longer that naive and inexperienced boy that he had encountered in the Substitute Shinigami arc. During their first encounter, Ichigo had the resolve to protect, but he didn't have the strength and power to back this up. But now, during this encounter, Ichigo is able to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Byakuya. His intense training has resulted in him having the power to back up his resolve. You can see the visible shock in the face of Byakuya when Ichigo reveals that he has a Bankai of his own. Byakuya definitely has a superiority complex here, as he deems Ichigo not to be worthy enough to have attained a Bankai, especially in such a short period of time. Byakuya's logic here is that only the most experienced Shinigami can attain Bankai, even within the noble families who are born with exceptional spiritual pressure, an individual attaining Bankai is only seen once every few generations, and of those few people who do attain Bankai, they have always been remembered as some of the greatest Shinigami within the history of the Soul Society. The significance and the importance of Bankai is emphasised by Byakuya. He compares the honour 
and respect that comes with the second release of a Zanpakuto to Ichigo who had gained the powers of a Shinigami by borrowing them from Rukia. Byakuya assumes that Ichigo is still utilizing Rukia's borrowed Shinigami powers. He is unaware that Ichigo has his own Shinigami powers. It is at this point that we know that Byakuya knows very little about his opponent and this is due to his own hubris and ignorance. He had looked down on Ichigo and had not deemed him to be a worthy adversary and it is because of this and several other reasons that Byakuya was eventually defeated by Ichigo. Byakuya believes that Ichigo has violated the pride of the Soul Society several times. Firstly, by interrupting the execution ceremony of the Soul Society and secondly, by transforming into this form that he believes is not worthy enough to have been called a Bankai. Ichigo questions the pride and honour that Byakuya feels for the Soul Society and as a Shinigami himself and he questions if it is because of this pride and honour that he is willing to allow Rukia to be executed. Then if that is the case, then Ichigo will step on Byakuya's pride in order to defeat him and it is for this very reason that Ichigo had obtained Bankai so that he could defeat Byakuya and show him the error of his ways. Ichigo similar to Byakuya is an older brother so he knows all too well what it feels like to have a younger sibling that you need to protect and in this sense could you ever see Ichigo willingly allow the execution of one of his sisters? When you think about it like this you know completely why Ichigo is opposed to Byakuya and everything that he stands for during this battle. The desire and beliefs of our protagonist are reinforced during this battle. For the sake of fulfilling his desire to protect his loved ones, Ichigo will battle against anyone or anything. After Ichigo rejects help from his inner hollow, we come to the end portion of their battle. At this point, Byakuya has learnt a lot more about Ichigo and it is evident that he has gained some newfound respect for him. He even gives a response to Ichigo's question about why he isn't trying to save Rukia. He had supported the execution of Rukia because he believes that an individual who commits a crime must suffer their consequences, even if it means that their punishment is to be sentenced to death, because those are the rules. Ichigo disagrees with following the rules if it means that lives will be lost, especially if that life is your own sister. Byakuya refers to the sibling bond as a foolish notion. Byakuya reveals his level of maturity here, as he states that he is not going to give in to his personal emotions. Even if the law is opposing his own family, he will stand beside it. As a leader of one of the four great noble families, Byakuya is a role model for all other Shinigami. If he is seen to be not obeying the law and order of the Soul Society for his own personal reasons, then what will stop the other Shinigami from doing the same? But Ichigo, who is still adamant in his resolve, states that if he was in Byakuya's position, then he would fight against the law and order of the Soul Society in order to protect his sister. Ichigo's persistence ends up paying off, as Byakuya concedes defeat. At this moment, Byakuya realises that Ichigo didn't hold anything personally against Byakuya. He was in opposition to the rules of the Soul Society. Ichigo's words and actions remind Byakuya of Rukia's former lieutenant, Kain Shiba. The battle between Ichigo and Byakuya was not a personal one. It was a battle between two resolves, two ideals, two opposing beliefs. And in the end, the individual who had proven to have the stronger resolve had won. And like I mentioned earlier, this results in a change in Byakuya's character, as he finally takes up his role as a older brother, and he protects Rukia from being killed by Ginichimaru. Now moving on from the battle between Ichigo and Byakuya, the Soul Society arc has one consistent element that makes us heavily invested within the story. From the beginning to the end of this arc, Kubo has well established stakes. If the characters that we are following do not succeed, then the consequences are that Rukia will be executed. These are the stakes that Kubo firmly establishes within the story. The pressure is always turned up a notch, as Kubo constantly reminds us of Rukia's execution. And there are several instances where her execution is rescheduled and it is brought nearer and nearer. This of course results in the reader fearing for the worst, that our characters are not going to be prepared in time. This results in pressure being put on Ichigo and his friends to accomplish the impossible sooner than expected. The tension and the stakes continually build until the moment of Rukia's execution, where it appears that she has accepted her fate after much pondering and she is content with facing the punishment for her supposed crimes. Rukia's character is left in solitude for the majority of this story arc, where she is left with only her own thoughts. This strong character that we see at the start of this story is gradually broken down, as she is made to confront her guilt from the past. In addition to her lending her powers to Ichigo, Rukia has another guilt, and this stems from the belief that she holds that she was responsible for killing her former lieutenant Kain Shiba. This unrelated incident from decades ago adds to Rukia's feelings of guilt, as she begins to accept that she is a criminal who is not worth saving nor is she worth dying over. And this is why she had difficulty accepting that Ichigo and his friends had arrived to rescue her. She believes that she had done wrong by killing Kayan. And when we see the flashback during the second portion of the Soul Society arc, we learn about why the death of Kayan is pivotal to the underlying theme of the Soul Society arc. As Rukia gives up on herself and gives in to her feelings of guilt, she loses all resolve for continuing
willing to live. But Ichigo refuses to give up on Rukia, even if she has given up on herself. As soon as Rukia's execution ceremony begins, Kubo masterfully builds attention. Up until the final moment when the Sokyoku is about to execute her, and you begin to question whether if Ichigo is going to make it in time or not, he appears out of nowhere. When Ichigo appears here, it is for the first time in quite a while, as we have been following the events of the other characters during this story arc, like the battle between Renji and Byakuya, the backstory of Kainshiba, and the fight that takes place between Tozen and Kumamura versus Kimpachi. Our patience is rewarded with the arrival of a very confident and cocky Ichigo, as we can only assume that he has been successful with his Bankai training. There are a couple of instances where Ichigo's actions and mannerisms are reminiscent of the late Kainshiba. There's an instance where Rukia is reminded of Kain through Ichigo's smile, and like I had mentioned earlier, Byakuya was reminded of Kain towards the end of their battle. This adds to the significance of this character who only appears briefly during a flashback during this arc. Of course, it isn't until later on in the story that we learn that Ichigo is a descendant of the Shiba family through his father, but these instances are excellent moments of foreshadowing that hint at this revelation that we get later on. Rukia regains a hope to continue living when she realises that there are several individuals who are opposed to her execution. She is shocked to witness Captain Ukitake and Shunsui assisting Ichigo, and she is further stunned to see how powerful Ichigo has become in such a short period of time. Our protagonist had gone through these lengths because he owes a debt of gratitude to Rukia. Without her, he would not know what it feels like to have the power to protect. This is something that he had sought for ever since the death of his mother. His own weakness and his inability to protect his loved ones had led to his frustration. But after Rukia had entered into his life and had allowed Ichigo to borrow her Shinigami powers, she had effectively, in Ichigo's own words, saved his life. He had believed that he was destined to be powerless, but because of Rukia, Ichigo's own Shinigami powers were activated. It is because of her that he had become a Shinigami. This giant debt of gratitude had to be repaid, and there was no way that he was going to allow Rukia to be executed because she had helped him. Now, I want to go back and speak about several other significant moments that occurred during this arc, starting off with a battle between Uryu and Mayuri. Through this battle, we learn about the sinister nature of Mayuri. At the beginning of their encounter, he introduces himself by blowing up members of his own division in order to hurt Uryu and Orihime. Despite being a Quincy, Uryu is disgusted by the fact that Mayuri would kill his own men, even if they are Shinigami. The battle between Uryu and Mayuri quickly turns personal when Mayuri reveals that he had done extensive research on the Quincy race, and it isn't before long that we learn that one of the Quincy that Mayuri had experimented upon was indeed Uryu's late grandfather, Soken Ishida. We know that at the end of this battle, Uryu ends up losing his Quincy powers when he removes the Sanrei glove. During this encounter with Mayuri, Uryu demonstrates his pride as a Quincy, as he seeks to avenge the death of his grandfather. The captain continues to demonstrate disregard for his subordinates during this battle, as he puts his lieutenant in harm's way and even injures her just so that he can land an attack against Uryu. Mayuri's twisted actions not only stun and shock Uryu, but us as the reader. During this part of the story, Mayuri is portrayed as a detestable monster, and Kubo does an excellent job of villainizing his character. Uryu, who had played a minor antagonistic role in the prior arc is now a character that we are rooting for to win, and it is through this battle that Uryu's character had really started to grow on me, and his battle here was an excellent way to kick off the second half of the Soul Society arc, when Mayuri had insulted all of the Quincy victims that he had experimented upon, and had ridiculed his Quincy test subjects for expressing their pride as Quincy. During this encounter, we learn a bit about Uryu's relationship with his father, as we learn that his father Ryuken had denounced the way of the Quincy, stating that his effort should be spent on studying to save the living not to protect the dead from hollows. In response to his father's disdain for Quincy, Uryu had confided in his grandfather, as he had told him that he desired to become a strong Quincy so that he could protect others. Ever since he was a child, Uryu had desired to become stronger so that he could convince his father that there is meaning behind being a Quincy. Uryu's grandfather had told him that one day he would understand why his father hates the Quincy so much, and this is clearly foreshadowing the events of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, which is a storyline centred around the Quincy invading the Soul Society, and their leader Yuhabak trying to rid reality of this concept of death. We can see the themes of the final story arc being foreshadowed so early on. During this flashback that occurs here, we learn about the Sanrei Glove, the very glove that Uryu had utilised in his training prior to arriving to the Soul Society. After training with it for 7 days and 7 nights, a Quincy will reach the peak of their power, but Uryu was warned that once the Sanrei Glove is won, it can never be taken off, because once it is removed, that individual will lose all of their Quincy powers 
Brothers, but in order to face off against Mayuri and to avenge the death of the Quincy, Uryu was left with no choice but to remove the Sanrei Glove. But by doing so, Uryu transforms and he has an incredible increase in his Quincy powers. But the price that he will pay for doing so will be that he will lose his Quincy powers. I mentioned this earlier, but you can see that this form that Uryu transforms into reminds me of Ichigo's final Getsuka Tensho, how Uryu's Quincy bow becomes a part of his arm, similarly to how Ichigo's Zambakdo had joined onto his arm in his final Getsuka Tensho form. And as we know, Mayuri is ultimately defeated by Uryu, and before Uryu can progress further, he is captured by Tozen and imprisoned, thus bringing an end to Uryu's involvement within the Soul Society arc. I do believe that he could have played more of a significant role within the story, but I'm not complaining because the battle between him versus Mayuri was incredible, and it's definitely one of my favourite fights that occur within the Soul Society arc. This is because of the backstory behind it. It was incredibly personal for Uryu. After witnessing Mayuri's deplorable acts, we want to see him defeated. Now moving on from this, I want to speak about another character who plays a significant role within the shadows of this arc. I am of course speaking about Captain Hitsugaya. In the first part of the Soul Society arc analysis, I spoke about how Hitsugaya had warned Momo about keeping a close eye on Captain Ginichimaru, and this was prior to the murder of Aizen. The death of a captain deeply impacts Momo, as she immediately suspects Gin. We know that she had attempted to attack him, but Gin was defended by his own lieutenant Izuru Kira. When Momo and Kira are taken away, Hitsugaya has a moment alone with Gin. Hitsugaya believes that if he didn't intervene, then Gin would have surely killed Momo. We are aware that Momo is one of Hitsugaya's childhood friends. Despite his short stature, Hitsugaya is an individual not to be taken lightly, and he isn't the type to mix his words, especially when it comes to the safety and well-being of the people that he holds dear to himself, his childhood friend Momo being one of them. During the latter portion of this arc, we are aware that Momo's character is manipulated, as there is an instance where she even accuses Hitsugaya for the murder of Aizen. These suspicions are credited to Aizen firstly making Momo infatuated with him, and secondly through the letters that he had left behind for Momo, where he had portrayed Hitsugaya in a negative light. He had written that Hitsugaya was behind the execution of Rukia, so that he could steal the Sokyoku in a plan to destroy the entire Soul Society. Now as far-fetched as all of this sounds, Momo completely believes it. She ends up believing that Hitsugaya may well have been responsible for the murder of Aizen, somebody who she looks up to. The reveal at the end of the arc that Aizen was still alive takes a lot of people by surprise. There is one individual, however, who is suspicious from the very beginning, and that was Hitsugaya, and in some ways you could say that he is the true MVP of this arc. Hitsugaya is against the execution of Rukia because he believes that Ginichimaru will utilize the Sokyoku for his own evil doing. Hitsugaya decides to appeal the execution of Rukia, so along with Rangi he visits the chambers of the Central 46, where he discovers that all of its members have been murdered, and it is here that Aizen's grand plan is revealed, as he impales Momo and swiftly takes down Captain Hitsugaya. The betrayal of Aizen, Gin, and Tozen is revealed to the entire Soul Society. After Aizen leaves with his accomplices, a very touching moment occurs between Rukia and Ichigo, right at the end of the Soul Society arc. In chapter 181, Ichigo assumes that Rukia is going to leave with them back to the world of the living, but she tells him that she has decided to stay within the Soul Society. This scene that occurs between Ichigo and Rukia is an example that I always cite whenever I want to convince others that Kubo is a master at visually depicting his story. With little words and through his drawings, we can see the emotions and the expressions of the characters. Upon hearing Rukia's response, Ichigo is initially surprised, and you can see this through the way that Kubo draws Ichigo's mouth here, and the panel immediately after it being a flashback of when Rukia was taken to the Soul Society by force, and when she had tearfully told Ichigo not to follow her. He is glad that at least she is now not being forced to go to the Soul Society. She is willingly wanting to be here. Upon this realization, he smiles and states that if that's what she really wants, then that's the best thing for her. You can tell that a solid friendship has formed between these two characters and they deeply care for one another. And this is shown through the way that Kubo visually depicts this moment. With such little words, we visually learn so much through this interaction. After Rukia reveals her intentions to stay within the Soul Society, there is a brief pause between the two of them. There is that initial surprise from Ichigo, and then there is that relief that he feels, that happiness that Rukia has actually decided to stay in the Soul Society, and wasn't forced to. After this, Ichigo remembers the reason why he had wanted to save Rukia, because it was thanks to Rukia that the rain had stopped falling onto Ichigo's world, the rain representing Ichigo's sadness, and how after Rukia had given him power, his sadness was alleviated. Fate and destiny is heavily implied between the bond that Ichigo and Rukia share. Rukia giving Ichigo the power to protect had changed his destiny, that fateful encounter 
her had resulted in Ichigo gaining the power to protect, and thus altering the course of his life. So with the ending of the Soul Society arc, Sosuke Aizen becomes the main antagonist of the story. Through the finale of the arc, we learn about how Urahara and Aizen appear to be linked by this tool called the Hokyoku, and it is a concept that is heavily explored within the next story arc of Bleach. As you already know, the Soul Society arc is regarded as one of the best shonen story arcs for good reason. It is praised for how it introduces us to this unique cast of characters called the Gotei 13, and how it expands upon the lore of Bleach by introducing us to an entirely new realm, and all at the same time it delivers to us a story that keeps us gripped to the edge of our seats. Each of the captains of the Gotei 13 have their own stances and beliefs about the execution of Rukia. In my opinion, the story definitely has an air of unpredictability, whether if this is characters unveiling their abilities, or unexpected plot twists and plot lines that are about to unfold. The most important aspect that Kubo remembers during this portion of the story is convincingly giving Ichigo growth in terms of his training so that he is on par with the captains of the Gotei 13. We see Ichigo realistically grow stronger with each step, as he gains acceptance from his Zanpakuto during his battle against Kimpachi, and how Yoriichi assists him with his Bankai training. All of this culminates in Ichigo finally being able to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe against Byakuya, but despite the growth that he has undergone in terms of strength and power, he is still no match against Aizen who easily defeats Ichigo with one hand. So despite the growth that Ichigo has undergone, he is still not strong enough to face off against the antagonists of the next story arc. So now that we have spoken about the entirety of the Soul Society arc, in the next video we will begin my analysis of the largest Bleach story arc, which is of course the Aranka arc. It had begun in 2005 with chapter 183, and had concluded in 2010 with the release of chapter 423. It had ran for a total of 5 years. I like the Soul Society arc, I will be breaking up my analysis of this very large portion of the Bleach story in several parts. Beginning with my first video which will cover the Aranka invasion of Karakura Town. Welcome to the fourth video in my Bleach review series, and in this video we're covering my favourite portion of the Bleach story, which is the Aranka invasion of Karakura Town, which serves as the first section of the Aranka arc. In this story arc, we are introduced to several new concepts in the form of Arankas and Vizards. Through the Arankas, we are introduced to a brand new group of characters called the Espada, and of course, through the Vizards, we are introduced to Hirako Shinji and his group of Vizards. I love this story arc because we return to the familiar environment of Karakura Town. This urban setting is disrupted by the arrival of the rebellious Aranka, who effectively spray paint Karakura Town with their spiritual pressure. There are three waves in which the Aranka invade Karakura Town, the first involving Yami and Ukiora, the second being the unauthorised invasion by Grimja and his Frashion, while we know that the third and final invasion by the Aranka serves as a diversion, distracting Ichigo and the others while allowing Ukiora to intercept Orihime and to threaten her. So with all of this external conflict going on, Ichigo 2 is dealing with an internal conflict of his own. We had brief glimpses of Ichigo's inner hollow during the Soul Society arc, but during this arc his inner hollow returns and tries to assume control over Ichigo. Ichigo is unable to fight and to protect his loved ones because of the disruptions of his inner hollow, the same inner hollow that he had rejected during his battle against Byakuya. During this portion of the story we learn that Ichigo isn't going to be able to get rid of his inner hollow so easily, so while also combating the threat of the Arankas, Ichigo has to find a way to overcome his fear of his inner hollow and to subdue it so that he remains in control. As you already know, I love this portion of the story, and with all of these story beats simultaneously unfolding, there is plenty to discuss. So without further delay, let's get into my analysis of the first third of the Aranka arc, the Aranka invasion of Karakura Town. The Aranka invasion takes place between episodes 110 to 142, with a fair few of these episodes being filler episodes, and in the manga it takes place between chapters 183 to 240. So in this video we're going to be covering about 58 chapters worth of material. At the onset of this story arc, Kubo makes us familiar with a couple of new concepts, the first being Vizards, who are Shinigami that have obtained hollow powers, and the second being Arankas, who are hollows that have gained Shinigami powers. We learn about Vizards through the 
the introduction of Shinji Hirako, who reveals to Ichigo that he too has a hollow mask and a Zanpakuto. He desires to recruit Ichigo into his group called the Vizards, while at the same time we learn about Arankas through the reintroduction of the Grand Fisher into the story, as he has removed his hollow mask and gained Shinigami powers, transforming him into an Aranka. Learning about the Vizards is pivotal for us to understand how Ichigo controls his hollow powers. So at this point in the story, it would be fair to assume that Ichigo is also a Vizard, and also learning about the Arankas is pivotal in understanding the army of Arankas that Aizen is building, and especially his elite Aranka soldiers, which are referred to as the Espada. So when the Grand Fisher reappears as an Aranka, he is defeated by Ichigo's father Ishin, who is revealed to also be a Shinigami, while at the same time Uryu was dealing with an Aranka of his own. But of course, after having lost his Quincy abilities, this proves to be far more difficult, and he ends up being saved by his father Ryuken, who we learn is able to utilize Quincy abilities despite him denouncing his Quincy nature. Not too long after this, Karakura Town is invaded by the first batch of Aizen's Aranka. The two Aranka that arrive are of course Yami and Ukiara. In a scene that is reminiscent to the arrival of Vegeta and Nappa during the Saiyan arc, Yami begins to immediately cause havoc to his surroundings, while the menacing but yet smaller in stature Ukiara remains silent and observes. Chad and Orihime are the first to intercept the Espada, but their efforts prove to be futile as Yami gravely injures Chad, and when Ichigo appears to protect them, his efforts are also proven to be futile. And this is thanks to the sudden interruption by his inner hollow. When Ichigo refuses assistance from his inner hollow, it begins to fight back, causing him to be distracted and thus being badly beaten by Yami. He too is then rescued by the arrival of Urahara and Yuriichi, who are able to successfully fend off the Espada. We learn that Ukiara and Yami had appeared within Karakura Town for a simple reconnaissance mission. They were ordered to evaluate the threat that Ichigo had posed towards Aizen. However, after having encountered and easily beaten him, they are reassured that Ichigo is not a worthy threat to Aizen and his plans. However, while in Karakura Town, something did gain the attention of Ukiara. He was able to deduce that Orihime's abilities are far more than just the ability to heal. He states that she has the power to reverse time, and thus she is able to return an object or a person to a prior state in time. She is able to manipulate space and time itself. This interest that Ukiara expresses towards Orihime's abilities foreshadows her being taken to Huekomundo, as her powers are unlike anything that Ukiara has seen before, and he believes that her powers could assist Aizen in some way. The fact that Ichigo is unable to protect his friends deeply impacts him, and despite him being there, he was unable to prevent Orihime from being hurt, and this was all because of the interruptions from his inner hollow. He begins to be fearful that this hollow that resides within him is going to take over, and he doesn't know how to control or subdue it. This proves to be a considerable source of inner conflict for Ichigo's character here. He remains in a slump until Team Hitsugaya arrives within Karakura Town. Captain Hitsugaya leads a team consisting of Renji Abarai, Ikaku Madarame, Yumi Chika, Rangiku, and lastly Rukia. Rukia notices that Ichigo is sulking, and after pulling him to one side and giving him a pep talk, he is able to get back onto his feet, and is prepared for battle when Grimjao and his Frashion invade Karakura Town without the permission of Aizen. They each take part in their own separate battles, with the most significant fight during this portion of the story occurring between Ichigo and Grimjao. A key revelation that takes place during this series of battles is the reveal of Ikaku's Bankai. It is probably one of the worst kept secrets of the entire Bleach series, but it's something that Ikaku doesn't want to be known widely, as he has no interest for pursuing a higher position within the Gote 13, as he desires to grow stronger under the watchful eye of his captain Kimpachi Zaraki, a man who he had come to admire and respect after being defeated by him. So with Team Hitsugaya initially appearing to be struggling against Grimjaw's Frashion, they end up receiving permission from the Soul Society to remove the limiter that has been placed upon their power, and after doing so, the Shinigami are easily able to defeat the Aranka. Meanwhile, Ichigo is losing his battle against Grimjao. However, after being badly beaten, he is able to fire a Getsuga Tensho towards Grimjao, which scars him. Before the fight can continue, it is interrupted by the arrival of Kaname Tozen, as he brings Grimjao back to Huekomundo, where he is punished for taking action without permission, as he has his arm severed by Tozen. At the conclusion of this fight, Ichigo is once again devastated, as he was unable to protect Rukia, and this deeply impacts him. He realizes, because of his inner hollow desiring to take control over him, he is unable to battle. So after he had initially rejected Shinji's proposal of help, at this point he has no choice but to turn to the Vizards, who end up assisting Ichigo by taking him into his inner world, where he battles his inner hollow, defeating it and taking control over his being. 
The Wizards then teach Ichigo how to manifest his holo abilities in battle through extending the period of time that Ichigo can manifest his holo mask in battle. During this time, Chad feels like he is being left behind, so he seeks help from Urahara, who instructs him to train with Renji so that the two of them can grow stronger together. And meanwhile, Uryu begins training with his father in the hopes of regaining his lost Quincy powers. While everybody is training, we learn about the true intentions of Aizen from Head Captain Yamamoto as he explains to Hitsugaya and his team that Aizen desires to kill everybody in Karakura Town as it is an area enriched with spiritual energy. He desires to do so so that he can create the Oken, which is a key to enter into the Soul King's domain. And this is because Aizen ultimately wants to overthrow the Soul King, deeming the Soul King to be unfit to rule over reality and believing that he could do a better job. Or he may also begins a training with Rukia and the Soul Society as the two of them get stronger and prepare for the upcoming battle against Aizen and his army in the winter. Everybody's training ends up being cut short with the third invasion of the Aranka within Karakura Town. The four Aranka, Grimjao, Yami, Lupi and Wonderwise arrive. They serve as a distraction for Ichigo and the others, while Ukiara is able to intercept Orihime. During Ichigo's rematch against Grimjao, he is able to use his newly acquired Hollow Mask. He has the upper hand during the battle, that is until the Hollow Mask breaks. The tables turn as Grimjao begins to once again soundly beat Ichigo, and he ends up being saved by the arrival of Shinji and Rukia. And as we know, when Ukiara speaks to Orihime, he orders her to come to Huekomundo, otherwise he threatens to kill her friends. He ends up giving her 24 hours to say goodbye to one person, who of course ends up being Ichigo. In this moment, she confesses her true love for him, and states that even if she was reborn five times, she would fall in love with the same person. After this, she is then taken to Huekomundo. She does so, so that she can protect her friends. And we later learn, during the Huekomundo portion of this story, that Orihime was devising for a way to disrupt Aizen's plans with her abilities. She had wanted to destroy the Hokyoku with her powers. This is important to mention, because it's a distinction between the way that Rukia was taken to the Soul Society, and the way that Orihime had chosen to go to Huekomundo. Rukia had no choice, while Orihime had made the decision to go there. But again, I'll talk more about the differences between the Huekomundo arc and the Soul Society arc in the next video of my Bleach review series. But for now, Orihime leaving for Huekomundo is interpreted by Head Captain Yamamoto as her betrayal. He forbids Ichigo from going to Huekomundo to rescue her. But of course, Ichigo disobeys these orders, because after all, his priority is to protect his friends. He seeks help from Urahara, who is more than willing to open up a Garganta for him to enter into Huekomundo. While at Urahara's shop, he meets Chad and Uryu, who prove that they too have been training and are strong enough to assist Ichigo, with Chad having learned a new ability called El Directo, and with Uryu not only having regained his Quincy powers, but he has also learned several new abilities from his father. So with the three of them ready, Urahara opens up the Garganta, and they enter into Huekomundo, thus concluding the Aranka invasion of Karakura Town, and taking us into the Huekomundo portion of this story. So one of the important things that I want to speak about is Ichigo's frame of mind during these chapters of the story. The Aranka arc features Ichigo at his most vulnerable, and it's a stark contrast to his attitude during the Soul Society arc. And I believe that this shift in his character that occurs is too jarring for a lot of people to accept. But try to imagine how Ichigo is feeling. His mother had been killed by a hollow, so initially his fear of hollows had developed into resentment. He hates hollows because his mother was killed by a hollow. This is why he rejects assistance from his inner hollow at every occasion. It isn't until he starts to train with the Vizards that he begins to utilize the powers of his inner hollow. But even at this point, he hasn't accepted this part of himself. Quite simply, at this point in the story, Ichigo hates the hollow nature of his abilities, and gradually with time, he comes to learn that he is unable to subdue his inner hollow. He is fearful that it's going to take over him. And what are the consequences of this? The ultimate consequence of his inner hollow taking over is that his friends and family will be hurt. This fear proves to be true when Ichigo transforms into that vast Olore form, and he ends up impaling Uryu during the fake Karakura Town arc. But that's something that we'll talk about later. The issue that Ichigo currently has with his inner hollow is that if it takes over, then he will be unable to protect his loved ones, or he will have difficulty doing so. His inner hollow attempts to manifest during his battle against Yami. This ends up distracting him, which results in him being unable to protect Orihime. His subsequent fear of his inner hollow results in him not being able to properly battle against Grimjao, which leads to Rukia being injured by Grimjao. This ends up being the breaking point, which leads the stubborn Ichigo to eventually accept the help of the Vizards. At the start, when Shinji had offered help to Ichigo, he had adamantly stated that he isn't one of them. He identified himself as a Shinigami, completely rejecting an integral part of Ichigo's inner powers. And if you've read the entirety of the Bleach story, then you're going to be aware of how integral his inner hollow is to his abilities. Without being 
be able to accept this part of himself, Ichigo will not be able to grow stronger, and thus keep up with the ever-increasing threat that is being presented to him. This external conflict is of course Aizen's army of Aranka. Why is it that I love this portion of the story so much? It's because Ichigo doesn't have a single victory in this arc, aside from his victory over his inner hollow where he enters his inner world. He is able to subdue his inner hollow, and is thus able to momentarily prove that he is the king, while hollow Ichigo is the horse that answers to him. This is excellent character writing, and it plays on the idea of the self versus the self. When he is distressed, Ichigo is the type of character to turn inward. He pushes away his loved ones. He has that fake smile. The concern that he feels is written on his face. His behaviour becomes more colder as his loved ones realise that he is distancing himself from them. This is all because Ichigo is afraid of his inner hollow, but in order for him to once again protect his loved ones, he has to control his inner hollow, and it is thanks to the introduction of a new character, Shinji Hirako and his group called the Vizards, that Ichigo is able to do so. It is Shinji who is the first person who directly tells Ichigo what is wrong with him, and what the consequences are if Ichigo doesn't do anything about it. He warns him that if Ichigo remains as a Shinigami, he will eventually be swallowed up by the hollow, he will lose his mind, and after this he will destroy everything, his friendships, his future, and eventually himself. Behind Shinji's strange and erratic outward appearance, he's a very serious and down to earth character. He was persistent with his motive to recruit Ichigo into the Vizards. What you have to remember is Shinji and the others are getting nothing out of helping Ichigo. It is just they have come across somebody who is similar to themselves and is struggling. So out of the goodness of their heart, they want to help Ichigo, for after all, he too was a victim of Aizen's experiments, just like the Vizards were. We'll understand more about this during the Thousand Year Blood War arc, as we learn about the past of Ichigo's mother, and how she was attacked by the Hollow White, and how that incident led to the birth of Ichigo's inner hollow, which is now causing him so much trouble during this arc. While Ichigo is learning to manifest his hollow mask for a longer period of time, he senses that Grimjah's spiritual pressure has returned in Karakura Town. He has no choice but to let Ichigo go, despite knowing that he isn't ready to face off against an Espada. Thankfully Shinji had followed him and he ends up saving both Rukia and Ichigo from Grimjow, and we finally get to see this mysterious Vizard face off against my favourite newly introduced antagonist within this story. I am of course referring to Grimjow, who in some ways inherits Renji's role from the prior story arc as Ichigo's rival, and in addition to this Grimjow has a very wild and rebellious personality, which is slightly similar to Renji's. The only difference being is that Grimjow has no self restraint, while Renji could be reasoned with, the 6th Espada doesn't share in this personality trait. During Shinji's battle with Grimjow, we get to see how powerful Shinji really is, as Grimjow is pushed to the point where he is about to release his Zanbakdo, until he is stopped by Ukiara and taken back to Huekomundo. Despite the fact that Grimjow had the upper hand against Ichigo, when he returns to Huekomundo, he is very much the underdog of that area. In some ways, he is fighting to prove himself, and this should be evident from the second invasion of the Aranka, which Grimjow had led without the permission of Aizen. This is because Grimjow Grimjow desires to prove his strength, and he does so by destroying anybody who dares to get in his way. I love Grimjow because he is a well written character, one that Kubo has fleshed out and continues to add to him through the Huekomundo portion of the story, where we learn about Grimjow's backstory. But for now, during the Arankar invasion, it is evident that Grimjow has a superiority complex. He believes that he is better than everybody, aside from one person, which is of course Aizen. When Ichigo's character is really down and out, Grimjow's character appears to push him even further into despair. By attacking Rukia and then mercilessly beating him down, it solidifies the role of a rival that Grimjow plays within the story. His first battle against Ichigo leaves us with a lasting impression, and from here on out, Grimjow becomes a memorable character, one that we really cannot wait to see again. At least that was the case for me. Grimjow eventually ends up holding a grudge against Ichigo after their first battle, because Ichigo was able to successfully land a Getsuka Tensho against him, which ends up scarring Grimjow. This scar serves to permanently remind Grimjow of the individual who would dare to challenge him. It is safe to say that a lot of us fell in love with Grimjow's character after seeing the anime adaptation of their first fight, where he repeatedly punches Ichigo in the face while sadistically laughing. This lack of self restraint is unlike anything that we have seen within the story so far. At least when Ichigo and the others went to the Soul Society, they had some self restraint. The new adversaries that Ichigo and company are going to be facing off against cannot be reasoned with. In some way, they are facing off against wild animals, individuals who have no idea or sense of right and wrong. Each of the around cars have a unique way of expressing the worst of humanity, whether if this is Grimjow feeling too full of himself, or Yami brutally hurting those weaker than him, and my favourite which is Ukiara's nihilistic apathy. Just like the way that Kubo had introduced us to the Gotei 13 during the Soul Society arc, I believe that he has done it again through the introduction of the Espada during the Aranka arc. Each of the Espada have their unique appearances, for example
example, a light Grimjaw's blue hair, which is an inversion of the color orange, visually symbolizing that he is Ichigo's rival here and his polar opposite during this story arc. Or how Ukiyoro has a hole within his chest to symbolize his heartlessness and his inability to relate to those who have a heart. And after Ichigo and the others go to Huekomundo, we get to see the other Espada, and they are equally as unique as the Espada that we see during the Iranka invasion. Another memorable character who leaves a powerful impression on me after reading this portion of the story is the character of Ukiyora. Now when he first arrives with Yami, he doesn't really do anything, but what he does do is comment on Yami's battle against Ichigo and his subsequent brief altercation with Yoriichi and Urahara. Through these comments that he makes, we understand that he is a very powerful individual and someone not to be underestimated. It's the subtlety of the way that his character is written that pulls us in and fascinates us. Aside from having a very cool and unique character design, he leaves us with a lasting impression when he defends Yami against a blast that Urahara fires towards him. We quickly begin to understand the hierarchy of the Espada, as we learn that Ukiyara is more powerful than Yami, as he is able to bring the large Espada down to one knee when he scolds him and swiftly strikes him on his stomach. Ukiyara proves himself through the story as one of Aizen's most loyal subjects. While following Aizen's orders to the T, sometimes his curiosity does get the better of him, as he is intrigued by the differing beliefs and opinions of others. I'll talk more about this in the next two videos that I cover of the Aranka arc, where Ukiyara ends up coming face to face with Orihime's belief in the heart, and his nihilism ends up facing off against Ichigo's courage. When Ukiyara confronts Orihime and follows out Aizen's orders, he gives her no choice. He is accurate and precise with his words. He tells her not to waver in the slightest and to do exactly as she is told, otherwise the lives of her friends will be on the line. And of course, Orihime will do anything to protect her friends, and by doing so, she willingly goes to Huekomundo. At the onset of this arc, when Orihime had first encountered Yami and Ukiyara, she had stood up against them because she thought to herself that she was always relying on Ichigo, and she doesn't want to cause Ichigo any more trouble. She is aware that Ichigo is being troubled by something, but she doesn't know what it is. So in order for him to have some peace of mind, Orihime will shoulder the burden. She will do what she can by facing off against Yami and Ukiyara so that Ichigo doesn't have to. Despite her attempt being futile and Ichigo eventually arriving to protect her, her insight into the difference that she feels in Ichigo's Reiatsu highlights to us the connection that these two characters have. Orihime is so in tune with Ichigo's spiritual pressure that she can sense the slightest disturbance in it. She describes this spiritual pressure as being different to what it was in the Soul Society arc. The Ichigo that has appeared to protect her from Yami and Ukiyara has a spiritual pressure that is intense and rough. It is so dense and heavy that it is suffocating her. She feels like that the individual standing before her is a completely different Ichigo, and this change in his spiritual pressure that is so poetically described by Orihime is a result of the suffering that Ichigo must be going through that he isn't telling anybody about. During the Iranka invasion, the characters of Orihime and Chad are made to feel useless, like they are being pushed to the wayside. But despite this, they try to be proactive. Chad does so by enlisting the help of Urahara and thus beginning his training with Renji, while Orihime does so by expressing her frustration to Rangiku that she wasn't able to cheer Ichigo up while Rukia did so effortlessly. Orihime admits here that she is jealous of Rukia, but she is reassured by Rangiku and she proves that she isn't a petty character and she doesn't hold anything against Rukia, because later on Rukia consoles her after Urahara tells her not to get involved with the battle against Aizen and Izaranka. Rukia is there to comfort her and she even takes Orihime to the Soul Society where they train for an entire month. When the Aranka invade Karakura Town for the third time, Orihime rushes back from the Soul Society to help her friends. That is until she encounters Ukiara and she is forced to help her friends in more of an indirect manner by making the ultimate sacrifice and going to Huekomundo in order to ensure their safety. He literally tells her that he is going to kill Ichigo and the others. We know that this is possible because Ukiyora has demonstrated his incredible power already. Aizen desires Orihime's abilities, and it is for this reason that Ukiyora has been tasked to bring Orihime unharmed. Orihime is given 12 hours to say goodbye to one person, and she is given a bracelet to wear that will conceal her spiritual pressure so that it doesn't alert the individual that she is seeing of her presence. Now the moment that I have chosen to speak about and last is the most memorable from this section of the story, and it is of course Orihime saying goodbye to Ichigo. It is here where she finally confesses her feelings for him. Typically, Kubo relies on visually conveying his story to us through the technique of show don't tell, and he does so briefly by showing Orihime almost kiss Ichigo, but he then has her speak and cut to the chase, as Kubo directly tells us that she is in love with Ichigo, and he emphasizes this by her saying that if she were to have lived five different lifetimes, then she would have fallen in love with the same person. With Kubo being so direct in his story, it is still hard for me to believe that people didn't see Orihime and Ichigo as a pairing sooner. I mean, was it really that much of a surprise to you that after 400 chapters from this scene, the two of them ended up together?
other. I just want to say I love the way that this was executed and it is once again another memorable scene in a section of the story that already has so many memorable moments from the introduction of characters like Ukiora and Grimjow as well as the introduction of Shinji and the Vizards in addition to Ichigo's inner hollow delivering the iconic speech about the king and the horse and who can forget when Urahara arrives to protect the lieutenants when they're being attacked by Wonderwise. After rereading this portion of the story and analysing the events that occur I still firmly believe that the Arankha invasion is one of my favourite sections of the Bleach story and I'm not just saying this because of nostalgia. This section of the story holds up to the test of time. Unlike with every time that I reread the Bleach story there is something new that I learn. So to wrap up with the video now that we have covered the first portion of the Arankha arc in the next video we will continue my review of Bleach by discussing the events that unfold within Hueco Mundo. This is of course during Ichigo's invasion of this new unexplored realm. This portion of the story is heavily criticised by fans because it feels very similar to the Soul Society arc. So in the fifth video of my Bleach review series we will once and for all prove why the Hueco Mundo arc is not just Kubo lazily reusing ideas but instead Kubo cleverly mirroring his past work in order to tell us a new and unique story that has plenty of nuance for us to really dig into. So if you really think that the Hueco Mundo section of the Arankha arc is some of Kubo's weaker writing then you are definitely going to want to check out my next video in this series. In this video we are going to be talking about the Hueco Mundo portion of the Arankha arc. This section of the story is very battle heavy as we have multiple battles taking place between Ichigo and his friends versus the Arankars and later they are assisted by the arrival of captains from the Gote 13 as they end up facing off against the Espada. Some notable battles that I'm really looking forward to breaking down include Aaron Yaro versus Rukia as well as Mairi versus Xyloporo and how can I forget the final battle between Ichigo and Grimjow. There is a lot to speak about including Orihime's feelings during this portion of the story and how her fear of Ichigo's hollow mask had been holding him back during his battle against Grimjow. You also have Grimjow as a character who has a deep rooted superiority complex while at the same time having a desire to prove himself. We see the lengths that he goes through in order to accomplish this desire through his behaviour towards Ichigo his opponent going as far as to heal him and even fend off his fellow Espada Ukiora just so that he could battle Ichigo once more and of course Ichigo's intentions for coming to Hueco Mundo according to question whether if he was truly there to protect his friend Orihime or if he had come to the world of the Arankas driven by his instinctual desire for battle now that he has gained control over his hollow mask is the influence of his inner hollow impairing Ichigo's judgement this is something that Orihime ends up questioning after witnessing how much Ichigo was enjoying battling against Grimjow. So let's save some of this discussion for the actual video and begin my analysis of the Hueco Mundo arc. So the Hueco Mundo portion of the Arankha arc takes place between chapters 241 to 315 and in the anime it is adapted between episodes 143 to 203. However during this span of episodes there is about 25 episodes of filler which include the Captain Shusuke Amagai filler. So excluding these filler episodes the 75 chapters we're talking about here are adapted into 36 episodes. So diving straight into the material upon arriving in Hueco Mundo Ichigo Chad and Uryu must fight their way to the surface of Hueco Mundo. Before too long they encounter the childlike Aranka Nell who ends up guiding Ichigo and the others towards the fortress of Los Noches and when they end up encountering a giant Aranka made up of sand it is at this point that Rukia and Renji join Ichigo's party as Rukia uses the speciality of a Zambakdo in order to freeze the Aranka that is made up of sand. Upon arriving into Los Noches they split up at the forked path as Ichigo is the first to encounter an enemy within the fortress as he faces off against the Prevarone former Espada Dordoni. Initially losing to Dordoni because of Ichigo's persistence to not use his Bankai so early on, he is eventually forced to use his Bankai after Dordoni continually persists for him to use it. After activating his Hollow Mask, he is easily able to take down his opponent. This battle served to teach Ichigo that the opponents that he will be facing off against within Hueco Mundo are merciless, and Dordoni serves as a bridge of some sorts to cross over from his prior encounters to this new world. To his detriment, during this battle, Dordoni 
Tony behaved with a lot of honor. This is in stark contrast to the behavior that we've seen from Arankars like Ukiara, Grimjao, and even Yami. Uryu and Chad also find themselves facing off against Prevron Espada. Uryu is able to defeat Tsuruchi, and Chad is able to defeat Gantenvine. These battles reveal to us the fruits of their labor, as we understand the abilities that Uryu has acquired after regaining his Quincy powers, and we learn about the results of Chad's training with Renji, as he is now able to transform both of his arms, his right arm primarily being used for defense, and his left arm being used for attack. Chad's victory over the Prevron Espada is short-lived, as he ends up encountering the Espada Neutra, who takes him down with a single strike. Now this of course is very similar to the Soul Society arc, and this is what I meant by there being events that mirror each other between these two arcs, as they serve to show the contrasting nature between Hueco Mundo and the Soul Society. When Chad had been taken down by Shun Sui, it was after a display of sympathy from Shun Sui, who had just told Chad to give up. After warning him several times, it was only after Chad was persistent that Shun Sui had taken him down. Whereas contrastingly, Neutra is ruthless and without mercy takes down Chad. I just wanted to highlight this one mirror event because later on in the video, I'm going to be talking about the purposeful parallels that exist between the Hueco Mundo arc and the Soul Society arc. But continuing on with the story, Renji ends up encountering the Espada Xyloparo, and after failing to utilize his Bankai against him, he is accompanied by Uryu, but even his abilities are rendered useless against the Espada. Despite the two of them working together, they are unable to turn the tide of the battle. Meanwhile, Rukia encounters the Espada Aranyero, who after removing his mask reveals his true identity as Rukia's former lieutenant, Kain Shiba. She had initially believed that the Espada was the real Kain Shiba, but after she exposes him to be an imposter, Rukia battles the Espada as she attempts to restore the honor of her late lieutenant, whose body is being controlled by the Espada. When Rukia is overwhelmed and she ends up being impaled through the stomach, she utilizes her Zanpakdo's third dance in order to impale Aranyero through his skull as she defeats the Espada. Understandably, Rukia was very emotionally invested in the outcome of this battle. We had known about her history with Kain Shiba from the Soul Society arc. The impact is so much that Rukia loses the will to actually swing her Zanpakdo, and this is what results in Aranyero taking the upper hand. During this time, she thinks back to her first day of training with Kain. Having a lack of self-confidence and feeling inadequate, she had asked Kain whether if she deserves to be within the Gotei 13. She questions her purpose, whether if she is actually following her heart's desire. In this instance, Kain ends up reassuring her, as he tells her that the purpose of the heart is to fight and to protect. There are two battles that Shinigami partake in, the first being the battle to protect the weak, and while the second is a battle to protect honor. Through the story of Bleach, we've had several examples of such battles, with an example of a battle to protect others being Ichigo protecting his sisters when the hollow Fishbone D had attacked, and an example of a battle to protect one's honor being Ichigo's encounter with the Grand Fisher. He concludes by telling Rukia that ultimately what we protect comes down to the heart. A heart is formed between people who grow close to one another, and when you die, that heart that was formed serves as a reminder for the people that you leave behind. And it is for this reason that Kain states that you shouldn't die alone, because you continue to live on within the hearts of the people that you leave behind. When Rukia realizes that she isn't facing off against the real Kain, and the heart of Kain lives on within her, she is able to defeat the Espada. After this battle, she is badly wounded. She desires to not die alone, as she remembers all of her friends and her family. She remains firm in her desire to save Orihime, because like her, Rukia knows all too well what it feels like to be held in captivity. Like her friends, she tries to push forward to rescue Orihime, but she collapses. We then follow Ichigo as he journeys into Los Noches. It is here that he is confronted by Ukiora, who informs him of Rukia's death. An important aspect of Ichigo's character is highlighted here, as he tells Ukiora that he has no reason to fight against him, since Ukiora isn't responsible for hurting any of his friends. But when Ukiora reveals that he was responsible for bringing Orihime to Huekomundo, within a split second, Ichigo's desire to push forward is altered, as he immediately attacks Ukiora, as he continues to reveal to Ichigo that he had intended for Orihime to look like a traitor, by giving her the choice to leave for Huekomundo so that her friends will be spared from danger. When Ichigo utilizes his Bankai with his hollow mask and attempts to end this battle quickly, he realizes that he is no match for Ukiora, because even after launching his most powerful attack towards him, Ukiora appears to be unfazed. When Ukiora reveals that he is the fourth ranked Espada, he impales Ichigo through the 
chest with his hand. Appearing to have been killed, his lifeless body is brought to Orihime. He demands that she heals him so that Grimjao can kill Ichigo with his own hands. He is so desperate to face off against Ichigo that he even challenges Ukiyora through utilizing a device called a Kaja Negashion. He traps Ukiyora in an alternate dimension for a few hours, which gives him enough time to face off against Ichigo in their final battle. He wants Ichigo to be healed completely so that they can have a fair battle. When Orihime is reluctant to heal Ichigo, especially if he is only going to be killed by Grimjao, Ichigo reassures her as he honors Grimjao's request and even asks for Orihime to heal Grimjao so that he too will be fighting in his best condition. And this of course is a continuation of the rivalry that was established during the Aranka invasion. At the onset of their battle, Grimjao calls into question Ichigo's reason for coming to Huekomundo. Did he really come to save Orihime or was that an excuse for his instinctual desire for battle? This is a very important point because it builds upon Orihime's doubts with Ichigo. While the two characters are facing off in their final battle, the emotional undertones of this fight are conveyed to us through Orihime, through what she feels about the power that Ichigo is utilizing in order to protect her. At this point actually, she doesn't even realize that Ichigo is protecting her. Her doubts lead her to believe that he is a monster who is driven by his desire for battle. While Ichigo's reason for fighting is questioned by his opponent and the one that he has come to rescue, on the other hand, Grimjao's reason and purpose is contrastingly well established here. He is battling purely out of instinct. He desires to be the last man standing, the victor, no matter the cost. Before the beginning of their battle, Ichigo had reassured Orihime that he was going to win, but she has difficulty accepting this because of her own powerlessness and her desire to fight alongside Ichigo. But instead, once again, she is seeing the back of him as he rushes off without her. The last time that they were on the battlefield together, when Ichigo had arrived to protect her against Yami and Ukiyora, she unfortunately had served as a distraction for Ichigo, and this wasn't her fault. It was because of Ichigo's stubborn belief that he has to shoulder the burden of protecting everybody around him. He doesn't even trust his friends to fight alongside him or believe that they are strong enough to face off against the enemy. And it is for this reason that time and time again he leaves behind Orihime, who wants nothing more than to fight alongside him and to protect him, to use her shields to defend against any attack, and to use her abilities to heal any wounds that Ichigo may sustain. There are several examples of Ichigo underestimating his friends. We've just spoken about how he does this with Orihime. During the Aranka invasion arc, he also does this with Chad. And just before coming to Huekomundo, he doesn't have belief that Chad and Uryu are strong enough to accompany him, but they end up convincing him to trust in them too, that they too have trained and worked hard and care enough for Orihime to fight to protect her. At the start of Ichigo's battle against Grimjao, Nell expresses that she is scared and nervous because she is worried about Ichigo, but Orihime reassures her that Ichigo had said that he was definitely going to win. She reveals how well she knows Ichigo by describing him as a gentle person, and when he uses strong words with conviction, it is like he is making a vow to himself. Orihime's words help Nell to continue to have belief in Ichigo, as Orihime reluctantly tells her that they have to wait and believe. And now what you have to notice here is that Kubo draws Orihime with her hands clenched and trembling. It is like she is holding herself back again, almost in a way having difficulty believing what she has just said. She of course wants to help him, but is having difficulty with her feelings of powerlessness. When Ichigo activates his Bankai and dons his hollow mask, Orihime becomes fearful. It is difficult for her to conceal her feelings, and eventually Ichigo even notices. Even after Ichigo acknowledges her feelings and tries to reassure her, she cannot help but to feel afraid. At this point in the battle, Grimjao also activates his Resurrection, as their battle takes a seriously destructive turn. They both appear to be enjoying the battle, as they are evenly matched, with Ichigo having donned his hollow mask longer than he previously could. Despite his efforts, Orihime continues to be afraid. Not only is his appearance frightening her, she also notices the change in his personality, as his hollow mask brings out Ichigo's instinctual desire for battle. This battle instinct is animalistic. If you've seen my Soul Society world building video, then you'll know about how Kubo had incorporated the Buddhist concept of samsara into his story. When it comes to Huekomundo and its dwellers, I'd refer to them as hungry ghosts, as Huekomundo fits into the hungry ghost realm from the samsara cycle of reincarnation. So in order to battle and defeat these hungry beasts, Ichigo too must learn to tap into his animal instincts, and he does so through utilizing his hollow mask. But this proves too much for Orihime to accept. In particular, the change in Ichigo's eyes reminder of the eyes that she had seen when her own brother had been transformed into a hollow. The whites of Ichigo's eyes have now turned black, and she could no longer see herself reflected in those hollow eyes. When Ichigo protects Orihime from one of Grimjao's attacks, they have an opportunity to look into each other's eyes. Kubo does an excellent job of depicting Ichigo as a frightening monster, while it is evident that Orihime is shocked at what she sees. You can literally see the fear in her eyes. It is 
is evident that Ichigo is affected by Orihime's feelings here. Despite wearing that hollow mask, he is losing against Grimjow. And Nell even comments upon this. Why is it that he is getting beaten so badly despite wearing that hollow mask that had once made him invincible? It isn't until Nell pulls up Orihime on her feelings that Orihime begins to realize the reason behind why Ichigo is fighting. She backs up Ichigo by revealing that he had only attacked Ukiara once he had heard Orihime's name, going on to describe Ichigo as a human who has become a Shinigami. And in addition to this, he is wearing that hollow mask and he is utilizing an incredible amount of power. It is evident that this is hurting him. You can see that he is in pain. And who is he doing all of this for? Nell tells Orihime that he is fighting for her. He is risking his life using that power and getting covered in blood for the sake of Orihime. So if Orihime won't cheer Ichigo on, then who else will? Orihime had initially gone to Huekomundo in order to protect her friends. But when she had learned that Ichigo had come to rescue her, she had felt joy. She was happy that he had come for her. But upon seeing him with that hollow mask, she started to feel conflicted. Whether if he really was here to rescue her, or was he here for the thrill of being challenged by a worthy adversary in battle. After Nell's encouragement, Orihime finds the strength to encourage Ichigo, as she yells out for him not to die. With tears flowing down her face, she tells Ichigo that he doesn't have to win. He doesn't even have to try his hardest. She just doesn't want Ichigo to get hurt anymore. It is through her words that Ichigo finds the strength to finally cut down and defeat Grimjow. At the end of their battle, Orihime is relieved to see that Ichigo has returned to normal. Their victory over Grimjow is short-lived, however, as Noitra arrives and severely wounds Grimjow. Ichigo begins to fight the Espada while Orihime is restrained by his Rashion Tesra. Ichigo is still injured from his battle against Grimjow, so he is easily being battered by Noitra. When Nell can no longer endure seeing Ichigo being beaten, she transforms into her adult form, and we get to learn about the troubled past between Noitra and Nell. But just as Nell releases her Zanpakuto and begins to overpower Noitra, she transforms back into a child form and ends up being easily defeated by the Espada. At this point in the story, all of the individuals who have gone to Huekomundo appear to be in a hopeless situation. Ichigo is about to be defeated by Noitra, Uryu and Renji stand no chance against Xyloporo, and Rukia is about to be killed by Zomari. The Soul Society intervene and send four captains of the Gote 13 to Huekomundo. Unahana arrives to heal any of the casualties, while Byakuya arrives to protect Rukia from Zomari. Mairi arrives to face off against Xyloporo, and Kimpachi arrives to fight against Noitra. The captains end up winning their respective battles against the various Espada. But just as the situation appears to settle down, the number one ranking Espada Stark appears and kidnaps Orihime, returning her to Aizen. It is at this point that Aizen reveals his true plan, stating that he had used Orihime to lure Ichigo and the others to Huekomundo in order to reduce the numbers of the Gotei 13, with four captains trapped within Huekomundo and the substitute Shinigami Ichigo also being stuck there. Aizen now departs for Karakura Town. However, the Gotei 13 had anticipated his invasion, and in order to face off against Aizen, they had replaced the real Karakura Town with a fake version in order to prevent Aizen from creating the Oken. So this now takes us to the end of chapter 315. Now at this point in the video, I want to discuss the parallels that exist between the Huekomundo arc and the Soul Society arc. I want to prove why these similarities are purposeful and why they were thought out by Kubo, and it wasn't him just recycling ideas out of laziness. So let's first talk about the differences between rescuing Orihime and rescuing Rukia. The entire Soul Society arc centers itself around the rescue of Rukia, whereas the rescue of Orihime is a side plot that occurs during the Huekomundo portion of the Aranka arc. Rukia was forcefully taken to the Soul Society. She wasn't given a choice like Orihime was. She had to face the consequences of her actions from this ancient ancient civilization that has well established law and order. So knowing this, we can establish that the Soul Society arc is about reasoning with your opponent, whereas the parallel mirror to this occurs during the Huekomundo arc, where Orihime is given a choice to leave for Huekomundo. She decides to leave with Ukiara in order to save her friends, and she is taken to a lawless world inhabited by the Aranka, individuals who have no sense of reason. During this rescue attempt, Ichigo won't be able to change their mind or alter their ideals by resolve alone, and this is what I meant earlier earlier during Ichigo's final battle with Grimjow, he had to find a way to become in tune with his battle instinct, that raw urge to not hold back and to utterly destroy your opponent. Ichigo had come to adopt this into his fighting style via his hollow mask, which contrastingly he had rejected during his battle against Byakuya. During the Soul Society arc, it was proven that Ichigo could have reasoned with Byakuya, and through his resolve, he ultimately ends up changing his mind. But this isn't the case in Huekomundo, so yet again, we have another mirror parallel comparison that we can make between these two story arcs. If you know anything about the Espada, then you'll know that they desire to know their purpose and their ideals. They are a group of lost individuals who are following 
Aizen to various degrees of loyalty. You have a character like Ukiara who is very loyal to Aizen, then you have individuals like Neutra and Grimjao who mostly act of their own accord. But as you know, when it comes to the Soul Society, this is far from being the case. The ideals and purpose of each of the individuals within the Soul Society are well established. Saving Rukia was the main objective of the Soul Society arc, whereas saving Orihime is one part of a larger objective, which is to defeat Aizen. The goal during the Aranka arc is to prevent Aizen from creating the Oken and to stop him from overthrowing the Soul King. The stakes are far more grandiose than just saving one individual. The Aranka arc has Ichigo and the others save reality as a whole. To further emphasize these points, Ichigo fights with resolve during the Soul Society arc and he fights with instinct in Hueco Mundo. When Ichigo arrives to save Orihime and he wears the hollow mask, it frightens her. And this is in contrast to the reaction that Rukia has upon seeing Ichigo rescue her. Rukia was relieved while Orihime was afraid, another purposeful parallel that exists. While the plot structure between these two arcs may be similar, the execution of the plot points and the theme of the story are completely different between the two arcs. Orihime even questions the reason for Ichigo coming to Hueco Mundo. Was it ready to rescue her? While Rukia had no opportunity to doubt the reason behind Ichigo's actions during the Soul Society arc, in Hueco Mundo, Ichigo was being beaten by Grimjao until Orihime had encouraged him and had reaffirmed his reason and purpose for fighting. While during the Soul Society arc, Rukia who had accepted her fate was reassured to continue living by Ichigo. So let's now go into more examples of these parallels that exist between these two arcs. After being fired out of Kukakushiba's cannon during the Soul Society arc, Ichigo and the others are forcibly split up upon entering into the Serete. While during the Hueco Mundo arc, when they arrive within Lost Noches, they choose to split up at the Forked Path. They were forced to split up during the Soul Society arc because of the way that they had infiltrated into the Serete, while in Hueco Mundo, they split up out of choice. Another key parallel is Udyu's battle against Zai the Poro, which echoes his battle against Mai during the Soul Society arc. Within Hueco Mundo, Uryu is of course accompanied by Renji, but together they are unable to defeat the mad scientist of this arc. And so the mad scientist from the prior arc arrives and takes on the mad scientist of this arc. A very similar situation like this occurs between Ichigo and Noitra, which mirrors Ichigo's battle against Kimpachi. Now because of Ichigo's injuries, he is unable to defeat Noitra, but then the battle-hungry individual from the Soul Society arc faces off against the battle-hungry individual from this arc. Kimpachi versus Noitra is similar to Mayuri versus Xyloporo because the Shinigami are facing off against their Aranka equivalents. Let's now move on to the role that Yoriichi plays within the Soul Society arc in comparison to the role that Nell plays within the Hueco Mundo arc. These are two individuals who end up having a transformation of some sorts while also being an ally to Ichigo. These two individuals are also mirror images of each other. While Yoriichi had left her positions within the Soul Society out of choice, Nell Yell of course was ambushed by Noitra, thus resulting resulting in her being forced out of the Espada after her hollow mask was damaged and she had reverted back to a child form. There is a similarity between these two characters as they end up being the voice of reason within both of the arcs. Yoriichi stops Ichigo from recklessly pushing forward by advising him to take a step back and to begin training his Bankai, whereas Nell is the voice of reason towards Orihime as she convinces her to cheer for Ichigo, which results in Ichigo having the conviction to defeat Grimjao. Again, these are similar character types, but they have very different roles within the story. I believe this theory of parallels existing between these two arcs because there are so many of them. It is hard for me to believe that Kubo did not intentionally plan these through how both portions of these stories feature a rescue but the opponents are the opposites of each other, one being Shinigami and the other being Aranka. And similar to the captains and lieutenants of the Gotei 13, most of the Espada are very well written characters that Kubo has taken the time to flesh out, especially with the character designs of each of the Espada and the aspects of death that he ascribes to each one of the Espada that perfectly complement their personality. If you compare the appearance of Grimjao against Ukiara, you can tell that Kubo has conveyed Grimjao's rebellious nature through his uniform, the way that his sleeves are rolled up and his jacket is zipped open, as well as his wild and messy hair. And this is in contrast to the well-composed Ukiara, whose uniform looks far less disheveled. He has a quiet but yet menacing appearance. It is the way that he carries himself that leads us to believe that he is very powerful. He is observant and more reserved than Grimjao. And like I said, it's reflective reflected in his appearance. Speaking about Ukiara, there are some interesting exchanges that occur between his character and Orihime's. When he arrives to tell Orihime that her friends have arrived to rescue her, she appears surprised, but Ukiara tells her that they should hold no meaning to her anymore, because she is now one of them. Especially after having demonstrated her powers in front of Aizen by healing Grimjao's arm, she has demonstrated that she is useful to the Espada. When Chad is defeated by Noitra, Ukiara arrives to deliver the news to Orihime.
Orihime, stating that he has died. But Orihime remains adamant that he isn't dead. He tells the hopeful Orihime that her friend's efforts are meaningless, and they may as well be rushing to their slaughter. But Orihime demonstrates her bravery and her attachment to her friends by slapping Ukiyora across the face. Now all of these interactions that Ukiyora has with Orihime ultimately build up to his revelation that he has in the next portion of the story, but I'll be talking about that in the next video. So now we're going to be moving on to the third and final section of the Uranka arc, and in my next video I'll be speaking about the entirety of the fake Karakura Town segment of the story, including the long anticipated final battle between Ukiyora and Ichigo, as well as the various battles that occur within fake Karakura Town as the Gotei 13 face off against Aizen and his Arankas. The Fake Karakura Town arc is by far the longest and most battle intense segment of this story that we have yet to analyze. It follows the events immediately after Aizen leaves Huekom window for Karakura Town, and Ichigo begins his battle against Ukiora, leading us all the way up until Ichigo utilizing the final Gatsuka Tensho in order to defeat Aizen. So in this video I'll speak about the characters of Ukiora, Gin, Aizen, and several of the Espada, as well as discussing the key battles that take place involving all of them, and the growth that Ichigo undergoes during this story arc. So let's begin my analysis of the final part of the Arunka saga. This is my breakdown of the fake Karakura Town arc. The fake Karakura Town arc takes place between chapters 316 to 423 of the manga, spanning a total of 108 chapters. Now these manga chapters were adapted into 53 canon episodes of the anime, which take place between episodes 215 to 342 of the anime. Now at this point in the series, the Bleach anime had become notorious for taking breaks and going on filler before highly anticipated moments like Ichigo's final battle against Ukiora, and incidentally while adapting these one 108 manga chapters, we had two filler arcs within the anime. The first of which was the Zanbakdo Unknown Tales arc, and the second being the Gotei 13 Invading Army arc. This had added a total of 75 episodes of filler between the start and the end of the anime adaptation of the fake Karakura Town arc. So I'm going to begin the analysis by speaking about Ichigo's final battle against Ukiora, talking about how this battle has a lasting impact on the character of Ichigo, and how it affects him all the way up until his final battle against Aizen. During this battle, Ichigo has an involuntary transformation, where he transforms into this vast Olore form, where his inner hollow completely manifests on the outside, and targets anyone or anything that stands in his way. In this form, Ichigo had brutally beaten Ukiora, and yet even hurt one of his closest friends Uryu, which is a complete contradiction to the desires of Ichigo's character. This is somebody who wants to protect and defend his friends and family, but in this instance, his fear of his inner hollow that he had prior to training with the Vizards completely manifests. Here. He effectively dies and the instinctual beast that lives within him takes over. This occurs because Ichigo had broken the agreement that he had made with his inner hollow during their last encounter. The king will only remain on top of the horse as long as he continues to prove that he has what it takes to hold on to this position. Despite demonstrating unwavering resolve, Ukiara was easily able to defeat Ichigo. After firing a Saro at point blank range through Ichigo's chest, he effectively kills him in this moment, leaving his inner hollow with no choice but to manifest when Orihime pleads for Ichigo to protect her. Now through the character of Ukiara, the theme of the heart is expanded upon, as we were previously introduced to it through the bond that Kain and Rukia had shared with each other, and how Kain had explained to Rukia that when an individual dies, their heart continues to live on in the memories that they had shared with their loved ones. But through the character of Ukiara, we are introduced to a nihilistic, apathetic individual. He knows nothing about the metaphysical concept of the heart, as he tries to relate it to tangibility. In chapter 317, he questions Orihime whether if the heart can be found by tearing a chest apart or by smashing a skull open. Being a very practical individual, he believes that if it cannot be seen by his own eyes then it doesn't exist. He continues to learn more about the heart and what it means to have persistence in the face of despair during his battle against Ichigo. Emptiness was the aspect of death that Kubo had attached to the character of Ukiara. Aizen had saved Ukiara from a lonely existence when he had transformed him by using the Hokyoku. It is difficult for him to relate to Ichigo and company wanting to save Orihime from the loneliness of captivity. Effectively, Ukiara was born in isolation, and this involuntary solitude had formed his character into this nihilistic being, an individual
individual who knows nothing about the bonds that form between people or the persistence that manifests through one's resolve. These examples are reliant upon an individual having belief in their heart, something that Ukiara knows nothing about, hence why he has difficulty relating to Orihime and Ichigo. His heart is literally empty. Ukiara's beliefs in fate and despair cause him to clash with Ichigo. It is actually through these beliefs that we can conclude that Ukiara is a nihilist. Ichigo refuses to accept that Ukiara is stronger than him, when it is evident that he is. As somebody who sees the world in black and white, he is confused as to why Ichigo constantly rejects fate. Fate has determined Ukiara to be stronger. So why is it that Ichigo is facing off against Ukiara, believing that he can win by some sort of miracle? As an individual, Ichigo always challenges fate throughout the story, and this is because of his inner resolve that he has. We had seen this during the Soul Society arc, and it is once again demonstrated here during his final battle against Ukiara. Ukiara intends to teach Ichigo a lesson by instilling despair into his character. We know throughout the Aranka saga, Ichigo has had difficulty holding on to his resolve, as he has been battling with despair. This despair arises from the fear that his inner hollow is going to take over. Consequently, he won't have control over his powers, and he won't be able to protect his loved ones. The worst case scenario is that he may even endanger his loved ones if his inner hollow manifests and loses control like he had done during his battle against Byakuya. The Vastal Lore transformation brings new life to Ichigo's fears, and as I stated, these impact him throughout the duration of this story arc. It was thanks to this transformation that Ichigo was able to easily defeat Ukiara, but at the same time he had inflicted a fatal wound on Uryu which had almost killed him. When Ichigo returns to normal, he is shocked and surprised to learn that he was responsible for all of the damage inflicted upon the surroundings, and he was responsible for hurting Uryu. After realizing that he had gained the upper hand against Ukiara in an unfair manner, he desires to end their battle on equal terms. He separates his own actions from the actions of the Vastal Lore form. He further emphasizes his humanity by not unfairly cutting down Ukiara, who was already at the brink of death. At the end of their battle, Ukiara succumbs to his injuries, as his body begins to fade into dust, and in his final moments he tragically learns what it means to have a heart as he forms a lasting connection with Orihime. He reaches his hand out for her and asks her if she is afraid of him, to which Orihime replies that she isn't. She too extends a hand out for Ukiara, but before their hands can touch, the number 4 Espada poetically fades away. We truly appreciate the theme of the heart that Kubo implements into the story after the defeat of Ukiara. It adds upon the themes of the Soul Society arc, as Rukia had left a lasting impression upon Ichigo and the others. Her heart was shared with them, that's why they had enough fond memories of her and were willing to risk their lives in order to rescue her. Within the Huekomundo arc, this was further added upon through the bond between Rukia and Kayan, and now we have a poetic conclusion of this story theme through the defeat of Ukiara, a character who we had assumed was irredeemable, who would never understand what it means to have a heart. His death becomes even more tragic when we see him realize that he had formed his first connection with Orihime, as her outstretched hand had symbolized that he had left a piece of his heart within her. Now moving on from the battle between Ichigo and Ukiara, in chapter 380, Byakya and Kimpachi arrive to assist Ichigo in his battle against Yami. It is during this moment one of my favorite scenes within the entire story occurs, and it is when Byakya reminds Ichigo of his duty. Former enemy now turned ally perfectly encourages Ichigo here. This exchange makes you appreciate the subtlety of Kubo's writing, as the main antagonist of the last arc encourages our hero, reminding him of what he must do. He states that there is nothing for him to do here within Hueco Mundo, and that he needs to return to the human world. Well, yes, if he does stay, he'll help Byakya and Kimpachi to take down Yami, but Byakya perfectly states that the captains of the Gotei 13 do not require the assistance of Ichigo. It is at this point that he asks Ichigo what is his duty. He tells him that his duty is to protect Karakura Town. This is more than just the small circle of people that Ichigo wants to protect. As his power has increased, so has his responsibility. He loves and cherishes his life within the real world, but Aizen seeks to threaten not only Karakura Town but all of existence with his plans. So it is up to Ichigo to utilize his powers in order to fulfill his duty. But frankly, I love comparing this instance to its mirror parallel that occurs during the first half of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, but we'll talk about that later on. We now turn our attention over to the various battles that take place between the Shinigami and the Arankas within the titular fake Karakura Town. So after Aizen arrives within the world of the living, it is revealed that the real Karakura Town is currently within the Soul Society, and right now they are in a fake or replica version of the town. This does not deter Aizen's plans in the slightest, as he decides to defeat the Gotei 13 right here and now, and later on go to the Soul Society in order to create the Oken. At this point, the head captain traps Aizen, Gin, and Tozen within a wall of fire 
player called Jogaku Enjo. This will give enough time for the Shinigami to take out the Espada without worrying about any interruptions from Aizen and company. So among the several battles that occur within this portion of the story, the first that I want to talk about is the encounter between Haribel and Hitsugaya. Tia Haribel possesses the ability to manipulate water with her Zonpakuto. When Haribel releases her Zonpakuto, her appearance changes similarly to the other resurrections that we had seen up until this point. She is now able to create water from the gill markings of her Zonpakuto. During this battle, we learn about some incredible abilities that are possessed by both Hitsugaya and Haribel, and it's a fascinating exchange between two highly skilled fighters. Haribel prevents Hitsugaya from creating ice from the surrounding water with her own ability boiling ocean steam. When Hitsugaya reveals to the Espada that his Zanpakuto is the ultimate ice type, and that he can even control the moisture within the clouds. She begins to gaze up into the sky with shock as the clouds begin to quickly darken. Before encasing her in ice, he apologizes to her that he had stopped her from avenging her underlings, who had been defeated moments ago by head captain Yamamoto. Haribel ends up being broken out of this ice encasing upon the arrival of Wonderwise, whose high-pitched screaming had broken the ice that had encased her. At this point, she takes part in a three against one battle as she simultaneously fights not only only Hitsugaya, but the Vizards Lisa and Hiyori. Haribel does end up leaving the battle after Aizen becomes impatient and cuts her down. The next significant battle that involves an Espada is that of Barragan vs Siphon. And again, like all of the other battles against the Espada, it's one of my favourites within the Fate Karakura Town arc. There were several moments during this battle where I was convinced that Siphon was going to lose, and that Barragan had bested her. The stakes were incredibly high, especially with Barragan's abilities. But after the Vizards arrive, Siphon is assisted by Hachi, and the two of them are successfully able to take out Barragan. But before he is defeated, he reveals the resentment that he has towards Aizen by launching his Zanpakuto towards him. We understand more about Barragan through his backstory, where we learn that he was forced to relinquish his title as the King of Hueco Mundo when Aizen and the others had left the Soul Society. Not only was Barragan second to Aizen, he had also humiliatingly placed him as the second ranking Espada under Kyoti Stark, further fanning the flames of resentment that Barragan felt towards Aizen. This story arc really made you sympathize with the villains and begin to understand the plights of the Espada. We had spoken about Ukiora's aspect of death which was emptiness and Haribel's aspect of death which was sacrifice. When it comes to Barragan, Kubo had given the term senescence as his aspect of death, which means old age or the deterioration of living matter, which perfectly complements his abilities as well as his physical appearance especially within his resurrection form. Despite Barragan possessing a power that represents the absolute truth that every soul will experience death. Ironically, Barragan was nothing more than a fearful creature who too had an immense fear of death. He had done everything in his power to drive away his old age, but in an ironic turn of events, it was his own ability of decaying biological matter that had taken his life. There are a few ironies that exist within the character of Barragan. He had referred to himself as a king, but he had been dethroned from his position by Aizen. He had the ability to drain away life from biological matter, while at the same time, he too was withered and frail. Out of all of the individuals that we see him encounter, Barragan was the closest to death and in actual fact, the one who is the most afraid of it. This excellent character writing, which is all too often overlooked, does not just stop here. Kubo, with the same amount of detail, expands upon the aspect of death of Kyoti Stark during his battle against Shunsui and Ukitake. We learn about the tragic, lonely past of the number one Espada. Shunsui and Stark are very similar characters, not only in appearance, but in their personality personality also. When their battle gets serious, Stark activates his resurrection in an attempt to goad Shunsui into activating his own Bankai, but unfortunately Ukitake ends up talking Shunsui out of it, stating that he shouldn't utilize it in an area where everybody can see it. From these remarks, we can logically deduce that Shunsui's Bankai must affect the surrounding environment. During this fight, Shunsui utilizes a lot of underhanded tactics, like attacking Stark from behind or when he is in the middle of a conversation. After he is defeated by Shunsui, we get a flash flashback where we learn more about Stark's past. He says to himself that he is alone. We learn that Stark had begun to envy the weak. Prior to meeting Aizen, Stark was so powerful that his spiritual pressure had diminished the souls of his comrades. He had nobody around him. He had envied the weak and in his current position, he stands on top as the best with nobody beside him. Because of his loneliness, he had divided his soul into two parts. We learn that this was the birth of his partner Lilinette. He remarks to himself that the weak are able to gather into large packs in order to become stronger 
as a group, Stark wanted to be weak so that he could make friends with individuals who are just as strong as he is. Stark had joined Aizen after being approached by him. He was impressed that Aizen was able to stay around Stark without being killed. He ended up accepting Aizen's outstretched hand and had temporarily alleviated himself from loneliness. And in his dying moments, he realizes that he wasn't alone. After Aizen had taken him in, he had become a part of a group, and that group we have come to know as the Espada. One of the key battles that occurs during the fake Karakura Town arc is the fight between Komamura and Tozen. Of course, Tozen was among the defectors of the Soul Society, and he was also a close friend of Komamura, so his betrayal was unexpected and had caught Komamura off guard, as he assumes that Tozen's actions are contradictory to his moral beliefs, and to the way that he had portrayed himself to his friend. You can see the disappointment that he has in Tozen when he tells him that he had never thought he would be protecting somebody from Tozen Zanbakdo. He was clearly under the impression that they would be lifelong allies. His disappointment in his former comrade is amplified when Tozen reveals that he has been given a power that is beyond Bankai. Aizen had gifted him with this incredible power. Komamura shockingly realizes what Tozen has done. The former captain of the 9th division reveals that he has become holified. In the eyes of Komamura, he has forsaken all of his humanity in the pursuit of more power. In every sense of the word, Tozen has given up on his prior life. Komamura had a firm belief in his friend and he hadn't expected these actions from Tozen. But Tozen had known all too well that one day he would be crossing blades with Komamura. Tozen immediately cuts down his former lieutenant Shuhei Hisagi. When Komamura retaliates, his attack is blocked by Tozen, and it is at this moment that he realizes just how powerful Tozen has become now that he has been holified. The issue that characters like Komamura and Hisagi have with Tozen is that he had strayed away from the righteous path. His warped ideals and beliefs about justice have led him to such lows that he has forsaken his humanity, discarded all of his bonds with his loved ones. And if you ask Komamura, Tozen has defiled the memory of his late friend that he had sworn to fight in the name of justice for. Komamura tells Tozen that he is depraved for betraying all of his friends and his allies and even his subordinates, for turning his back on the Soul Society in an attempt to gain more power. When Tozen proves through his actions that he is irredeemable, Komamura activates his Bankai as their battle begins. We are aware that Tozen's late friend had been killed by the Shinigami of the Soul Society, and Komamura had misunderstood Tozen's beliefs about justice. He had thought that Tozen would have joined the Gotei 13 in order to carry on the ideals of his late friend, as she was an adamant believer of carrying out justice. But Tozen corrects Komamura and tells him that it is not justice to forgive those who had killed his friend, citing the actions of the Gotei 13 as unforgivable and as a motive for him to go against the Gotei 13. Tozen had always had a goal of revenge against the Gotei 13, but the friendships and bonds that he had formed within it, he describes them as vices, as things that were holding him back and distracting him from his goal. Despite everything that Tozen has done, Komamura states that his heart has already forgiven him, and that for now he is acting on behalf of the head captain, and he will take down Tozen for the sake of the Gotei 13. When Tozen activates his resurrection, he transforms into this moth-like creature, and he is finally able to see as he gazes upon Komamura for the first time, telling him that he is more hideous than he had imagined. The irony that Kubo employs in this moment is genius. Tozen has no idea of his own appearance, while he comfortably mocks the appearance of Komamura. We learn that Komamura had formed a friendship with Tozen, as he had realized that Tozen had no longer loved the world. Through their friendship, he had hoped to change his mind. When Tozen easily defeats the Bankai of Komamura and he is about to deliver the final blow, he is striked through the back of his head by his former lieutenant. After Tozen is defeated, Komamura has one request of him. He tells him not to sacrifice himself for the sake of revenge, because Komamura doesn't want to lose him the same way that Tozen had lost his friend. When it appears that Tozen has wavered in his beliefs and ideals of justice, Aizen strikes him, as he fulfills the agreement that the two of them had made. In the end, Tozen was the most loyal subject to Aizen. He had understood and supported Aizen's goals even more so than Gin Ichimaru, and he had even told Aizen that if at any moment his resolve wavers, then it is Aizen who should cut him down. And this is exactly what happens here. When Tozen wavers after Komamura's words, Aizen ends the life of his most loyal subordinate. Now the next significant counter is of course between Shinji and Aizen, as the former captain-lieutenant duo reunite for the first time in over 100 years. Their exchange begins by Shinji confirming his belief and trust that he has in Ichigo. He doesn't expect Aizen to know, since he is somebody who doesn't trust his underlings, and even goes out of his way to cut them down, like he had just done to Haribel. Aizen reveals his motive to Shinji, stating that his desire is to become a god that is superior 
to the Soul King. They have a fascinating, detailed discussion about trust. These two characters who share a history of not trusting one another. They speak about their own interpretations of trust and having faith in others. And understandably, Aizen's beliefs are very twisted, and we quickly understand that his beliefs are the core justification for his actions. Very quickly, their exchange escalates, as we learn that Shinji also has the ability to control an individual's senses, similar to Aizen's Kyokasugetsu. Upon activating the Shikai of his Zanbakdo, Shinji reveals that he has the ability to invert the senses of his opponent. After successfully landing an attack on Aizen, he realizes that Shinji's ability is no more than an optical illusion. Before their battle can continue further, Ichigo finally arrives on the battlefield. He had intended to take out Aizen with one final decisive attack, but it proves to be unsuccessful, and it is at this point that the members of the Gotei 13 and the Vizards appear before Ichigo and protect him from Aizen, as he had been taunting Ichigo and questioning his resolve. At this point, Ichigo is still shaken up by his vast Lode transformation, and incidentally, he is susceptible to Aizen's smooth talking. The Gotei 13 and the Vizards work together and face off against Aizen, as they all have a duty to save the world from Aizen's plans. There is no need for Ichigo to burden himself by shouldering the responsibility of defeating Aizen on his own. He has allies and he needs to rely upon them. When Aizen cuts down Hitsugaya, Soifon, Shunsui and Shinji, the head captain joins the battle. It is at this point that Aizen reveals his trump card, which of course was the Aranka Wonderwise. With Wonderwise in his resurrection form, Aizen reveals that Wonderwise exists for the sole purpose of extinguishing the flames of Ryujin Jaka, Yamamoto Zanpakdo. With all of the flames of Yamamoto Zanpakdo sealed within Wonderwise, when the Aranka finally self-destructs, the head captain takes the full force of the explosion in order to protect his underlings. It is at this moment that Aizen is caught off guard and cut by Ichigo while he is donning his hollow mask. After attacking him with a Getsuka Tensho, Aizen reveals that he has the Hokyoku implanted within his body and that he can heal himself. Now during this second exchange between Ichigo and Aizen, he tells the substitute Shinigami that he has known about him since the day that he was born and he is aware of all of the battles that he has taken part in up until this point. This is because he was responsible for all of them. Adding to this, he tells Ichigo that he was born special, as he was born as a human and a… but it is at this point that Aizen is interrupted by the appearance of Ishin. Ishin expects Ichigo to have a lot of questions for him, especially after seeing him in his Shinigami attire for the first time, but Ichigo maturely understands that there must have been a reason as to why Ishin hadn't told Ichigo that he was a Shinigami, and it is for this reason that he isn't going to press his father for answers. He will wait for the right time where his father will reveal to him the truth in the future. Personally, I love this because it's a throwback to those episodes where Ichigo fought against the Grand Fisher. More specifically, it was Rukia understanding that Ichigo did not want to reveal the circumstances behind the death of his mother, and that she will be patient until Ichigo feels it's the right time to tell her what had happened to his mother. After Aizen defeats Ishin Urahara and Yoriichi, he heads to the Soul Society with Gin, and this is where we'll turn our attention over to the character of Gin, going over the significant role that he plays within the story. As we finally learn the truth behind the mystery of his character, and how his entire story arc was building up until this point, where he reveals that he has been conspiring against Aizen out of vengeance for Aizen's Hokyoku experimentation, which had permanently affected the life of the one that Gin had fallen in love with, Rangiku Matsumoto. Gin's desire was to no longer see any tears on the face of Rangiku. He had wanted to get revenge for what Aizen had done to her when he had stolen an irreplaceable part of her soul, and so began his century-long plan, where he had stayed close to Aizen, gaining his trust, understanding the weakness of his Zanpakdo, so that he could decisively strike at the perfect moment when Aizen's guard is lowered in order to take him out. When Gin reminds Aizen of his true nature, that he is very similar to a snake, he catches him off guard and pierces him through his chest. We learn that the only way to escape the power of Kyokasui Getsu is to touch its blade when it is in its unreleased state. Gin had patiently waited decades in order to learn this weakness of Aizen's Zanpakdo, a blade that had assisted Aizen in effortlessly taking out the majority of the Gotei 13 and the Vizards. As smug as ever, even after being stabbed, Aizen states that he was expecting Gin to betray him. He was just curious as to how he would do so, and what I love here is how Gin follows up his betrayal by revealing the true ability of his own Zanpakdo, as he states that he had left a fragment of his blade within Aizen's body. This fragment has the ability to disintegrate cells, and Gin was careful to place this part of his blade within Aizen's heart. He believes that he has successfully taken down his former leader, especially after activating his Bankai and using his ability Kill Kamishini no Yari, which means God-Killing Spear, a fitting name to 
end the life of an individual who had attempted to become a god. Gin takes the Hokyoku from Aizen's body and flees. However, Aizen survives the attack shockingly. The Hokyoku ends up returning to Aizen after he reveals that it belongs to him. He has become a part of the Hokyoku whether if it is with him or not. After approaching Gin, he cuts him down in chapter 415, and the Hokyoku of course returns into the center of Aizen's chest. It is at this point in chapter 416 that Dangai Ichigo appears before Aizen. Gin is able to happily hand over the battle to Ichigo after he sees that the look of his eyes has considerably changed since they had fought moments ago in fake Karakura town. During their battle, Gin had concluded that Ichigo is weak. He had sensed a lack of resolve emanating from him, and he even questions whether if Ichigo was this weak this entire time, also commenting upon how fragile Ichigo's holification is, as his mask breaks very easily. We are aware that this is because Ichigo is doubting his own abilities and he is afraid of utilizing his holo powers here. He doesn't trust himself, which leads to him outwardly manifesting this weakness that Gin is so perceptive of. He questions whether if Ichigo really thinks that he is stronger than Ishin, Urahara and Yoriichi, further going on to question whether if he can really beat Aizen in this fragmented state, where he has such a nervous look in his eye. Now it is this exchange and this comment about Ichigo's eyes that we are going to use to contrast against Gin's final look at Ichigo right before he dies, when he gazes upon Dangai Ichigo and sees the confident expression in those eyes, and feels comfortable enough to hand over the battle to him, reassured that Ichigo now has the strength to take out Aizen. The final battle of the fake Karakura Town arc is of course between Ichigo and Aizen. It is a satisfactory, tense encounter, as Ichigo successfully completes three months of training within the Dangai. He appears with a very stoic expression on his face, and it makes you assume that he had known from the very beginning of their fight that he would have to relinquish his powers in order to defeat Aizen. The only way to take out the enemy was to utilize the final Getsuka Tensho, to channel every ounce of his spiritual pressure into his blade and to fire it towards Aizen, in an ability that is referred to as Mugetsu, where Ichigo becomes the Getsuga itself. Aizen has his own image of how the world should be ruled. He disagrees with the current system and wants to overthrow the Soul King. His very existence and the plans that he aims to accomplish threaten the world that Ichigo cherishes so much. During this moment of the story, Ichigo has overcome his fear of his inner hollow, meaning that he now knows how to fight instinctively, and he perfectly combines this with his sense of resolve, which was his ultimate guiding force during the Soul Society arc. With both of these aspects now combined within his character, he is strong enough to face off against the big bad. During this final encounter, both Aizen and Ichigo have become transcended beings. They are both practically gods in their own right. Aizen had attained transcendence through the help of the Hokyoku, an artificial means, whereas Ichigo had looked inward and had attained transcendence through sacrifice, a stark contrast to Aizen who had relied upon an external power, which was the Hokyoku. The climactic battle of the fake Karakura Town arc is a battle of ideologies. Ichigo, similar to Urahara, desires to maintain the status quo, while Aizen is opposed to the status quo and wants to change the world. At the end of their battle, after Ichigo defeats Aizen, he feels remorseful for his opponent. After exchanging blows with him, he realizes that he had sensed loneliness emanating from Aizen Zanpakdo. Aizen had felt loneliness because he had nobody to share this ideology with, and the only individual who he could have formed an understanding with, which of course was Urohara, he had adopted an opposite ideology to Aizen, believing that maintaining and protecting the current status quo is the better option. It is because of this momentary loneliness that Aizen had felt, which consequently resulted in the Hokyoku rejecting Aizen, revealing that it his true intention was for somebody to see things the way that he did. He didn't want to be alone in his perception of reality, and like I just mentioned, Urahara was the only person who could have remedied Aizen's loneliness. But after learning about the nature of reality, he had followed the path of acceptance of the status quo, while Aizen had wanted to change it. This leads to Aizen's outburst against Urahara, as he proclaims that he despises him. With a mind as brilliant as his, why does he accept the Soul King and the current status quo? Urahara states that the Soul King prevents the Soul society from becoming divided. Its existence maintains the world. Urahara accepts the way that the world is, but Aizen questions his logic as he declares him to be a loser. He proclaims that a winner doesn't accept the way that the world is, but rather a winner asks how it should be. Aizen is eventually sealed and 10 days later he is sentenced by the Central 46 and he is given a sentence of imprisonment of 20,000 years within the lowest level of the underground prison of the Soul Society and the fake Karakura Town arc sadly ends with Ichigo losing his Shinigami powers, and consequently losing his ability to see spiritual beings like Rukia, as she fades away from his sight as they say goodbye to each other, thus ending the longest story arc of Bleach 
Age, the Arankar Saga. It is an understatement to say that a lot takes place within the Arankar Saga. I feel like I have been able to analyse most of the key moments within each of the arcs, but if you want more of an in-depth analysis as to some of the key motives of the characters, then I definitely recommend that you check out my Urahara character analysis and especially my Aizen character analysis. I'm really proud of both of these videos and cannot recommend them enough to fans of Bleach, so definitely check them out if you want a better understanding of the entire Aranka saga. Now from the point of the story that we're at now, Ichigo has lost his powers. This means that we are going to reboot the story in some way. We are going to be returning to the beginnings of Bleach, and we are going back to Karakura Town as Ichigo learns to once again deal with powerlessness. 17 months after the defeat of Aizen begins the Fulbrink arc, a very controversial story arc even among casual fans and long term fans of the story. I've heard so many takes about the Fulbrink arc, with some people stating that it is a filler arc and it has no meaning or consequence whether if you watch it or not. And I've even read some comments online of people stating that they're going to watch the anime adaptation of the final arc without having experienced the Fulbrink arc. The logic behind these takes is that people stopped watching Bleach after Aizen was defeated, believing that that was all that the story was building up to. But there were story beats that were planted by Kubo within the duration of the story that need to be explained. We learn about the nature of Orihime and Chad's powers within the Fulbrink arc, as well as explaining how Ichigo combines his hollow powers with his Shinigami powers when he regains all of his abilities at the end of the Fulbrink arc. So I'm really looking forward to talking about one of the most controversial story arcs within Bleach, and a story arc that I can personally say is one of my favourites within Bleach, and one that I can say I really enjoyed from the minute that I would seen it within the anime. It would be an understatement to say that it is difficult to follow up from the climactic end of the fake Karakura Town arc, but the story arc that we're discussing in this video finds itself in this position. The Fulbrink arc is one of the most controversial and disliked portions of the Bleach story, but why is this the case? The Fulbrink arc is a response to the commonly cited criticisms of Bleach as a story, which is that Ichigo has no goal or drive within the story. The entirety of the Fulbrink arc is centred around Ichigo being driven to get his powers back. We see him go through several phases mentally during this arc, where he denies the significance of his prior Shinigami powers and his bond that he has formed with everybody in the Soul Society, as at the start of the arc he is very dismissive towards it, trying not to think about everything that he has lost with his powers, but when he comes to accept his powerlessness, he resolves to regain his powers, and he does so through seeking the help of Ginjo Kugo, the leader of a newly introduced group of characters called the Fullbringers. In addition to this, we see Ichigo betrayed as he sinks into despair, and how by the end of the Fulbrink arc he overcomes his despair and even understands his enemy Ginjo Kugo and shows respect towards him by actively going to the Soul Society and asking for his body to be returned to the world of the living where he can be properly buried. Now think of this video as my defence of the Fulbrink arc and why I believe it to be one of the most significant story portions within the entirety of the Bleach story. In my opinion I believe it to be a very misunderstood story arc, so in this video I want to explain my perspective so that there is a solid argument against anybody who criticises the the Fulbrink arc and even go so far as to call it canon filler. So without further delay, let's begin my analysis of the Fulbrink arc or the Lost Agent arc. The anime adaptation of the Fulbrink arc had began in October of 2011 and had ran all the way up until March 2012. It takes place between episodes 343 to 366, running for a total of 23 canon episodes, with one filler episode being episode 355. It adapts chapters 424 to 479, which ends up being 56 chapters adapted into 23 episodes. This arc is set 17 months after the defeat of Aizen, and it follows Ichigo's life after he has lost his powers, as we follow him struggle to regain them. This arc brings us back to the start of the story, where Ichigo had stated that he had wanted to be a normal high school student, one who didn't have the ability to see ghosts, because it was all too often getting in the way of his day to day life. So now that he is exactly what he had wished for, how does he deal with this? Ichigo's well defined desire to protect is in opposition to this desire to be normal, as he becomes conflicted that he cannot do anything to help his friends anymore as it becomes apparent within the Fulbrink arc that someone or something is targeting Ichigo's friends and family, and he cannot remain powerless and do nothing about it. Now in comparison to the fake Karakura Town arc, the stakes here have been considerably lowered. Now at the time of publication, nobody really knew where the Fulbrink arc was headed, 
ended. With Aizen no longer in the picture, and with the climactic finale, a lot of people had felt that the Bleach story had wrapped up everything that it needed to tell. But if you pay attention to Kubo's writing, then you know that this isn't the case, and that Kubo would not end his story with Ichigo being powerless. The Forbing arc is a reboot of the Bleach story, and frankly, after the defeat of Aizen, a new chapter has to start. And for that to be done in a considerable way, Ichigo needed to have lost his powers, so that he returns to the state that he was in at the start of the story. Ichigo couldn't protect his friends and family against the hollow fishbone D until Rukia had shared her powers with him. And similarly, Ichigo is unable to protect his friends and family from the threat of Tsukishima unless he struggles to regain his powers in the form of his Fulbring. Now, during those 17 months where Ichigo was powerless, it's made clear that Ichigo still fought to protect those who were weak, whether if this was protecting a student who was being bullied, or when he deals with a thief who had stolen Ginjo's bag right at the start of the Fulbring arc. Prior to helping Ginjo, he does say to himself that despite the fact that he has lost his powers, he had still retained some of the physical strength and reflexes that he had developed as a Shinigami. So it's clear that despite him not having supernatural powers, he does everything in his ability as a normal person to assist those around him. But when the threat to his friends and family becomes far too great for a normal person to deal with, it is at this moment that he truly feels the loss of his powers, and he actively seeks to regain them. Now this is important because the Fallbrink arc is a precursor to the Thousand Year Blood War arc. Kubo wanted to reboot and recreate everything that he had done within Bleach up until now. Hence why there is a time skip, there's a return to the familiar setting of the first story arc, and like I mentioned before, there's one glaring similarity, which is Ichigo's powerlessness. I can appreciate that there's a lot of disdain for the Fallbrink arc because most of the people who had experienced it did so through the anime. Now while it adapts 56 chapters into 23 episodes, a lot of people felt like it dragged on, and this is because the anime adaptation of the Fallbrink arc had needless padding. They had done so through introducing several filler scenes that weren't within the manga, and it is because of this a lot of people feel like the Fallbrink arc just dragged on and never really got to the point. So if your only experience of the Fallbrink arc is through the anime, then I definitely urge you to check out the manga version. I do believe that it will help you to see this story arc in a new light. So let's go through the events of the Fallbrink arc as I explain to you why this story arc grounds Ichigo as a character and sends him on this journey of self discovery. At the start of the arc, we see Ichigo continuing his life as a student. It is also revealed that he has taken up a part-time job after school. Very quickly, we are introduced to the character of Ginjo Kugo, who is persistent on getting the attention of Ichigo. He does so by telling him to be careful of those around him, as Ginjo questions the motives of Urahara and tells Ichigo that he knows very little about his own family when he calls into question Ichigo's father. He then hands to Ichigo an invitation into his exclusive group called Execution. Ichigo is pushed to the point of frustration where he has no choice but to contact Execution, after he learns that somebody is targeting his friends and family. The final straw that prompts Ichigo to take action is after Uryu is cut down by an unknown assailant, who we eventually learn is an individual called Tsukishima. Everybody around Ichigo is trying to protect him. They don't want him to get involved, so they conceal what is happening. They are aware that he has done so much to protect them over time, and they feel like it is now their turn to repay their debt to him. But it's fairly easy to misunderstand these intentions and feel like you're being left out. And this is exactly how Ichigo feels. When he is overwhelmed by his feelings of powerlessness, he turns to Ginjo Kugo and his group execution. It is here that he learns about the abilities of Fullbringers, and he also finds out that Chad is a member of execution and is a Fullbringer himself. After Orihime is targeted by Tsukishima, Ginjo reveals to Ichigo that Tsukishima was the former leader of the Fullbringers. And in terms of Ichigo regaining his powers, he undergoes several different rounds of training in order to activate his own Fullbring abilities. The first of which is with Riruka, the second with the Fallbringer Jackie, and the third and final round of his training takes place when he faces off against Ginjo with the help of Yukio's Fallbring. After he completes his Fallbring training and awakens his abilities, he realizes that Tsukishima has manipulated the memories of all of his friends and family through using his own Fallbring ability Book of the End. He had planted false memories into their minds, leading them to believe that Tsukishima is a trusted ally who has been fighting alongside them from the very beginning. Ichigo faces off against Tsukishima while Ginjo takes on the members of execution who are being manipulated by him. But when a recovered Uryu arrives on the battlefield, he has a shocking revelation for Ichigo, as he reveals that it wasn't Tsukishima who had cut him down. In actual fact, he was attacked by Ginjo. After this revelation, Ginjo cuts down Ichigo, as we find out his true intentions, which were to steal Ichigo's Fulbring powers. At this point, when Ichigo has gone through so much struggle in order to regain his abilities, they are taken away from him again. His frustration leads him to sink into despair as he pleads with Ginjo to return his powers back to him. But when Ichigo is 
impaled through the chest by a glowing sword, he turns around to see Rukia standing behind him, as in another shocking turn of events, he has his Shinigami powers returned to him, as it is revealed that Rukia along with the help of Urahara, had several members of the Gotei 13 place their Ryatsu into the sword, as the Soul Society felt indebted to Ichigo for defeating Aizen, and they had repaid their debt to him by creating this Reishi sword, which was ultimately used by Ichigo to regain his powers. After Rukia explains to Ichigo how his powers were returned to him, a gate opens as we see Kimpachi, Hitsugaya, Renji, Ikaku and Byakuya arrive, to assist Ichigo in his battle against Ginjo and the Fullbringers. After their arrival, we quickly learn that the very first substitute Shinigami before Ichigo was Ginjo Kugo, and we find out why he holds a grudge against the Soul Society, when he tells Ichigo that the substitute Shinigami badge is a surveillance device used by the Soul Society, and that the two of them were tricked by Ukitake. And in addition to this, the substitute Shinigami badge also suppresses the power of an individual. He tries to bring Ichigo over onto his side. He wants him to hate the Soul Society just as much as he does, but for Ichigo this is impossible, because if it wasn't for the Soul Society, he wouldn't have his powers back now, and he believes that there must have been a good reason for the Soul Society to use the substitute Shinigami badge as a surveillance device. In the end, Ichigo has complete trust within the Soul Society, and he sees no reason to turn against them. Each of the Fullbringers become powered up when Ginjo shares Ichigo's Fullbring with them, but they still appear to be no match against the members of the Gotei 13. As Kimpachi defeats Giriko, Hitsugaya takes out Yukio, Renji defeats Jackie, Ikaku beats Mo, and lastly Byakuya takes out Tsukushima. After Ichigo and Ginjo activate their respective Bankais, the final phase of their battle begins. They clash several times as Ichigo proves to be more powerful than his opponent. After he delivers the final blow and cuts down Ginjo, the leader of the Fallbringers ends up dying, as aside from Ukiara, who Ichigo had killed while he was in his Vastor Lorde form, this is the first person that Ichigo has killed with his own hands while being fully conscious. Tsukushima also ends up dying, and the Fallbring arc concludes with Ichigo going to the Soul Society and requesting for Ginjo's body to be returned to the human world, so that he can be buried properly. During this story arc, the only proof that Ichigo has that he was once a Shinigami is his substitute Shinigami badge. Even before Rukia had given her powers to him, he had the ability to see spirits, but not once did he feel superior to others because of this, and he had never wanted to use his ability to see spirits to help others in any way. Ichigo simply desired to live a normal life, and he gets what he wants during the Fallbring arc. After losing his Shinigami powers, he has 17 months of powerlessness. In that time, he wasn't visited by Rukia, and he had come to accept his current situation. Ichigo clearly states at the start of the story arc that he is indifferent towards the Soul Society, and that he doesn't miss Rukia, despite the fact that he has dreams of the Soul Society and the members of the Gotei 13. Although he may not be a part of that world anymore, it has left too much of an impact on him for his subconscious mind to just discard away. On the surface, he may appear as though he doesn't care, but deep down he really is grieving the loss of his powers. At the start of the Fullbring arc, he may not even know this, but he certainly becomes apparent of it when Tsukushima targets his friends and family. During his Fullbring training, he admits to himself that there wasn't a time that he wasn't proud of his Shinigami powers. The abilities of Fullbring allow you to draw out the soul of an object and to enhance or amplify that object with your own soul. Ichigo's own Fullbring is activated through his substitute Shinigami badge, and like I had mentioned earlier, this is the only object that remains from his time as a Shinigami. It has all of the memories of Ichigo's battles, his feelings every time that he had donned his Shinigami Shihakusho and protected his loved ones. During their training, it is Chad who tells Ichigo that he knows that Ichigo wants to protect others, and because of his powerlessness, he is aware that this is hurting him, and this is exactly what his friends and family can sense from Ichigo. They know that he is lying to himself, and to prevent him from dwelling on his feelings of powerlessness, they refuse to get him involved with anything that would remind him of his powerlessness. Hence why Uryu was adamant not to tell Ichigo what had happened after he was cut down by Tsukushima. Ryuken also advises Orihime not to get Ichigo involved, because he has no power to do anything about it. Now there is a Bleach light novel that takes place within the 17 months between the fake Karakura Town arc and the Fallbring arc. This light novel is called Death Save the Strawberry, Death referring to Rukia and Strawberry referring to Ichigo. This light novel centers around Rukia attempting to get Ichigo's powers back. In addition to this, we get to see how Ichigo spent those 17 months while he was powerless, as we learned that he had continued trying to help and protect others. So with everything that I have said up until now, why do people still refer to the Fallbring arc as canonical filler? In my opinion, the Fallbring arc is a necessary part of the Bleach story. The 56 chapters of the Fallbring arc reveal so much about the world of Bleach, including a much needed explanation as to the origins of both Orihime and Chad's powers, as we find out that
that the abilities that they have been using since the start of the story are Fulbring abilities. Orihime utilizes her Fulbring through the hair clips that her brother had given to her, and Chad activates his Fulbring through his skin color, as he feels proud of his Mexican heritage. In addition to this, we learn about the origins of the position of a substitute Shinigami. Through Ginjo Kugo, who was Ichigo's predecessor, through Ginjo's character, we see a different side to Ichigo. The knowledge that Ginjo learns that ends up turning him against the Soul Society does not affect Ichigo in the slightest, and this is a sign of his maturity. We compare the former substitute Shinigami to the one who is currently holding the position, and even moments before Ginjo's death, he wonders whether if Ichigo was the first substitute Shinigami, would he have repeated in his footsteps, or would he have continued to trust the Soul Society? Despite the differences that both Ichigo and Ginjo have, Ichigo still has enough respect for Ginjo to want to give him a proper burial, and it is this respect and maturity that Ichigo shows here that ultimately leads to Ginjo wanting to help Ichigo at the end of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, when he orders Tsukishima to assist Ichigo by restoring his Zanbakdo that was destroyed by Yuhabak. In addition to this, another character from the Fulbring arc who plays a pivotal role within the Thousand Year Blood War arc is Yukio, as he uses his abilities to help Ichigo and the others travel from the Soul Society to the Soul King's Palace in their final confrontation with Yuhabak. People complain that as a character Ichigo has no direction, but when a story arc comes along that serves to give him a clear sense of direction, they don't like it. When Kubo actually gives the critics what they want, they fail to appreciate it, and what ends up happening is that they double down on their takes, and refer to an excellent character driven story arc like the Fulbring arc as a filler arc, one that would have no consequence on Bleach as a whole if it didn't exist. Prior to this story arc, Ichigo could only utilize his hollow abilities through activating a hollow mask, but thanks to the Fulbring arc, Ichigo was able to manifest these hollow like abilities through his Fulbring, and so when his Shinigami powers had returned to him, they had merged with the small fraction of his Fulbring powers that had remained within him in order to create this new form that we refer to as Fulbring Shikai, while his Zanpakuto has transformed and he has Fulbring markings on his body, meaning that he no longer needs to don a hollow mask in order to utilize his hollow abilities because his Fulbring or hollow powers have merged with his Shinigami powers, meaning that not only has he become a Shinigami again, he is now stronger than ever before. So yet again, the Fulbring arc plays a pivotal role in explaining Ichigo's powers. If you skip over the Fulbring arc, then you're not going to understand why Ichigo no longer uses his hollow mask. You won't understand the significance of the changes of his appearance. And in addition to this, you'll be missing out on all of the pivotal growth that his character undergoes during the story arc. I really love the Fulbring arc because of the journey that Ichigo undergoes, seeing him be completely deconstructed and then rebuilt. This story arc that takes us back to the beginnings of Bleach even has us relive one of the most impactful moments within the first chapter of the manga, where Rukia gives her powers to Ichigo. Kubo masterfully echoes this moment, with Rukia being the one who returns Ichigo's powers back to him with the Reishi Sword. Maybe people just didn't like the Forbring arc because things had really calmed down. We were no longer up against Aizen, this big threat who had wanted to become a god. From these incredibly high stakes, we return to the humble beginnings of the story in Karakura Town. And in addition to this, our protagonist is nothing more than a normal teenager. While some believe that the Fulbring arc had regressed by reminding them of the substitute Shinigami arc, I believe that it grounded the entire story of Bleach in order for us to be ready for the upcoming story arc. During the Fulbring arc, we catch up with characters like Orihime, Chad, and Uryu, as well as learning more about Ichigo's day-to-day -day life. Now, while it pales in comparison to the climactic finale of Ichigo vs. Aizen, I do still believe that the Fulbring arc is an important prelude to the final arc of the series, as it bridges the gap from one portion of the story to the next, taking us from Aizen all the way to Yuhabak, and in that time it gives us very necessary world building through all of the examples that I had mentioned. It's a refreshing return to roots. As we take a break from the Soul Society and the Gotei 13, it was a risky move, and not everybody liked it, but I for one got to appreciate a return to Karakura Town, and it wasn't even for that long, because the Gotei 13 do eventually end up returning. Through the Fulbring arc, it is cemented that Ichigo is not happy unless he has the power to protect those that he cares about, and it also reveals to us how Ichigo has influenced the Soul Society in a positive way. Through him defeating Aizen, they are indebted to him, and they had even overlooked their own rules in order to help Ichigo regain his powers. Now this is something that you would never have imagined the Soul Society to do way back at the start of the story, which goes to show how much of an impact Ichigo has had. So now let's talk about the antagonist of the Fulbring arc, Ginjo Kugo. We see several sides to his character thanks to the double role that he plays. When he is trying to help Ichigo, we see a likeable and charismatic side, somebody who had gained Ichigo's trust and even ours. He had wanted to help Ichigo out of selflessness, but when his true intentions 
machinations are revealed, we see a more sadistic and manipulative side, proving that he is very different to Aizen or Yuhabak. He doesn't want to change or alter reality in any way. He had created the group called Execution in order to give a home to those who were oppressed by others. He just simply wanted to know why the Soul Society would have lied to him. Why Ukitake didn't tell him about the real purpose behind the Substitute Shinigami badge. When Ginjo had learned that the Soul Society was spying on him, he had gone on a killing spree and had killed several Shinigami. As it is revealed at the end of the Fallbring arc when Ichigo attempts to get Ginjo's body back, the Fallbring arc introduces us to a fascinating and memorable villain, one who is not only designed well but is written very well. I do believe that Kubo did want to expand upon the Fallbring arc a bit more and add to the world building and characterization that he had established, but I'm sure that at the time there was a lot of fan backlash halfway through the Fallbring arc from people who had just given up on it and wanted to see more of a grandiose story like the Aranka arc, so in the end we never got to see the full potential of this story arc, as no doubt Kubo was pressured by his editors to wrap up the Fallbring arc and to start the final arc of the story already. That is just me speculating and remembering the backlash at the time when the Fallbring arc was being serialized, but I do think that there's some validity to it, especially with how quickly all of the events of the Fallbring arc wrapped up. Now for people who criticized the Fallbring arc and said that Ichigo has no character development, I want to bring your attention to one point. At the start of the story, Ichigo made it apparent that he didn't like the ability to see spirits. He wanted to be rid of it so that he could have a normal life, but through living the life of a substitute Shinigami and learning what it means not to just protect those who are close to you, but to accept the responsibility that comes with power in order to protect as many people as you can. After Ichigo had come to this realization, he had his powers taken away and his initial wish at the start of the story is granted, but because of the growth that his character has undergone, he has difficulty accepting this state of powerlessness and we see a very vulnerable side to his character, one that in my opinion is very relatable. Everybody can relate to a character that is powerless because most people have situations in their life where they feel powerless to do anything, whether if this is a loved one who is afflicted by a critical illness like cancer, you are powerless to do anything to save them. That's just one example from my own personal life, but I'm sure that there are many. There are moments in all of our lives where we cannot do anything to help those that are most important to us, and it is for this reason that the struggle that a character like Ichigo is going through is all that more relatable. The Fallbring arc tells a very different story to anything that we have seen within Bleach, and in my opinion it's one of the most underrated and underappreciated parts of the Bleach story, and I hope that my breakdown and analysis of the themes and the purpose of this story arc have helped you to better understand it. It's not the longest story arc, so I do advise you to check out the manga version of it if you've only been exposed to it through the anime. Now as for where we go from here, in my next Bleach arc analysis video, we'll be beginning my breakdown of the first half of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, the final story arc of the Bleach manga. We're going to be carrying over everything that we've learned from each one of the arc analysis videos in order to understand the truth that is revealed to us in the final arc of the series. We'll be going over the impactful introduction of the Quincy's, breaking down the character of Yuhabak, as well as explaining the vital role that the Fullbringers play during the Thousand Year Blood War arc. A thousand years ago, the Soul Society had defeated an enemy that had threatened the very balance of reality. But suddenly, this threat from the past re-emerges, but this time with an unforgiving vengeance. While the Soul Society has grown comfortable in times of peace, the opposition have been preparing for the last 10 centuries for that inevitable return. The Thousand Year Blood War arc is the continuation of a long-standing feud between the Quincy and the Shinigami. We were briefly made aware of this during the Substitute Shinigami arc, when Rukia had explained that the Quincy were eradicated by the Shinigami. During this final arc of Bleach, we are introduced to the leader of the Quincy, Yuhabak, the very man who was supposedly killed all those years ago. After making his return, he wastes little time by immediately occupying Kwekumundo and declaring war upon the Soul Society. This final arc begins as it means to go on, as for the first time we are heading for a war that will permanently change the Soul Society and redefine what we know about our protagonist Ichigo Kurosaki. So join me as I begin the first half of my Thousand Year Blood War arc breakdown and analysis. In the first half of my Thousand Year Blood War arc analysis, I'll be covering material from chapters 480 to 546. So of course, the 67 chapters that I'll be covering are manga exclusive content, because at the time of making this video, the Thousand Year Blood War arc has yet to be adapted into an anime. So in this video, we'll be going over the Quincy's first invasion of the Soul Society, as well as the aftermath of it, which leads us into their second 
and final invasion. A lot of notable and key events take place during this part of the story, including Head Captain Yamamoto's battle against Yuhabak, the Bankai of several captains of the Gotei 13 being stolen, the introduction of the Zero Division into the story, as well as the reveal about the true identity of Ichigo's mother and the origin of his powers. This arc begins with the Soul Society's Research and Development Institute detecting that a large number of Hollows are being killed. We immediately learn that the only group who are capable of such a task are the Quincy. Not too long after, Ichigo is confronted by a Quincy called Eben, while a group of mysterious masked individuals break into the Serete. They appear within the First Division barracks, revealing to the head captain that the Quincy have returned and they are here to declare war against the Soul Society. After this declaration, the Quincy kill the head captain's lieutenant Chojiro Sasakibe before leaving the masked men tell the head captain that within five days the Soul Society will be annihilated by the Quincy's invisible army, the Vanden Reich. Just as quickly as they arrived, the masked men promptly disappear into the shadows as the head captain's attention turns to his fatally wounded lieutenant. Prior to dying, Chojiro had attempted to tell the head captain that the Quincy are able to do something with their Bankai, but before he can relay this crucial information to him, he succumbs to his injuries and dies. At the cremation of the head captain's lieutenant, we learn that Chojiro had sworn his loyalty to the head captain, promising to stand by his side till his dying breath. The Quincy prove themselves to be unforgiving and merciless. Their motive is well established, and their declaration of war comes with a heavy price. By killing Chojiro, the Quincy have incurred the wrath of head captain Yamamoto. He is even reminded by Mayuri that it is his fault that this is happening, because he had failed to kill that one man a thousand years ago. As we learn that this individual is indeed Yuhabak, the leader and founder of the Quincy. Within a millennium, he was able to restore himself and bring himself back from the brink of death. While in the shadows, he was also able to build a new army of Quincy, an army that he is using to set his sights on the Soul Society. Meanwhile, in Karakura Town, Ichigo activates his Bankai and faces off against the Quincy Eben. He attempts to steal Ichigo's Bankai with a medallion that he is wielding, but he ultimately fails at this. After the Quincy begins to lose his battle against Ichigo, he retreats, and it is at that moment that Ichigo bumps into Nell, who appears to be very distressed. Through her, he learns about the dire circumstances and Boarding within Hueco Mundo, as the current leader of that realm, Tia Haribel, has been held captive. In order to investigate what is going on, Ichigo and his friends, with the help of Urahara, make their way over to Hueco Mundo. But because this time the Quincy may be involved, Uryu decides not to side with the Shinigami, as he opts out of going to Hueco Mundo with them. Upon arriving, they find the remains of several Aranka, as it becomes apparent that they are being massacred by the Quincy. Ichigo discovers the Sternritter Kilge and begins his battle against him. Ichigo's opponent had been tracking down and killing Arankas. Yuhabak had relayed to the Senritters that Ichigo has been designated as a high-level threat. Presumably, they are aware of Ichigo defeating Aizen, and thus explaining why he needs to be defeated. Meanwhile, Yuhabak tells his elite soldiers, the Senritters, to ready themselves to invade the Soul Society, as he goes back on his word and invades the Soul Society before five days. Thankfully, the Shinigami had been expecting them, as they have no reason to trust the words of their enemy. But despite their readiness for battle, nothing could prepare them for what was about to unfold. The Gotei 13 immediately mobilize against Yuhabak and his army. Meanwhile, Ichigo's battle against Kilge takes a turn when the Quincy activates his holy form. But despite this, Ichigo is able to overwhelm his opponent, thanks to him having activated his Bankai. Similar to Eben, Kilge attempts to steal Ichigo's Bankai, but he too fails at this. Despite Ichigo's minor victory over the Sternritter, the Soul Society on the other hand isn't doing as well, as the Ryatsu of countless Shinigami begins to drop one after the other, as the Quincy launch a relentless assault upon the Serete. They begin to indiscriminately kill the Shinigami and systematically start to destroy the Soul Society. The lieutenants and captains mobilize in order to protect their subordinates, but what they do not know is that the Quincy have a trick up their sleeves, and this will unfortunately give them an unfair advantage over the Shinigami, who we quickly learn have become complacent, as a millennium of peace has softened them and has made them all too reliant upon their Bankai. The Quincy strike the Shinigami at their weak and steal their Bankai. A notable encounter that occurs here is between Byakya and Asnot. Through this battle, we see the full extent of a captain's Bankai being stolen and being used against them. Asnot has the ability to instantly
instill fear into his opponent, as he unnerves the usually well-composed Byakuya. During the first invasion of the Quincy, four captains end up losing their Bankai, of which include Byakuya, Komomura, Hitsugaya, and Soifon. It isn't long before Ichigo and the others learn about what is happening to the Soul Society, as Urahara is contacted by the Soul Society's Research and Development Institute, and he discovers that the Soul Society has been attacked by Yuhobak and his army of Quincy, and frankly the situation is dire. After relaying this information to Ichigo, he takes over the battle against Kilge, while Ichigo rushes to the Soul Society as a shining ray of hope. Having demonstrated that he is an exception and his Bankai cannot be stolen, his help will be invaluable, that is, if he is able to get out of Huekomundo, as he ends up being trapped in a Reishi prison by Kilge. While imprisoned, he can hear countless Shinigami being slaughtered on the phone, as he frantically tries to break free from Kilge's ability. At this moment, Ichigo is able to hear firsthand the devastation that is unfolding within the Soul Society, and while he is momentarily stuck, he is powerless to do anything about it. Kubo is able to powerfully convey the devastation unfolding within the Soul Society and Ichigo's powerlessness through this page where Ichigo is stood in the dark as he hears countless Shinigami being either slaughtered or begging for their lives. Cutting back to the Soul Society, Asnot steals Byakuya's Bankai and uses it against him. In addition to this, he is able to successfully instill fear into the mind of Byakuya. Using Zenbon Zakura Kageyoshi, he fires it towards Byakuya as his own ability tears his body apart. Asnot reminds Byakuya that he is unable to overcome his Bankai with his Shikai and that frankly the situation is hopeless for him. There is nothing that he can do here. Byakuya is then assaulted by an endless stream of blade petals. His body is pushed back against a wall as the relentless attack ensues as it forms a crater around Byakuya's body. Beaten and bloodied in what appears to be Byakuya's final moments, he apologizes to both Rukia and Renji before his eyes shut ending his encounter with Asnot. From one jaw-dropping, devastating battle to the next, we have the head captain join the battle as he arrives to protect his precious children. The figurative father of the Gotei 13 faces off against the leader of the Quincy. When he appears before Yuhobak, he discovers that the leader of the Quincy is holding Kimpachi's lifeless body. As to be expected, Kimpachi had joined the battlefield and had just rushed towards the strongest opponent, but unfortunately his adversary on this occasion was way too much for him to handle. Yamamoto confronts Yuhobak for the first time in a thousand years. Yuhobak states that seeing the head captain with such an angry expression reminds him of their first encounter. The head captain wastes little time by striking Yuhobak first, but he evades the attack. In retaliation, Yuhobak draws his own sword made out of Reishi. The head captain immediately activates his Bankai, Zanka no Tachi. It would appear that this is the second time that Yuhobak is seeing the head captain's Bankai. The head of the Quincy thinks to himself whether if Yamamoto's Bankai has changed in all of these years. After activating his Bankai, a notable change occurs within the atmosphere, as all of the moisture begins to evaporate within the Soul Society. We see Unohana, Ukitake, Hitsugaya, and Shunsui comment on the head captain's Bankai. During this exchange with Yuhobak, we learn that the head captain's Bankai has four separate sections, the east, the west, the south, and the final being the north. Through Zankanotachi East, the head captain is able to concentrate the flames of his Zanpakuto at the tip of his blade. In this form, anything that the head captain's Zanpakuto touches turns to nothing. Even the Quincy's defensive ability, Blutveen, cannot stand up to it. The next part, Zankanotachi West, is activated upon release of one's Bankai. It is an ability that only the head captain can see, and anybody who he chooses to see it. It involves Yamamoto's body being covered in heat, which reaches a temperature of up to 15 million degrees. In this state, it would be impossible to touch the head captain while he is in his Bankai form. Zankanotachi South involves the head captain dropping the tip of his sword into the ground, as he literally calls upon the fallen dead, who had died at the hands of Yamamoto's Zanpakuto. These corpses emerge from the ground and fight on Yamamoto's behalf. Among these corpses, Yuhobak is able to recognize his fallen men from a millennium ago. Tragically, these very familiar and former comrades of Yuhobak are now restraining him, as the head captain takes a step back to make some distance between them, as he questions whether if Yuhobak regrets not stealing his Bankai right away. But he corrects himself, as he states that it's not that Yuhobak did not steal his Bankai, it's that he was unable to. The head captain assumes that the Quincy can only steal a Bankai once they understand the full power of it. He elaborates that this is the reason why why they fear Ichigo, because he has only recently mastered his Bankai, and it is far from reaching its full potential. And similarly, the head captain has not revealed the true form of his Bankai. Even a thousand years ago, he didn't show his full power. He concludes by stating that this is why the Quincy were unable to steal his Bankai, because the limit of the head captain's Bankai is still unknown. Without 
without hesitation, the head captain activates Zanka no Tachi North, the final true form of his Bankai. He appears to have cut down Yuhobak as a form of revenge for all of the Shinigami that the Quincy had just taken out. Zanka no Tachi North is a single strike of concentrated heat. Anything that this fire touches, it incinerates it out of existence. After making contact with Yuhobak's body, his torso and his arm appear to have been completely removed. Yuhobak collapses to the ground as it appears that he has been defeated. But strangely, after the head captain undoes his Bankai, he witnesses the fallen Yuhobak appearing to apologize to himself. It is here that the head captain realizes that he wasn't facing off against the real Yuhobak, but rather a doppelganger. The head captain had instead defeated a Stenritter called Lloyd Royd, who was able to imitate the memories, form, and abilities of another. The head captain turns around to see an explosion erupt from his first company barracks. The real Yuhobak appears before the head captain. We learn that while the head captain was preoccupied by the Stenritter Lloyd Royd, the real Yuhobak had gone to the underground prison in order to recruit Aizen into his ranks, but it would appear Appear that Aizen had declined his offer. Yuhobak then proceeds to steal the Bankai of the head captain, as he states that it's not that they can't steal his Bankai, it's that the head captain's Bankai was too powerful for an ordinary Stenritter to handle, explaining why Yuhobak is the only individual who can hold and contain the head captain's Bankai. Yuhobak then summons a large Reishi sword. He bids farewell to head captain Yamamoto as he strikes him from across his shoulder down to his torso. After the top half of his body falls to the ground, Yuhobak refers to the head captain as pitiful, but in a final desperate attempt to fight back, the head captain grabs onto the cloak of Yuhobak. He then cuts Yamamoto's arm off as he steps on his head, stating that he is foolish. He questions why the head captain didn't heal his left arm after his battle against Aizen. He could have had it healed thanks to Orihime's abilities, but he chose not to. Ultimately, it was because of head captain Yamamoto's stubbornness. He didn't want to rely on a human being. Even during the Soul Society's battle against Aizen, he was concerned about involving Ichigo into their battle because he is a human. In the end, the head captain had shouldered the burden of the Soul Society and the human world onto his back, and he had decided to stand before Yuhobak, but ultimately his efforts were futile and he ended up dying. Yuhobak explains that the head captain had become weak due to his own stubborn ethics and morality. Yuha states that a thousand years ago, the head captain used to be so different. The leader of the Quincy describes the original Gote 13 as a group of bloodthirsty killers, and this is exactly what had made them so fearful. They were far from the noble guardians of the Soul Society. Back then, there were individuals who had striked fear into anybody who had crossed their path. Yuhobak's point here is that the current Gote 13 is a far cry from that of a millennium ago. The victors of that battle all those years ago had become comfortable, and in their comfort, they had softened and grown weaker. And this is the reason why the Quincy was so successful in their ambush of the Soul Society. They had remembered the lessons taught to them from that original Gote 13, and they had embodied that ruthlessness. The Quincy here are the group of bloodthirsty killers, and ultimately they had given the head captain a taste of his own medicine, even if it was overdue by 10 centuries. As far as Yuhobak is concerned, the true Gote 13 died a thousand years ago, and this current iteration of the Gote 13 is nothing more than a poor imitation of its predecessors. Yuha then orders the remaining Stenritters to destroy what's left of the Soul Society. In a brutal, merciless, one-sided attack, they end up killing what's left of the remaining Shinigami, reducing a large portion of the Seri to nothing but rubble. When Ichigo finally arrives within the Soul Society, he meets Byakuya. The bloodied captain tells Ichigo that he is fearful that he won't make it any longer, as he humbly and selfishly asks Ichigo to protect the Soul Society on their behalf. He then confronts the leader of the Quincy, questioning whether if he is responsible for what has happened to the Soul Society. When Ichigo attempts to attack Yuhobak, he is easily overpowered. When he stabs Ichigo's neck, a strange pattern appears, as it seems that Ichigo was somehow able to utilize the advanced Quincy defensive technique Blute Veen. Yuhobak then brings up the topic of Ichigo's mother, as he comments on how Ichigo doesn't know the truth about her. This has been a running theme for the last two arcs. Firstly, when Aizen had commented on Ichigo's nature, when he was interrupted by Ishin and he was unable to complete his sentence, when he had told Ichigo he was a human. It was evident at that point that Ishin has a lot to explain to Ichigo, but Ichigo had respected his father's silence, and he understood that he would hear his father out when the time was right. 
right. It also adds to the comments that Ginjo had made about Ichigo's family when he had told Ichigo that there is a lot that he doesn't know about them. All of the mysteries surrounding the origin of Ichigo's powers and the truth about the death of his mother begins to be unraveled now during this arc. When Yuhobak comments on how Ichigo wasn't able to be confined within Kilge's jail, as it is an ability that was devised to kill enemies and it cannot capture a Quincy. As Yuhobak alludes to the fact that Ichigo has Quincy nature within him, Yuhobak's right hand man Hashwald ends up breaking Ichigo's Zambakdo and thus breaking his Bankai. When the two of them leave, they bid farewell to Ichigo, as he states that he will be back for him and that he should heal his wounds, as he refers to Ichigo as his son who was born in the dark. Chapter 514 alludes to the fact that Ichigo's mother is a Quincy and that Ichigo has a part Quincy nature within him, thus explaining why Yuhobak had referred to Ichigo as his son, as he is the father of all Quincy. After the Quincy leave, the Soul Society is left to deal with the aftermath, as Rukia and Renji are taken into the intensive care unit. Byakuya and Kimpachi have unfortunately fallen into a coma, and there is a possibility that they may never awaken from it. And last but not least, the death of the head captain, their leader, as well as the death of countless Shinigami, leave the Gote 13 in one of the most utterly devastating situations that we've ever seen them in. They were not only defeated here, they were utterly humiliated, and they have to pay an irreversible price for their defeat, as they've just lost the captain commander, a figure that everybody within the Serete had looked up to. Without any guidance, what on earth will the Shinigami do now? With the overwhelming threat of the Quincy at their doorstep, with the possibility of them returning to the Soul Society to finish off what they had started, the Gote 13 end up being assisted by the long-awaited arrival of the Zero Division, or the Royal Guard that they are also referred to as. This special organization does not interfere with the affairs of the Gote 13. Their purpose is not to defend the Soul Society, and it is for this reason that we didn't see them during the battle against Aizen and the Arankars. Their main priority is to fulfill every order of the Soul King, and the authority of the Royal Guard exceeds any authority within the Soul Society. The Royal Guard have intervened because this matter now affects the Soul King. If the Quincy wipe out the Soul Society, then you can be certain that they are going to be heading for the Royal Palace next. So it is for this reason that the Zero Division descend down upon the Soul Society, offering a ray of hope during a utterly bleak and desperate time. I'd mentioned that during the Thousand Year Boudoir arc, the theme of truth plays a pivotal role. Whether if this is the truth about the death of Ichigo's mother, the truth about the origin of Ichigo's powers, the truth about Old Man Zangetsu and Hono Ichigo, or the truth about the Quincy's and their sealed king. A king who took 900 years to regain his heartbeat, 90 years in order to regain his reasoning, and a further 9 years where he would absorb the power of the impure Quincy in order to regain his own. These verses were chanted by the Quincy as their final beacon of hope for the return of their king. Yuhobak, after returning, reveals that there is a final verse to this Emperor's song, as he states that after 9 days of returning, the king would conquer the world. Yuhobak ultimately desires to merge all of the realms of reality into one, so that he can rule over them. So now that we know more about the motives of Yuhobak and the circumstances surrounding his return, in particular the verse from his Emperor's song which refers to 9 years which would regain his power, as he would absorb the power from the impure Quincy, we learn through the Everything But The Rain flashback arc that Ichigo's mother was an impure Quincy, despite being born pure-blooded. This is because she was an unintentional victim to Aizen's holification experiments, as she had been bitten by a hollow that was created by Aizen called White. This hollow had of course become a part of her, and it was slowly consuming her. That is, until Urahara had intervened and explained to Ishin that if he relinquishes his powers and chains himself to Masaki, then he can subdue the hollow White and prevent Masaki's holification. Through the Everything But The Rain flashback arc, which takes place during the first half of the Thousand Year Boudoir arc, we learn about how Ichigo's parents had met. We learn about how Ishin was the former captain of the 10th division, but he had no choice but to become an ordinary human. After he had relinquished his powers in order to help Masaki, Urahara had assisted him in setting up a brand new life within the world of the living, after teaching him medicinal information so that he can practice as a doctor in his own clinic. Ishin would eventually marry Masaki and they would have their firstborn Ichigo. And we learn that Ichigo had inherited the Hollow White from his mother, but at the same time he had inherited Shinigami powers from his father. This resulted in the formation of Ichigo's true Zanpakuto spirit, Hollow Ichigo. It is also revealed that Ichigo is a quarter Quincy, and the individual within his inner world who had been representing these Quincy powers was indeed Old Man Zangetsu this entire time. Gradually, Ichigo uncovers the mystery behind his character. When he is unable to submit an Asuchi to his will, Owetsu Nomaya sends him back to the world of the living. It is here that he speaks to his father, and he learns about the true circumstances 
circumstances behind his mother's death, and how it was Yuhobak who had absorbed the powers of the impure Quincy, which had led to Masaki losing her abilities and being unable to protect herself and Ichigo from the Grand Fisher. So indirectly, it was Yuhobak who was responsible for the death of his mother. By stealing her powers, she had no means to fight against the Grand Fisher. When Ichigo returns to Uetsunimaya's domain, the crater of the Zanbakdo reveals to him that Onman Zangetsu is an imposter. He was never Ichigo's Zanbakdo spirit. Instead, he was a manifestation of his Quincy powers, thus explaining why Old Man Zangetsu resembles Yuhobak. Because Old Man Zangetsu takes the form of Yuhobak from a thousand years ago. He is a younger version of the enemy who had just annihilated the Soul Society. He learns about Old Man Zangetsu's true desire, which was to protect Ichigo. For this reason, he had suppressed Ichigo's Shinigami powers, as he didn't want him to follow the path of becoming a Shinigami, because this would lead to him taking part in battles and getting hurt. His desire to prevent Ichigo from getting into harm's way was so much so that he would have killed him in order to prevent him from following the path of a Shinigami. Ichigo questions this younger version of Yuhobak whether if everything that he had told him was a lie. He questions whether if he is really his enemy or his friend. He tells Ichigo that he is neither his enemy nor his friend. And in addition to this, he has never told him anything that would lead him astray. The only lie that he had told Ichigo was his name. This solidifies that he is not Zangetsu, and his inner hollow is in fact Zangetsu. When Ichigo had decided to pursue the path of a Shinigami, young Yuhobak had slowly started to accept Ichigo's decision, as his heart had started to waver seeing Ichigo overcome so many struggles, and before long he would appear imitating Ichigo's Zanbakdo spirit, wanting for him to grow stronger and to progress. Young Yuhobak's desire had changed from protecting Ichigo to wanting to help him and to watch him succeed. This explains how Ichigo was able to utilize blue Veen, how he was able to stop his blood from flowing during his battle against Kimpachi. These were all the interventions of young Yuhobak. In the end, the manifestation of his Quincy powers steps aside as he releases all of the restrictions that he had placed on Ichigo's powers, as Ichigo is finally able to wield his true Zanbakdo. After this exchange, Ichigo demonstrates his maturity as he understands the motives of young Yuhobak. He trusts not only him, but he trusts his inner hollow. This trust that he has is manifested within the two blades that he now wields. One blade which represents his Quincy powers, and the second representing his Hollow and Shinigami powers combined. No longer will he ask Old Man Zangetsu for help, nor will he reject his inner Hollow, or ask either of them to fight alongside him. Ichigo has come to learn the truth about himself, and he accepts every bit of it. And this is the fundamental growth that his character undergoes during this story arc. Through the Everything But The Rain flashback, and through his training with Uetsu Nimaya, Ichigo's character blossoms into this form that is ready to now face off against Yuhobak. Prior to the second invasion of the Quincy, several other members of the Gotei 13 prepare for their next attack, as Hitsugaya trains with Rangiku in order to master his abilities without relying on Bankai, as Rukia, Renji, and Byakuya also recover thanks to the Zero Division and immediately begin training with them in order to strengthen their abilities. And Kimpachi also undergoes training for the first time in his life, as he faces off against the only individual that he had ever respected and admired. This individual is is in fact the first Kimpachi, Retsu Unahana. During their battle, Unahana releases all of the subconscious limitations that Kimpachi had placed upon himself, as a result of him weakening himself in order to prolong any battle that he was taking part in. And this had all stemmed from an early encounter between Kimpachi and Unahana, when she had fought against the captain of the 11th division when he was just a boy. Even at that time, Kimpachi was more powerful than Unahana, but because of the enjoyment that the two of them had during their fight, Kimpachi did not want their battle to end. And in the same way that Unahana had learnt healing in order to prolong her battles, Kimpachi had subconsciously placed limitations upon his abilities so that he could prolong the duration of his battles. This explains why Kimpachi grows stronger after every fight. He had grown stronger after his encounter with Ichigo. He had grown more powerful after he had fought against Noitara and defeated him. And during his training with Unahana, she continues to cut Kimpachi down and to heal him so that he can come back stronger and stronger. She desires to do so until every limit is removed from Kimpachi's abilities. But as a result of this, Kimpachi is unable to control his own self, as he ends up cutting down and killing Unahana. Despite losing Unahana, the captain of the 11th division returns more powerful than ever before, ready to face off against the Quincy's return. Another captain of the Gotei 13 who takes drastic measures in order to prepare for the Quincy is Seijin Komamura. He confronts his great-grandfather, who is the elder of their clan. He pleads with him in order to teach the secrets of their clan, but he is ashamed with Komamura, who had decided to side with the Shinigami. Upon hearing this request, the elder laughs in Komamura's face. He hates that Komamura had hidden his face and had pretended to be a human, refusing to teach the secrets of the 
clan to Komomura, he challenges him to a fight. And we don't really know the outcome of this battle until the second half of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, which Shunsui, the new head captain of the Gotei 13, he takes up the leadership role without even having time to mourn the loss of head captain Yamamoto. And it isn't long before a curtain is cast across the Soul Society, and the entire Serite is replaced by the Quincy City of the Wandan Reich, and thus bringing an end to the first half of one of the most devastating story arcs in the entirety of Bleach, the Thousand Year Blood War arc. My next video will be my final entry into the Bleach analysis series, where I will be talking about the second half of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, as well as the epilogue of Bleach. The second half of the Thousand Year Blood War arc takes place between chapters 547 to 686 of the manga. Spanning over a total of 140 chapters, it brings us to the end of the Bleach story. So this second half has a lot of highs and moments that a lot of us were highly anticipating, but they are unfortunately overshadowed by a rushed ending and a feeling of not having every loose end tied together by the end of the arc. We don't know the whereabouts of several characters, we were introduced to a god killing device, the still silver arrowhead had appeared out of nowhere, and the frustrating handling of some of the fights like Hashward vs Uryu which was mostly off screen, and not to mention the disappointing end to some characters like Ukitake. I want to discuss the highs but also to speak about the complaints that I have with the second half of this arc. Despite these points there is a lot to praise with Bleach's endgame, and it isn't all doom and gloom. So let's begin by discussing the return of the Quincy as they begin their second invasion of the Soul Society. Society. After the Serute is unexpectedly replaced by the Wandan Reich city, the Shinigami are left speechless. This however does not waver their resolve, as Hitsugaya and Rangiku kick off the battle against the Quincy with their encounter with the Sternritter Baz B. Meanwhile, Siphon faces off against BG9. The two captains we know are not the best equipped to be battling the elite soldiers of the Quincy, as they have had their Bankai stolen. Hitsugaya effectively strikes Baz B with the help of Rangiku, and Siphon is able to activate a perfect form of her Shunko to attack BG-9. Askin states that Yuhabak had foresaw that the Shinigami would train in order to compensate for losing their Bankai, as the Sternritters counterattack and critically wound Siphon and Hitsugaya. When Hitsugaya is about to be defeated by Kangdu, Urahara reveals that he has discovered a method to restore the Bankai for the Shinigami that had them stolen. He makes the Shinigami swallow a pill that momentarily holifies them. This results in the Bankai becoming poisonous to the Quincy. Siphon and Hitsugaya are among the Shinigami who have their Bankai restored. Siphon is thus able to defeat BG-9, while Hitsugaya encases Kangdu with ice once he has regained his Bankai. Bambietta is then confronted by Komomura, who appears to be wearing a new armour as a result of meeting with the elder of his clan. When it seems like the Shinigami have the upper hand, Yuhobak states that he anticipated that the Shinigami would have somehow regained their Bankai, so he remotely activates the Quincy Holy Forms of several Sternritters. It is then that Ichigo contacts Urahara as he learns about the return of the Quincy. He reveals that he has completed his training and is departing from the Soul King's palace. Kubo excellently has a tense back and forth between the Quincy and the Shinigami here, as the threat and stakes constantly keep on elevating, pulling us more and more into this story, making it difficult for us to take our eyes off of the action. Meanwhile, Bambietta uses her ability The Explode, which has been improved now that her holy form is activated in order to injure Shinji. The Sternritter is then overwhelmed by Komomura, who reveals that he has learnt the humanization ability of his clan, and now that he has activated his Bankai in this form, it is made up entirely of Ryatsu, so it is unaffected by Bambietta's attacks. He has effectively become immortal, as he attacks her and states that like Head Captain Yamamoto, he doesn't need a reason to risk his life during this battle. He is following in the footsteps of the late Head Captain, who he had admired and respected so much. Their battle comes to an end when Komomura strikes Bambietta, who ends up self-destructing because of her own reishi. After her defeat, Komomura sets his sights on Yuhobak, wanting to avenge the death of Yamamoto, but he falls to the ground after having used his Bankai in this humanization form begins to take a toll on his body. His great-grandfather then devours Komomura's heart, as he then transforms into a wolf.
soul, thinking that this is what he deserves for being no different to Tozen, as he too had sold his soul for the sake of revenge by wanting to defeat the Quincy who had killed the head captain. His lieutenant Iba appears as he reassures Komomura that he has done nothing wrong, as we conclude Komomura's involvement within the story arc, and also bringing an end to his character arc. Meanwhile, Mask the Masculine sees Renji and Rukia join the battle. The Sternwriter, after having brutally defeated Kensei and Rose, is then confronted by Renji, who is able to easily overwhelm him. After a failed counterattack, Mask is defeated when Renji activates his true Bankai that he had acquired through his training with Ichibe at the Soul King's Palace. Thanks to using his true Bankai, he is able to defeat Mask. Rukia is then confronted by the Sternwriter Asnot. He attacks Rukia, stating that he has injected fear inducing liquid into her, but it appears to have no effect on her. De Quincy finds it hard to believe, as he states that nobody can live without fear, but Rukia reveals that she is able to drop her body temperature, which will freeze the molecules in her body, preventing the fear-inducing liquid from affecting her. She is able to freeze herself thanks to the power of her Zanbakdo, Sodino Shirayuki. After she reduces her temperature to absolute zero, she freezes as not, but the Sternritter is able to escape and activates his Quincy holy form, thus allowing him to make Rukia feel fear through her eyes, as he surrounds her with a wall of fear-inducing eyes. Byakuya ends up interrupting their battle when he breaks through Asnot's wall and rescues Rukia. He encourages her while Asnot transforms. Despite the change of appearance, Rukia is able to effortlessly defeat the enemy when she reveals her Bankai, Haka no Togame, which freezes Asnot solid. The next significant battle which takes place between the Gotei 13 and the Quincy is Kimpachi's encounter with Grammy. The Tenrita ends up killing Kensei and Rose, and when he sets his sights on Yachiru and he is about to transform her bones into cookies with his ability the visionary, he is interrupted by the arrival of Kimpachi. Grammy transforms his body into steel, but Kimpachi proves that he can cut through anything by easily cutting him. He attempts to drown Kimpachi with water, but he breaks free as their battle becomes serious. Now that Yachiru has left to get healed by Isane, he is attacked by weaponry created by Grammy, which only excites Kimpachi. Pachi. The Stenritter then creates a clone of himself and summons a meteor to appear from his imagination. He is getting desperate to defeat the sadistic Kimpachi, who appears to be unfazed by any of his opponent's attacks thus far. Kimpachi then activates his Shikai Nozarashi to destroy the meteor. He also is able to injure the zero atmosphere of outer space as well as surviving several explosions. When Grammy begins to get really desperate, he attempts to imagine himself stronger than Kimpachi, but he fails when he realizes that he is not able to envision anyone more powerful than his opponent, thus leading to Grammy's body tearing apart. After the Sternritter is defeated, Kimpachi notices that Yachiru is no longer by his side, as a group of female Quincy begin to gang up and attack him and his division members while he is down. Ichigo then suddenly arrives on the battlefield as he fights off the four female Quincy effortlessly. Now while Ichigo is preoccupied, Yuhabak makes the necessary preparations to head towards the Soul King's palace. Ichigo utilizes a new ability called Getsuga Jujisho, which destroys Candice Catnip's arm. Several Sternritters then arrive to fight their first of the five great war potentials, Ichigo, but then a beam of light from behind them interrupts their encounter as Yuhabak begins his ascent towards the Soul King's palace. It is revealed that he has taken advantage of the path that Ichigo had taken from the Soul King's palace to return to the Soul Society, and it is because of Ichigo wearing the Oaken clothing while falling from the palace that he had broken the barrier between the two realms, thus making it easy for Yuhabak to invade into the palace. Ichigo is assisted by the arrival of Renji and the other Shinigami who take on the Sternritters, so that Ichigo can go ahead and confront Yuhabak. The Sternritters activate their holy forms and battle the Shinigami, while Ichigo is stopped by Uryu who is not revealing why he has joined forces with Yuhabak. Orihime and Chad then make their arrival within the Soul Society, as they are powerless to stop Uryu, Yuha and Hashwat departing for the Soul King's palace. Quite notably, Ichigo is affected by Uryu's supposed betrayal, but thankfully Chad is present in order to help him to see sense by advising him to follow Uryu. At the same time, Urahara has also finally arrived onto the battlefield, and he begins to devise a method to 
take Ichigo and the others to the Soul King's Palace, while Yuha, Hashwad, and Uryu arrive at their destination. On the battlefield, the Stenrita Giselle battles against Ikaku and Yumichika. The Shinigami begin to understand how the Quincy's ability the zombie works, as she orders an undead Bambietta to attack them. While the Shinigami begin to battle Giselle's zombies, Urahara works deep below the 12th Division barracks, devising a method to fire Ichigo and the others into the Soul King's Palace via a replica of Kukakushiba's cannon. Ikaku and Yumichika are taken out by Bambietta, but before they are killed, they are rescued by the arrival of Mayuri. The mad scientist offends Giselle, which forces her to order Bambietta to target him, but the captain easily fights off the zombified Stenrita and her ability the Explode, which ends up hurting Bambietta. Giselle then summons zombified Shinigami from the 11th Division, but Mayuri counters this by summoning his own undead soldiers in the form of the four revived Arunka. Giselle then summons her most powerful zombified soldier, Hitsugaya. This of course gets the attention of Mayuri, who decides that he can test some of his newly developed drugs on him. He turns his attention towards his fellow captain, as it seems as though Mayuri was taken out by Hitsugaya's Bankai, but he reappears as if nothing had happened. He states that Hitsugaya is feeding the effects of his post-cognition drug, which effectively will stop him from killing Mayuri. When the zombified captain collapses, because of the toll that Mayuri's drug is taking on his brain, he stabs Hitsugaya and releases his Zombokdo, which ends up paralyzing him as he injects another drug into him. Mayuri is then confronted by three more zombified Shinigami, Rangiku, Rose, and Kensei, as he then orders his resurrected Aranka to battle them, as he also has the three zombified Shinigami be exposed to his post-cognition drug. He reveals that his drug substitutes the blood in their bodies with a liquid that he had created, and this enables him to control their bodies, as he has Kensei stab Giselle through the heart, which appears to have defeated Stenrita. Meanwhile, Yakia single-handedly takes out Nanana, Candice, and Robert before he encounters Hisagi, who is under the influence of Pepe's The Love. Yakia is able to take out Hisagi, but Pepe takes control over Zembon Zakura. As he has Hisagi attack Yakia with his own Zambakdo, we learn that Pepe's The Love is unable to affect Yakia, which leads him to activate his Quincy holy form. But the Quincy is then surprisingly attacked by Kensei. When Kensei takes out Hisagi and returns Yakia's Zambakdo to him, Pepe fails to take control of Kensei, as Mayuri reveals that his resurrected soldiers are unable to feel love, as Kensei takes out the Quincy. Meanwhile, Yuhabak has arrived at the Soul King's Palace as the battle between the Royal Guard and the Wandenreich finally begins. The Royal Guard intercepts Yuha and his army, Kurinji activates his Shikai and attacks the leader of the Quincy, but he is unable to land any attack on his opponent. Senjumaru then joins the battle accompanied with his divine soldiers, but they too are unable to hurt Yuhabak. We learn that the Stenrita Nianzol Weasel is the reason behind why their attacks are ineffective, as he uses his ability the wind to move the attacks away from Yuha, enabling him to effortlessly traverse through the palace as he looks for the Soul King. Meanwhile, Urahara is readying to fire Ichigo and the others, as they are nostalgically also accompanied by Ganju, who has an aerial map which will guide them to the palace. Palace. The Stenrita Nianzol is taken out by Senjumaru, as she stabs him with several spikes that have appeared from his robe. Yuha then brings out more soldiers and summons his shoot Starfall to combat the Divine Soldiers and the Royal Guard. Gerard, Pernida, and Lil work together to seemingly take out Senjumaru as she is shot through the head. The shoot Starfall live up to their name as they begin to destroy the Soul King's Palace. Lil shoots down several buildings, clearing the path for Yuha, but suddenly the surroundings retreat into lines of fabric as the real Senjumaru reveals herself. She states that Ichibe had been hiding the real palace of the Soul King as Kirio Hikifune also arrives and surrounds the area with a cage of life, which traps the Quincy, stopping them from escaping. Nimaya then appears, drawing his Zambakdo Sayafushi as he readies to battle Yuha's elite soldiers. Nimaya is also able to take out most of the shoot Starfall as they don't really stand a chance against his sharpened blade. And when it seems as though Nimaya has defeated at Askin, he tends his attention towards Yuha, but is then stopped by Askin's ability, the Death Dealing. Askin states that he has turned Nimaya's blood into poison, which leads to him cutting his own throat in order to let some of the blood leave his body. The Stenrita tells him that in order for him not to be killed by his own blood, he will have to lose a lethal amount of it. Either way, it seems as though he will die either from blood loss or Askin's ability. It is once again a back and forth, as it seems as though the Royal Guard had the upper hand, but the Quincy 
brought back and turned the tide in their favor. This is what the Thousand Year Blood War arc excels at, as it constantly keeps you on the edge of your seat. Nimaya is thankfully able to counter Askin, but having Karinji replace his blood with his ability Blood Pond Hell, he is then able to take out Askin and challenge Yuha himself. At this moment, Yuha reveals what he really thinks of his underlings when he activates Ashwalin for the second time, as a bright light emanates from his hand. Down below within the Soul Society, several beams of light cover several of the Cern Ritters, as their lives and powers are drained from them, as Yuha uses it to revive his Shoot Starfall, who were taken out by Nimaya earlier. Lil Barrow uses his power the X-Axis to fatally hurt Nimaya. Pranida also breaks Kirio's Cage of Life, as the time has now come for the leader of the Zero Division, Ichibei, to join the battle. Ichibei resolves to kill Yuha, as he is able to counter the Shinigami's name curse power. Meanwhile, Urahara continues his preparations, as we see Vizard and Yoriichi's younger brother delivering equipment to his lab. While elsewhere, Shunsui meets with Ukitake, who has awakened his Kamikake, revealing that he is going to speak with the Central 46. As the new head captain has decided on a desperate measure, which is to go to Muken in order to ask for Aizen's help in the battle against the Quincy. Back at the Soul King's palace, Ichibei exchanges blows with Yuha, and is able to halve his full power by removing half of his name. But this doesn't last for too long, as Yuha restores his power and protects himself from Ichibei's attacks by erecting a barrier. Ichibei seems to have destroyed Yuha's Blut Veen and Haben barrier, as he grabs Yuha causing the barrier to hurt him instead of himself. He then releases his Shikai Ichimonji, as he then erases the names of Yuha and his sword with the ink of his Zanbakdo. He then assigns Yuha with the name and power of an ordinary black ant, as Ichibei then sends him hurtling through the ground towards the Soul Society. But Yuha then activates his The Almighty, which completely stops the effects of Ichibei's powers, resulting in him being blown into pieces, which to the dismay of a lot of fans, including myself, brings an end to the highly anticipated battle between Yuha and Ichibei. The Zero Division definitely put up a good fight against the Quincy, but it was so short-lived, and it felt like so much more could have been done with these incredibly hyped characters, who in the end were tossed aside like fodder by Yuha and his Shoot Starfall. By the time that Ichigo and the others finally arrive to confront Yuha, he has already reached the Soul King and impaled him. In the Soul Society, Urahara updates the captains and lieutenants that have gathered at the lab, as he informs them that they will be invading the Soul King's palace. Urahara intends to create a gateway to the royal palace created using their reishi. Meanwhile, Ichigo, seeing that the Soul King has been impaled, attempts to pull Yuha's sword out of him. But through manipulating the Quincy blood that flows through Ichigo, Yuha controls him to cut the Soul King clean in half. He explains to Ichigo that the Soul Society had created the Soul King in order to balance the souls between the world of the living and the Soul Society. Now that the Soul King is dead, all of reality will now begin to collapse. But not long after this, Ukitake completes his ritual called Kamikake and states that it will enable him to replace the Soul King and to stabilize the worlds. He states that he possesses the right hand of the Soul King, Mimihagi. He releases it as Ukitake sacrifices himself to Mimihagi in a desperate attempt to restore the Soul King. Mimihagi ends up surrounding the Soul King as the tremors across reality stop. Meanwhile, Shunsui enlists Aizen to fight on their side. While Mimihagi is at work, Ichigo clashes with Yuha, and they ultimately fail to stop Yuha back here, as Ichigo and the others fall off of the palace thanks to Uryu destroying the platform that they were standing on. Meanwhile, Yuha ends up absorbing Mimihagi, thus putting a stop to Ukitake by killing him. The Senritas, Basbi, Lil Toto, and Giselle offer to help the Shinigami to reach the Soul King's palace after feeling betrayed by Yuha, as they realize that they are nothing more than disposable commodities to him. Yuha proceeds to completely absorb the remainder of the Soul King, thus allowing him to gain all of his powers. Ichigo and the others are then assisted by the arrival of Grimjao and Neliel, as well as the sudden appearance of the Fullbringers. Ruruka and Yukio, who arrive via a modified Valley of Screams, which they will be using to travel back to where Yuha and the Quincy are. The leader of the Quincy proves just how powerful he has now become by destroying most of the Soul King's palace and replacing it with the Wandenreich city. He also creates a large fortress called Waharweld at the center of the city. The Gote 13 arrive as they realize that they cannot use Shumpo since the Quincy are in control of the Reishi here. Grimjow targets Askin, while Basbi confronts Han 
Hashwad, who he is aware is in possession of the Almighty while Yuha is resting. We learn about a brief history between these two characters during their fight. Despite putting up a decent fight, Basbi is overwhelmed and fatally wounded by his former friend. The Stenrita Pranida battles against Myri, who manages to expose the Quincy's nerves, as it removes the cloak revealing that it is in fact the left hand of the Soul King. After growing to a large size, it attacks Myri by extending its nerves throughout its surroundings. Myri is able to avoid touching the Stenrita's nerves on the ground thanks to the shoes that he is wearing, that grants the captain the Quincy ability Hiren Hyaku, which gives him high speed movement through riding across the floor of Reishi that is created below his feet. When Pernida uses the compulsory, it invades the right arm of Myri, but this proves to be ineffective as the captain was able to modify his body so that it cannot be controlled by the Senrita. When Pernida begins to create clones of itself, Myri activates a modified version of his Bankai, which appears to have 70,000 skin layers that end up devouring Pernida. The Senrita is able to detonate within Konjiki Ashisogi Jizo as it blows up into pieces. Myri is then exposed to Pernida's The Compulsory, leading to Nemu having to rescue him. By working together with his lieutenant, Myri was able to inject a nerve-freezing agent into Pernida and its clones. But the agent is ineffective after Pernida was able to copy the skin layers of Myri's Bankai after having killed it. Nemu then having no choice but to activate her raw power ends up destroying Pernida and its clones. However, the Stenrita survives and tears Nemu to pieces. This action uncharacteristically sinks Myri into despair, but he regains his composure after after he sees a hallucination of Xyloporo, he is able to finally kill Pranida with the involuntary cell division acceleratory found within Nemu's bodily remains. He then goes on to heal himself and Kimpachi, who was also hurt during the battle against Pranida. Myri then releases Hitsugaya and Rangiku from their healing capsules, who appear to no longer be zombified, and they are ready to join the battle. Meanwhile, the new head captain Shunsui realizes that Lil Baro is trying to take out the Shinigami by sniping sniping them one by one. He confronts the Sternritter as he quickly overwhelms his enemy thanks to a technique of his Shikai. Shinsui's abilities are fashioned after children's games, but Lil counters by opening his left eye and activating his holy form. Shinsui is left with no choice but to distance himself from the other Gotei 13 members so that he can activate his Bankai. After activating the first, second and third act of his Bankai, they badly injure the Sternritter as he then uses the final form of his Bankai to blow Lil head off. When the Quincy survives, he fires his Light of Judgment energy wave, resulting in explosions erupting across its path. Shunsui escapes from the attack and is about to fall unconscious, but he is woken by his lieutenant Nanao. The head captain hides the two of them within Lil's shadow and explains the history of Nanao's Zanpakuto to her, how it has the ability to slay a god. Nanao wields her Zanpakuto for the first ever time, appearing out of Lil's shadow in order to confront the Sternritter. Nanao's blade is able to hurt Lil, as Shunsui Shunsui supports Nanao as she reflects Lil's attack back at him, causing him to disintegrate into pieces and fall down to the Serite, where he is ultimately defeated by the revived Izuru Kira. When Asuken appears to have taken out Ichigo, Orihime and Chad, Yoriichi comes to their aid by attacking him with her Shunko Raijin Senke. After pulling Orihime out of Asuken's gift bag, she tends to Ichigo and Chad's wounds so that they can continue forward to confront Yuha. Meanwhile, Yoriichi and her brother Yushiro battle Asuken, who reveals that he has the ability to control the lethality of any substance that he takes in, as well as being able to make himself immune to any attack that has wounded him. Asuken takes out Yushiro and poisons Yoriichi with his abilities, but Urahara then arrives to rescue her and injects a drug into her which heals her from the Quincy's poison. Yoriichi is then forcibly transformed into a Shunko Raiju Senke form, which enables her to alter her Ryatsu 48 times per second, as she is able to overwhelm Asuken, who has difficulty keeping up with the fluctuations in a Ryatsu. Yoriichi then succumbs to the poison once the immunizing drug Urahara had used on her wears off. Asuken then emerges in his holy form as Urahara is surrounded by the Sternritter's Gift Ball Deluxe. His eyes are destroyed by Asuken's Gift Ring. As he is about to strike him with several more Gift Rings, Urahara proceeds to activate his Bankai. We learn that Urahara's Bankai has the power to recreate anything, which he uses to restore his eyes and turn the tide of battle in his favor as he overwhelms the Sternritter. De Quincy amplifies the power of his Gift Ball Deluxe in order to disable him, but Urahara devises a method to open a path for Grimjow, who is in his resurrection form, to join the battle and tear out Askin's heart. Now that Askin has been killed,
world, the power of his gift ball deluxe further amplifies after his death, resulting in Urahara and Grimjow collapsing, as they have no choice but to leave the rest to Ichigo and the others. The last of the shoot star for Gerard is battling against Byakuya, when they're interrupted by Kimpachi who cuts off his arm, which ends up regenerating. Kimpachi is unable to cut through Gerard's shield, and when Kimpachi is wounded by the Sternritter's attack, he finally activates his Bankai and overpowers him. He transforms into a demonic red-skinned monster who mercilessly beats Gerard to the point that it seems as though he is surely dead. Despite the brutal attack, he survives and activates his holy form. Kimpachi isn't able to put up much of a fight after his arm is destroyed because he is unable to handle the power of his Bankai. Meanwhile, Hitsugaya's Bankai reaches its time limit, which transforms him into this incredibly cool new adult form. Using this new form, he freezes Gerard who survives, but he is then floored by Kimpachi who surprisingly attacks him, while Byakuya finishes him off by destroying the top half of the Sternritter. Elsewhere, Ichigo and the others learn that Uryu has been on their side this entire time, as he wanted to defeat Yuha back on the inside by infiltrating the ranks of the Quincy. When he learns that Yuha is asleep and the powers of the Almighty have been transferred to Hashwat for the time being, he urges Ichigo and the others to seize the opportunity and to defeat Yuha back while he is vulnerable. Ichigo and Orihime arrive to confront Yuha, who has just had the Almighty returned to him. Ichigo then transforms into a new merged hollow form as he appears to have wounded Yuha after having fired a Getsuke Tenjo towards him that is infused with a Grand Ray Sero. But Yuha deflects the attack as he uses the Almighty to create Blades of Reatsu which injure Ichigo, who is left with no choice but to activate the new form of his Bankai Tensa Zangatsu. His efforts prove fruitless as Yuha breaks Ichigo's spirit when he destroys Tensa Zangatsu, explaining that the Almighty has the power to not only see the future, but to change it also. Meanwhile, Uryu battles against Hashwat who explains how his ability to balance works, while Uryu explains that his power antithesis can reverse the state of any two people, as he transfers all of the wounds that he has sustained onto his opponent. But he is able to use his own abilities to return the injuries to Uryu. When Hashwat is about to deliver the final blow, he is hit by Yuha's third Ashwalin, which disables him and ends up killing Gerard. Yuha leaves for the Soul Society just as Rukia and Renji arrive to assist Ichigo. Hashwa takes all of Uryu's injuries and tells him to help his friends, as he becomes aware that Yuha is no longer acting for the best interest for the future of the Quincy race. All hope seems to be lost for Ichigo as he realizes the overwhelming power of his opponent, and there appears to be no way to restore his shattered Tensa Zangetsu. That is, until the fullbringer Tsukishima appears and impales Ichigo with his Book of the End ability. He ends up creating a past where Tensa Zangetsu was not broken, and this enables Orihime to restore his blade, thus giving him hope to confront Yuhobak for one final time. Meanwhile, Ryuken and Ishin, who had arrived within the Quincy city earlier, hand to Uryu the still silver arrow, which was made from the heart of his mother. If this arrowhead pierces the heart of the caster of Ashwalin, it will momentarily disable that individual's power. When Yuha arrives within the Soul Society, he is greeted by Aizen, who welcomes him to his Soul Society. Ichigo and Renji are hot on his heels as they journey through the Dangai to stop Yuha. Aizen ends up being freed from his restraints thanks to Yuha's attack, and he creates illusions of Renji and Ichigo who battle him. But Yuha is able to easily defeat them. When he assumes that he has taken out all of his opponents, Yuha prepares to destroy the Soul Society. But Aizen reveals that Yuha was under the influence of his illusions, and he had actually been fighting against Aizen this entire time. As Ichigo suddenly appears and cuts Yuha in half with his Getsuka Tensho. The leader of the Quincy survives thanks to the Almighty, as it reverses his own death. But just as he is about to absorb Ichigo, Yuha is shot through the heart with the still silver arrow by none other than Uryu. This disables Yuha's powers momentarily, giving Ichigo enough time to deliver the final blow and to kill the antagonist of this story arc, and thus bringing an end to the thousand year blood war between the Quincy and the Shinigami, and concluding the Quincy's invasion of the Soul Society. The epilogue of the Bleach manga occurs over the last two chapters of the manga, taking place over 10 years after the defeat of Yuha Buck.
Mark. Chapter 685 has us catching up with the Soul Society, as we see the Gotei 13 preparing for Rukia's captain ceremony as she is promoted to the captain of the 13th division. We see that several of the Shinigami had survived the events of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, aside from Head Captain Yamamoto, Unahana and Ukitake. The chapter concludes with the Soul Society's Research and Development Institute being alerted to a Reatsu appearing which is similar to that of Yuho Bak's Reatsu. The following chapter 686 concludes the Bleach story, as several captains investigate the Reatsu resembling Yuho Bak's which has appeared within the Soul Society. Meanwhile, Rukia and Renji have been given permission to enjoy some time off as they go to the human world to visit Ichigo and the others at Kurosaki Clinic. They are planning on watching Chad's upcoming boxing match together. We learn that Uryu is not present with them as he is watching the fight during his break at work, and we learn that he has followed in his father's footsteps and become a doctor. The strange Reatsu intensifies, but Ichigo and Orihime's son Kazui Kurosaki touches the Reatsu and disperses it when it appears within his room. Aizen and Muken comment upon Yuhobak's motive as he states that the Quincy's leader was trying to rid death from reality, as he had wanted to eliminate the fear that was associated with death. Aizen states that this fear is necessary, as it gives courage to humans who can continue moving forward with their lives in the face of this fear. We have hope for the future of the Bleach story as we see that Ichigo's son Kazui is confronted by Renji and Rukia's daughter Ichika, as they reveal themselves to be Shinigami. Now, the way that Bleach's final arc concluded was pretty abrupt and sudden. At the time in 2016, when we had learned that the manga was concluding with only a handful of chapters left, I was convinced that it was not enough time to give the final arc a satisfactory conclusion. Ichigo's final battle with Yuha Bak felt rushed, leading to a lot of people thinking that the way that Yuha was defeated was contrived and abrupt, especially when he was built up to be a godly villain with a broken ability. A lot of the final battles with the Shutstaffel were not long enough, like Urahara vs Asken, Gerard vs Kimpachi Byaku and Hitsugaya, or Shunsui's battle with Lil Baro, and how Nunal Zampakdo was suspiciously too convenient as it wasn't explained prior to this very moment, and how it just so happened to be the perfect Zampakdo to defeat Lil. In addition to this, most of the highly anticipated final battle between Uryu and Hashwat had occurred off screen, leaving a lot to be desired, and by the end of the arc we don't know the whereabouts of several characters, like Urahara, Yoriichi, Grimjao, or the Zero Division, and we don't even get to know if they survive within the epilogue of the manga. This was pretty disappointing for a final arc that was building up to such a grand finale, but we were robbed of this great conclusion at the nth hour. Kubo had wrapped up his story very quickly, but he still ended the series with the epilogue that he had planned right at the very start of the story. It's just that the conclusion of the Thousand Year Blood War arc was not satisfactory, and this is where I believe that the anime adaptation premiering in October of 2022 will rectify a lot of these issues, and hopefully with Kubo's involvement it will help to expand upon a lot of the points that I have mentioned. So this was my entire breakdown and explanation of the Bleach manga. If you have made it to this point of the video then you really are the biggest Bleach fan and a fan of my channel. Thank you for your time and hopefully after watching this video you are now ready for the 2022 Bleach anime and have a refreshed knowledge of how the story was told within the manga. I'm super excited for October 2022 and I cannot wait for the release of the first episode of the new anime. Thank you for making it to the end of this video and I can't wait to see you in my next Bleach video. If you enjoy my content, then you can support my channel through Patreon for as little as a dollar a month, or even through YouTube by becoming a channel member. You will gain access to exclusive channel perks and a Discord server which I frequently use. So become a member of my Zero Division and be the first to know about my upcoming videos. And once again, thank you for sticking around till the end of the video and whatever you contribute will mean a lot to me.